And um, Jasmine, uh, if you could, let's, uh, let's please take roll. Yes, uh, we'll begin with you, Chair Lozar. Here. Regent Rogers. Here. Regent Dombrowski. Here. Regent Bow. Here. Regent Buchanan. Here. Regent Southworth. Here. Regent Sexton. Here. Commissioner Christian. Here. Governor Jean Forte is being represented by Dylan Klapmeyer. Here. Superintendent Ertzen. Good morning. Back to you, Chair Lozar. Excellent, thank you, Jasmine. Welcome to the, the May uh, Board of Regents meeting. It's, uh, it's great to be finally back in Haver and back here on MSU Northern's campus. It's, it's hard to believe it's been four years uh, since we, we had a meeting here. And uh, we certainly wanna start by thanking you, Chancellor Kegel and your, your team for putting on uh, this, this meeting. We know um, uh, all the work that goes into hosting a Board of Regents meeting and all the, the planning and care that you put into the campus and logistics, um, et cetera. We really appreciate all that you've done. Certainly the campus uh, looks beautiful. Um, this morning we, we had a nice breakfast uh, with uh, representatives from, from MUSA, the Montana University System Staff Association. It's, it's always nice to connect uh, with MUSA and hear from the leaders uh, on our campuses uh, at the staff level who are working um, uh, alongside of faculty and administrators to see that our students are successful in their higher education goals. So thank you, MUSA leaders, for sitting down with us and and having a really good and an important conversation uh, this morning that certainly will continue to have those discussions uh, about uh, your priorities uh, over the next several months. Um, last night we, uh, we had the opportunity to uh, attend uh, just a wonderful event hosted by the campus and by Chancellor Kegel. Uh, at the Diesel Technology Center, one of the m most beautiful uh, centers on the Montana University System campuses. Uh, the event showcased uh, education and, and agriculture here on the High Line and, and brought together some key stakeholders, uh, legislators, community members, ag leaders, and many of us from the Montana University system to, to share and to connect on a wide range of different topics. Most, most importantly, the role and the uh, importance of uh, this, this community and this uh, college to the High Line. Certainly want to thank uh, some of the, those that helped to, to organize that event, particularly Senator uh, Russ Temple and Senator Mike Lang for, for helping to organize the event and certainly want to uh, send our gratitude to the Montana Farmers Union for sponsoring the, the Montana Made Dinner. It was a, it was a wonderful dinner. Um, so it's always great to uh, be back uh, at the DTC. Uh, the DTC had just opened the last time we were here, and we can certainly tell how much work uh, has happened on the campus to improving and enhancing the campus and the campus culture here uh, at Montana State uh, University Northern. I'd also like to congratulate everyone at Northern on the completion of uh, Tilleman Field. Uh, it's a truly incredible, and everyone here at Northern should be incredibly proud uh, of all the effort that went into uh, making this happen. It's been a, a vision and a dream of this community and the Chancellor for years and years and years. And uh, I, I, you know, I think it's, it's one of the first fields to have artificial turf in the entire Frontier Conference and just a great place to bring the community together. So congratulations uh, to Northern on that. The, the field really represents uh, not only the amazing commitment uh, by the Tillman family, but the entire Haver community, uh, which really rallied to support this effort uh, through private donations. Uh, I also know there have, there have been a number of different renovations across this campus, including uh, renovations to Hagner Science Center, 
the nursing program has moved into this space, which also includes a new nursing simulation lab, as well as several renovated uh, classrooms across campus. The new signage looks great. Uh, those are the type of improvements that will really go a long way uh, towards improving the overall campus uh, experience for students uh, and the guests that come onto campus. Uh, before I turn to, to the agenda, uh, I'd like to just take a, a quick moment to recognize uh, all of the, the recent graduates um, that have walked across the stage this spring. Uh, I had the, the honor of speaking at Montana Tech's commencement ceremony uh, a week and a half ago uh, down in Butte. And what, while I was trying to impart some words of encouragement, I was reminded of what a just incredibly exciting time of year this is for thousands uh, of students from all corners of the state uh, and beyond. It's, it's great to see so many parents, uh, friends, and, and supporters who, cheer, who cheered on or will continue to cheer on our graduates as they make uh, an impact uh, in the state of Montana and beyond. Of course, uh, this is a particularly special, this is this class, uh, the class of 2022 is particularly special. These students were uh, sophomores uh, at the beginning of the, the pandemic in the spring of 2020 and have overcome significant uh, obstacles and made significant sacrifices uh, to, to be able to reach their goal of uh, attaining a, their credential or their degree. So. On be behalf of the Montana Board of Regents, uh, I would like to congratulate all the graduates in the Montana University system. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a quick uh, overview of our agenda over the next couple days. Before I do that, I just wanted to uh, announce a special uh, guest and uh, colleague of, of ours here at the uh, Board of Regents, and uh, I want to welcome uh, President Chandler from Anayakota College uh, for coming and representing uh, the tribal colleges uh, throughout the next couple of days. We appreciate you, you coming and we appreciate the partnership that the university system has uh, with each and every one of the tribal colleges across the state of Montana. So looking at the agenda, um, we'll have the opportunity to hear from Chancellor Kegel here in a, a few short minutes. Um, the commissioner will go through his report and you'll You'll look at uh, on the agenda, it's a pretty busy uh, commissioner's report. We really look forward to many of the items that come uh, the spring before uh, a legislative session. So appreciate uh, the commissioner's report. Um, Dylan will represent uh, the governor's office and Elsie will represent the uh, Office of Public Instruction. Uh, we'll, we'll go through our two-year committee, um, then we'll take uh, a lunch break um, and then uh, have uh, lunch certainly with uh, the students and then transition to the budget uh, admin and audit committee um, before um, taking a break for the evening. Then we'll, we'll have lunch in the morning alongside uh, community leaders that uh, Chancellor Kegel has invited to have a discussion with this, this board. Uh, we'll also have uh, the opportunity to uh, uh, sit across the table and share space with uh, our legislative partners tomorrow morning with uh, a, a joint meeting with the Education Interim Committee. And lastly, uh, we will cover uh, the Academic uh, Research and Student Affairs Committee, which will have some updates on strategic priorities and, and a presentation on the efforts here at uh, MSU Northern to support uh, Native American uh, student achievement here on campus. So really looking forward to that discussion and hearing more uh, about the Little, Little River Institute. We will conclude our meeting with, uh, with officer elections as we do every May. Um, so obviously we have a, an action-packed agenda over the next couple days. Um, we look forward to you know, important conversations and, and finding ways to collaborate and partner to continue to make uh, the Montana University system the best system in the country. So with that, uh, Chancellor Kegel, I will uh, turn it over to you for some welcoming remarks. Thank you, Chair Lozar, and 
Welcome, Regents. Um, I hope you enjoyed the dinner that we had last night. Uh, we're very proud to have you on our campus. Um, I think the entire campus wants to showcase who we are and what we are. And uh, I got to do some shout outs to the many, many people that helped us put this event on, as well as the one last night. Uh, we got a, a little thing that uh, we talk about being all in. We've got a yellow in. And, and we, we've got a campus that truly is all in. When I ask people to step up, they step up. And uh, I can tell you that I walk the campus and just go, I wonder who did that, I wonder who did that. I mean, people just, they do amazing things. So to all of my staff and all the people that uh, help us who to be who we are, thank you. I've got a couple of things that I wanted to just share as basic housekeeping type thing. The bathrooms are in the basement. Refreshments in the entryway, instructions to log on are on your tables. There's computers and printers in the basement if you so need. The coffee center will do photocopying and they're right here. So if you need anything done, coffee bar in this library is closed during the meeting, but uh, it will be open during break. So if you want a latte, they can make you one. Uh, the lunches are in the sub. And uh, when we go to the to the sub, the best way to go is probably to the south of the building here and down the steps and around. The uh, reception tonight um, is gonna be over at uh, Donaldson, which is that building right there. And you gotta go just around the corner here to get into the front of it. Um, we certainly have set that up and hope that all of you will join us for an hour or so for that reception. The, uh, the slide that you see on the screen um, it's kind of a, a, a new kind of a, a theme that we've developed. Uh, when you turned off 87 out on Post Road to come to the campus, you, there's a big sign that says, Welcome to the Frontier. It's, it's, got, it's kind of got a, a little bit of a, a catch to it because uh, this campus originally was built on the Frontier. And uh, the things that we're doing today on this campus, really and truly, we're, we're trying to be on that technological frontier. And so I, I liked it. I, I said, let's, let's kind of run with this one. The, uh, the journey up here for all of you guys, uh, wh whoever came to have her, came a ways to get here. And uh, probably the closest regent is over in Lewistown, and even though Lewistown seems to be right over the hill, it, it's, it's a drive. I mean, it's a couple hours just to, to get here, and the rest of you even came further. And so when we, we talk about the history of this campus, um, I wanted to just share a couple things with you, because Baudette and I have spent a lot of time talking about universities that were built, state universities, the Morale Act, um, why they were built, and, and it, everything about it was about access and the, the limiting factors that students across this country had to get into universities that were Ivy League and the cost of doing that. And it was, it's interesting, you know, when you look at Montana State University, I, I came from a family that homesteaded uh, at the turn of the century here, with my great grandfather, my grandfather, my father, and uh, back then, um, my father was, there was 10 kids in the family up on the big flat up here. And the oldest son was fortunate enough to go to Montana State. And it was a long journey to Montana State back then. We had gravel roads and Model T's and, and uh, you know, you almost had to plan on camping overnight to get there. And so with MSU Northern being up here and the, the fact that we represent, when I say represent, we, we consider our service area to be the whole upper half of the state of Montana. And last night, uh, Russ Temple talked a little bit about that expansive property that runs down highway number two, 660 miles of border. Um, highway two, you know, north of highway two is 50 miles of Canada. <laughs> and that old strip, when you look at even that alone, so there's a lot of, lot of area there, and we're the only four-year institution in that whole area. And uh, it's access. And uh, they built this campus uh, back in the day, and if you read the history of what they did to get this campus on the ground and the need for the campus, and 
the need to access to, to a college, it was impressive what they did. And there was a lot of dedicated people um, that joined hands and uh, we call it, you know, this whole brick by brick. If you go to the next slide, that building right there is uh, our Pershing Hall. And when you go down to lunch, it, the landscape around it looks a lot different now, but the building still stands. And that was one of the first buildings on our campus, and it was built from the bricks at Fort Assiniboine. Um, they, they demolished buildings out there, and the community went out there and picked them up in old trucks and drove them into Haver, and they built that facility, and it was one of our first main buildings on the campus. And that whole thing about step by step, brick by brick, um, all in, is still the spirit that we have on this campus. And it's, it's a good one because it, we were talking last night about culture, about how you develop a culture on a campus, a culture in the community, um, that spirit of getting together and doing things and getting the job done. We, uh, we turn out students that have that same type of an ethic. And uh, we, uh, you know, I, I think I've been here long enough and I can say that uh, we embrace a challenge and uh, we figure out a way to get things done. And we've been doing that since day one and we're still doing it. I, uh, I can tell you just a little, I got more stories than I could go on for a long time about things that we've done, but years ago, Max Bacchus was on campus with me and we were sitting talking about what we can do and what he, how he could help me do some things. And um, I was trying to do some kind of high-end stuff with optical recognition and scanners. And, he said, well, shoot me a white paper and I'll see what I can do. I have lunch every day with Bruce Packard, who was the time with Hewlett Packard. And uh, I got a call from a guy and he wanted to know who I was. And I told him I was just an instructor at the time. And uh, he said, well, I got a call from Bruce Packard. I've been working at the foundation here at Hewlett Packard for 10 years. I've never even talked to him. And he, he called and said to call you, so I need to know who you are. And, uh, you know, I told him what the deal was, and I wasn't asking for much. He said, don't ever do that call to Bruce Packard again without asking for millions of dollars, not hundreds of dollars. <laughs> but when they, when Hewlett Packard showed up here, they, uh, it, it was kind of an interesting day. We had a celebration because we were getting some pretty high-end instrumentation, and we had balloons out and we had cake and all this stuff all ready for their truck. And when they pulled up, they couldn't believe it. They said, you know, we deliver stuff to universities all the time. And they usually just say, park it over there. And here, you know, they were, they were, but that's kind of, when we get things, we are prideful. And, uh, you know, I encourage our staff and our faculty to, to be stewards of the university system in the state of Montana. And, and I think that carries on to our students, and I think that's one of the things that we're really proud of. That last night you heard uh, some testimonies about companies that come here to get our our students, and I think that that work ethic is something that we instill in them through all of that because they're part of what we're doing, brick by brick. Next slide, please. So. Uh, The frontier and leading the way, um, I, I, I don't want to say that every university is important because every university is important. Higher education, I don't care where it is, and, and I tell students that when I'm out recruiting and talking to them that I want you to come to Northern, but I'll tell you, I want you to go somewhere because that somewhere is going to open so, so many doors, doors that you don't even know about, doors that you don't know are there. It, I've never, in, and I, I have to share that 50 years ago was the first day I stepped on this campus, and in those 50 years, I have never had a student regret that they made that decision, ever, not, not, it, none of them. It might not have worked absolutely the way that they wanted it to work, but none of them regret it. It was always, it was more, it was beneficial. We're uh, proud to be able to say that uh, Harvard University did a study, and and uh, said that this university is the, the number one university in the state of Montana in upward mobility. And I talked a little bit about that last night, and that's 
As a chancellor, probably, I don't think there wouldn't be anything that I could say that would be better than that, that we're able to take students that are down here and move them vertically and, and upward. We, uh, the Montana Department of Labor did a, another economic impact and said that uh, our graduates coming out the door are out earning the other graduates in the university system on the average, and that's another part of that upward mobility. We're fortunate that we have programs on this campus that attract industry, industry partners, and uh, we're fortunate that we get, you know, the, 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 we have the gravity to post the students that we do because they come with a wanna be attitude, and we do real well with them when we place them. So I'm real proud, I, you know, another shout out to my faculty and the staff for, for helping with all of the things that they do for those students. Um, Jack Murray from Tractor Equipment last night was talking about internships. And we've built over the years a cooperative ed program that literally places any student that in the summer for summer employment that wants a job. Um, and I checked before I came up here this morning that every student that wanted a job this year has got a, was placed. And it's a, a little bit of the sign of the time, but it's also a sign of you know, the capabilities of our students. Next slide, please. We, uh, I think, know where we're going. I, I hope that our mission is, is clear and that our strategic plan that we're working on is leading us where we wanna go, but, but we know that uh, we can't just keep doing the same things that we've been doing. We, we totally understand that. And when we work with the companies and the, the partners that we have, they do remind us of that. Uh, when they come in and, you know, you saw that facility last night and you saw that equipment, and they ask us about, you know, what are you doing with the, the global positioning? What are you doing with the data acquisition? What are you doing with all those collection systems? I mean, how, where are we gonna go with that? Uh, because we're pioneering precision ag, we've got people in the field that are operating that equipment that need training. We need people that can do the troubleshooting. That's the stuff that we're looking at. That's the, you know, the, the future. We met a few weeks ago with uh, OEMs from Subaru, Ford, General Motors, um, Toyota. These are reps from the company, not dealers. And, uh, you know, they were, where are you going with electric vehicles? I mean, are you going to wait for the electric vehicles to hit town? Or are you going to be out in front of the the technologies that uh, the techs are gonna need to know to, to operate them. And you know, where are we with the batteries and the charging, you know, all of that stuff. And uh, we wanna be in front of it. We don't wanna be catching up after the first electric vehicle hits Haver, Montana. We, uh, we realized uh, years ago that, you know, when I talk about that expansive property on the High Line, that there's opportunities there for growth. We've, we've lived in this part of the country and watched the communities shrink. And I, you know, I have her, as an example, I have her high school years ago was a double A school with 1,200 students in it, and today it's hovering around 500. Chinook High School was a class A school, and they couldn't even put a football team together a few years ago. So this, it's this demographic shift that uh, is in our service area that's caused us as a school hard time too because our pool has shrunk. And so we've looked at all different types of uh, you know, thoughts and ideas and one of them when we put the Bioenergy Research Center together was an opportunity to add value added egg to this region. And, uh, and it was a, it's a good one and I was front and center on that whole thing. Uh, take land that uh, is in CRP, put it back into production and grow seeds that we can harvest and use. We take those seeds, we can crush them, we can convert them, convert the oil. Our BNSF railroad right here in town this is a major refuel center. They burn over 50 million gallons of fuel a year right here, right out of this. So we looked at that and, uh, and we've been working on that project for 15 years now and we're still working on it and, and in, on your tour tomorrow, we're gonna take you through and show you the developments that we've made there. There's one problem. I have quality of the fuel. 
was a problem in the beginning, especially with the, the, the biodiesel. Um, we started making uh, advancements in converting that same oil into jet fuel. We got a patent on it. And the discoveries that we had with that are the best fuel you, you can make. We, we actually can make the best fuel you can make. But we're using a process that's expensive. So when you make the fuel, it's not competitive with fossil fuel. So we spent 10 years now developing a catalyst because it was the catalyst that was the problem. It was the conversion problem. And in the last 10 years, um, we're getting very close to not using ruthenium, which is a very expensive metal, to using a tungsten-based catalyst that isn't as expensive. So the process now, the conversion process, which is the, really the barrier, is going to drop the cost of the bile-derived fuels to a point where we can actually produce them and burn them and, and be competitive. But that's been 15 years of diligent work and developing that center. And so we're going to be proud to show you that tomorrow, what, what we've done and the gains we've made on that. So new programs, um, trying to meet the demands and trying to, to do things for ourselves to uh, help and support our sustainability. So uh, not to, I, and I don't want to be overly redundant with things. You're going to see some things tomorrow um, on your tour. And you heard things last night. And I just wanted to reiterate a couple things that uh, are important to, to share with you. There is a strategy to get where you want to go. And, and, and any person that's in this business and all of you guys know it, that you have to lay out a plan. And uh, things have to, you know, the donimals have to fall. And we're doing that. That's that brick by brick strategically doing things. I knew that when I took the role as chancellor here that I had to address our enrollment I, in those programs, and I knew it from two different ways. I knew that sustainability of the campus was important, but that's our revenue stream. But I also can tell you that I work with a lot of industry partners, a lot of them, and there's an expectation from them that we supply the workers that they need. And that's just it, that they don't quite you know, grasp that whole concept of recruiting, getting them here, knocking down the barriers, what it takes for a student to be able to go. They just want the student, the graduate. And so we, that's the, those two things. So increase enrollment and then increase graduates and supply them with what they want. That's why they're paying taxes to keep us where we are. And so, that was part of the things that I looked at. I, you know, and I shared a lot of conversations with President Cruzado on what do we need to do as an affiliated campus to get where we need to do to go and all those things that it's going to take. And one of the things was, okay, student life is incredibly important. I had two sons that went to college. I went to college. And I know college is fun. They, they, it's an experience. Half of why they go is for that college experience. So you got to provide it. They're expecting that experience. They're expecting the things, and I call them the amenities that they expect. They expect good housing. They expect good sub. They expect activities. They expect a, a campus calendar with events. Those are expectations. You have to, if you're going to be competitive, you have to have them. So I wanted to just talk about some of the things that we. I had, like, when I came on board, nine initiatives that we're working on, nine things to drive enrollment and retain students. So it was an R&R &R campaign, retention and recruitment. I've got uh, two things that I'm working on right now. One of them is uh, what we're referring to as the Aurora Complex. When I talked to you guys, and it's been quite a number of years ago, um, about a football stadium. And I can remember that, I think it was down in Dillon, and, and I presented that to you and tried to get you to understand the reason and even in this community, when we built that field, what the reason was, and a lot, there were a lot of people that said, you know, there's other things we could do, right? Because we have a place to play football. And I said, yeah, but it's more than. And I was talking to Casey last night about that. It's more than. And there, it, there's so many things that we do that are more than what it appears to be. It's complicated. And so the field was a phase one project, it was a step one, and it was important for us, for our students to have 
that complex on this campus and not be playing football on Blue Pony Stadium. It is beautiful as Blue Pony, Blue Pony Stadium is. It, it isn't our turf, it isn't our, and I knew that uh, if we could do that and do the, the next part of that project, which I consider to be the game changer for this campus, and I know it will be, that's uh, a building that uh, we're gonna put up there that's a recreation and health center that every student on our campus, not our athletes, it's not about the athletes at all. In fact, I would tell people with that stadium that we built, it wasn't about football. It was more than football. I'm a football guy and I love football, but it, honest to God, it wasn't about football. So this Aurora Center, um, and I'm gonna show you a little slide and then there's a little film that we put together that uh, I think that the title of the film is it's more than a field and so that more than concept is I, I hope you can see beyond it's the strategy we're also working on a, a complex I just got a, a a donation of some absolutely perfect prime property 40 acres that are just right over that hill right there um, in the perfect location to uh, start a, a project to construct a, a multi-use kind of a facility. Um, the property is valued at over $2 million. It was a huge donation from a, another friend of Northern and uh, a person in the community that wants to see this community start to thrive. And uh, that project has got some outside legs on it too. And, and I. There's no doubt that we will construct that type of a building out there. Our rodeo team, that's, I gotta tell why that is. And so we, I used to be the rodeo coach here 40 years ago. And uh, when I'd go down to Brick Breed and Fieldhouse with this little team that we'd put together of wannabe cowboys pretty much. And uh, we would get, you know, Montana State would come out on there horses and flags and they had their little blue vests and their <laughs> and their white hats and they'd ride around you know, like Gee. and so but 40 years later this year our women's team won the conference they beat montana state and every one of our women teams qualified for the national finals and you know you th and to me yes because, you know, if you, really, if you stay with things and you, you know, that continuous improvement where you step by step, you're just a little bit better every, and that's what that team did. And we got the right people in place and we got a, a community behind us and they started raising scholarship money and, and all of a sudden we're competing with Miles City and Montana State and Western. I mean, great programs. So we need these types of things to do that and, and, and I just want you to, to see and, and, and understand why, because it's more than. And so this is where we're going. These are the things that we're doing. And thanks for your time. You want to do that next slide? I told people from day one that this isn't about football. But this was about putting together on this campus the things that a student that's looking at a comprehensive four-year university would expect to have. And so uh, it's more than just the field. to this region, to this community is something that they want to fight for, that you want to make sure that this campus is healthy and stays healthy. When you do a campaign like that and you ask people for that type of support and they give it to you, it's a vote of confidence. A $3 million campaign from start to finish in that short of time, I mean, who, who can do that? Who can pull that off? And uh, people in this community did. People really believe in MSU Northern and the value that it brings to Montana, its economy, and its employer community. 
Um, this will, without question, enhance uh, the walkability of the campus and the attractiveness of the campus to both existing students and prospective students in the future. He has always voiced that it was always more than a field. He has always said that this project really is fundamental for Northern to exist, to grow, um, to continue with recruitment, but also to continue with retention. When I hear it's more than a field, I think kids today look at college as an experience. They don't just think of it as a curriculum. It's all about having activities for the students to do on campus. If you have a, uh, a vibrant campus and a football stadium is part of that, you have good student life. And Northern's a huge part of Haver. Haver has the opportunity with the college to have kids come to Haver, fall in love with Haver, meet people from Haver, and stay here. It's so much more than a stadium. It's uh, a community effort, and it's going to be fantastic. A lot of people, especially during the time of COVID, loved having this project happening on campus because it gave them something else to think about. And it gave them something hopeful to look forward to of seeing this kind of come to life. I even had one alumnus um, come by and say she actually got tears in her eyes when she came by to see how much this was going to influence the look for our MSU Northern students. I think the most wonderful thing about Chancellor Kegel is the fact that he has visions. He likes to look out and look ahead and look at what's going to come and think big picture about what could be. The, the deciding factor, the thing that's going to make the difference is when we build the phase two complex. And that's going to allow us to do things that we've never done before. I think having a beautiful venue where we can do any kind of a, a large scale activity from a reception, a wedding reception, to great big huge fundraisers. We don't have very many areas that are big enough to do lot, lots of people in our community. So it really will give a whole new experience to the students of Northern to use this facility. It's a component of a number of things that we felt we needed to get Northern to that, you know, the, the pinnacle that we want to be at. It's a prideful thing that uh, that's ours. We figured out how to get it and we're going to defend it. I don't look at this as just a football field. I see people. I see all the faces of all the people who help make it happen. You can roll through them slides. Thank you. I want to I just thank you for taking the, the time and giving me the opportunity to visit with you. Any kind of questions or? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chancellor Kegel. Um, we're going to move on in the agenda here. We're going to approve the, pen, the, the meeting minutes from March 10th and 11th. I'll entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Moved by Regent Dombrowski. Is there any discussions or corrections from members of the board? Is there any discussion or corrections from the campuses? Is there any public comment? Any public comment? Seeing no further comment, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Okay, motion passes. Mr. Commissioner, I'll I'll turn it over to you for this meeting's commissioner and system report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, welcome, everyone, and thank you for being here. Again, to, the, to our regents, thank you for taking time out of your lives to participate in this experiment. It is uh, truly appreciated, and I, I, I know it comes uh, with its challenges. Uh, Northern is, as the chancellor said, just a little bit further drive for us than most of our campuses, but always found uh, that it was worth every mile. Uh, truly a, just a, an enjoyable drive to get here and the experience is uh, one that, that always warms me. It, it is uh, on a personal note where uh, my journey began uh, 16 or 17 years ago. Northern was my first meeting and uh, it, it was a, a, a good introduction into this world and uh, it's been a productive one. So it's great to be back, Chancellor. Thank you for uh, hosting this. Uh, 
appreciated your comments. It truly is more. And, and uh, you know, it is the northerns in our system that will ultimately help uh, our efforts, this board's efforts, to kind of reach that 40% that you mentioned last night. That's, that's the group that we need to expand opportunities to across Montana to really contribute to our uh, workforce needs. Uh, and, and Northern is positioned to do that, and your leadership has really brought uh, a lot to the table here. We thank you. The president and I talk about it all the time. We need, we need Chancellor Kegel there in uh, Northern, and we, we appreciate your efforts here, so thank you. Appreciate uh, your efforts with that dinner last night. I think that was a, a, a great opportunity to interact with uh, people from, from Haver, but also with our legislative counterparts. I want to circle back just quickly to Chair Lozar mentioned commencement. You know, it is what we are all about for all that we do and all that we talk about and all that this structure, whether it's OCHI or the board or, or administration uh, with it, uh, across our system what we do is is ultimately graduate students that is our end goal um, we, we lose that occasionally but I think for the most part it's uh, front and center I enjoyed breakfast this morning and hearing staff at our campuses say that that is the goal that's that's staff that don't always work with students every day but staff that acknowledge and understand the purpose of the MUS is ultimately to graduate students, and we did that last weekend or over the last two weeks, uh, 9,000 students across the state. I think that's uh, uh, quite an accomplishment, and it, it really does speak volumes, especially kind of given where we've been the last few years. Um, I, I'm incredibly proud. You know, we truly are one of the biggest growth engines in the state of Montana. We produce, we train, we educate those individuals that'll be our next business leaders, teachers, lawyers, scientists, all kinds of professionals, and yes, uh, diesel technicians as we saw last night. And I, I think it's just uh, remarkable what we're doing. Um, that whole group that I mentioned is a part of this process that ultimately gets us to commencement. But there is a key component of that, and I wanna take a moment to thank our faculty for all they do. They not only provide the tools, but importantly, they provide the knowledge to our students that help them succeed in these endeavors that they've, they've embarked upon and, and got to the finish line for a whole lot of them last week. So uh, a special thanks to our faculty, and, and uh, we have a faculty representative that I hope you, you pass that thanks along. It truly is the heart and soul of, of what gets students to where they want to be. Um, and it's been, you know, a, a challenge. Uh, I, I, a challenge of the last few years that have been unprecedented. And I've mentioned it at every meeting since I think May of 2020. It, it uh, is a little redundant, but I'm incredibly proud of the work that we've done in Montana to get students back to our campuses, to get faculty uh, the ability to get back in classroom where they can shine, where they can interact with students at a, at a level. You know, we're starting to see uh, Harvard Center for Education released a study a couple weeks ago somewhat focused on K-12, but it really does show where there's a diminution of learning for those that stayed remote longer, for those that are still struggling to get back to in-person. I think uh, both at the K-12 level in your world, uh, Madam Superintendent, but also in ours, we really made an effort in Montana to get students back face-to-face. -face. Uh, that, that came with a cost. Um, but I think it's starting to show out in the numbers that uh, it, it was worth it. And uh, we appreciate all the efforts that went into that to make it worth it. That will absolutely affect uh, how these students do, not only uh, today, but throughout life. I, I'm very concerned about sort of that generational gap that now exists in, in a number of our students. We'll have to work hard to catch those students up. But uh, we know from the numbers that there's a challenge that's been created for us, one that's going to last beyond the the two years of the initial phase of this, and, and we'll, we'll be prepared to meet that. But again, extend my thanks to everyone that saw uh, a successful, yet another successful uh, class graduate from the MUS. I want to turn to their host campus quickly and, and talk a little bit about the Little, little River Institute, something that uh, is unique here. Um, MSU Northern is the only campus in Montana designated at a, as a native serving non-tribal institution by the U.S. Department of Education. And that uh, comes with it certain responsibilities. It also comes with it some grant opportunities. 
that have helped Northern uh, to make improvements, significant improvements to expand the capacity to serve native students. Um, it's also allowed them to create a center here, the Little River Institute, that uh, provides tutoring, mentoring, and support for uh, a, a host of, of Native American students on campus and beyond. And um, if you get a chance to visit that while you're here, uh, it, it's truly remarkable. I think it, uh, I'm always impressed because it shows the ingenuity of uh, what our smaller campuses can do with sometimes not the resources that we have at other parts within the MUS to really serve the students and serve them well. Um, I also, uh, uh, on a different note, want to report some news out of the Department of Education. Um, we have four campuses that have recently been selected uh, to serve as, uh, uh, as part of a pilot for Second Chance Pell. Um, for those of you that uh, haven't seen that, Second Chance Pell is a program uh, that was created in the mid-90s, uh, actually was eliminated in the mid-90s. Uh, when, when Congress eliminated funding for Pell and other uh, federal sources for incarcerated persons. That program was brought back as a pilot in 2015. It's been supported by both administrations since uh, to really give uh, those incarcerated individuals a second chance. We have uh, four institutions, MSU Billings, Helena College, Dawson, and Great Falls College, which will all uh, participate, the original cohort Reestablished in uh, 2015 was 70 camp, uh, camp college campuses, and it's been expanded to 200. And we're very fortunate to be able to have uh, four of our institutions uh, participate in that. And that'll certainly happen through a project or a partnership with the Department of Corrections. And uh, I want to thank the Department of Corrections for all they've done to help bring this to life as well. And, and the governor's office, who's been very supportive of this effort, I, I think it truly uh, is what education is meant to be. It will help those individuals that the chancellor talked about to, to come from here and go to there, that vertical uh, ability to, to change your life and, and to change their outcome, those that are uh, in a bit of a challenging spark, spot to start with. Um, we've got a lot to get through, so I won't drone on too long. Uh, I, I think we'd like to turn to the enrollment report. I believe we have, uh, we do have, Director Scott Lemon here walk you through enrollment and give you a little sense of, of where we are and where we think we're going. Thank you, Commissioner Christian, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Thanks for thanks for having me here, Chancellor Kegel. Thank you so much for a great evening last night. It was uh, amazing to see all your great faculty and staff and, and community partners here on this campus. My first time to have her. Uh, the equipment there was amazing. I felt like an eight-year-old kid again, running around with some of the large equipment. Uh, it was a little strange. I couldn't find anybody to help me start the thing or drive it, but uh, <laughs> it was pretty impressive to see. I tried my darndest. So, uh, uh, great, great staff and great event. Thanks again for that. Uh, we'll get through some brief uh, updates here on the enrollment, some good news to share. I, I try to always start with my one kind of key takeaway. Uh, we'll talk about some future uh, initiatives as well as uh, some updates if you'd like them uh, on this year overall on the uh, fiscal year 22 uh, FTE counts. So I'll run through a couple of these dashboards that uh, my colleague John Thutcher had put together here. And this is the one big and amazing takeaway, and that is that enrollment is up for the system uh, overall for the first time since fiscal year 17. And if you look at that as a percentage of that increase, it goes back even further than this dashboard can, can actually uh, compute that we've got up on the screen. So really encouraging signs that as a system, uh, overall enrollment is uh, showing that positive, uh, positive trend overall. And this is a combination of the summer counts, fall, and in the most current spring numbers uh, we have right now. And so as a system, we're very encouraged by these numbers uh, heading in the right direction after, after a few years of decline there. And that 0.67 increase is important uh, from fiscal year 21 because we're seeing a, a national decrease of 3.1%. So if you look at uh, nationally, you know, everyone uh, looking at that average at a 3.1% decrease uh, in total enrollment there, we're showing that increase overall. So it makes it that much more impactful uh, as a system as we look to uh, as change the tide with, with the increase in enrollment overall, which uh, is very encouraging. We still have some work to do in, in some, a variety of areas. Uh, the resident student piece uh, is still declining, and so we need to do more uh, to that 40% that we talked so much about. But for the entire state of Montana, and I echo what Chancellor Kegel had said there in his remarks uh, about just how difficult it is to recruit and retain students in this, in this environment, 
uh, the work that goes into that, the work that all of our campuses are putting into uh, providing this great education, these resources. We're competing with a lot of uh, external variables, uh, as, as every business is, uh, as every institution in the country is as well. And so keeping this at the forefront uh, for the residents here in the state uh, become increasingly important as we move forward. Uh, I will note that the uh, percentage of decline is shrinking. And so if you look at uh, fiscal year 21 to 22, uh, we're, we're cutting that deficit uh, from the decline there on the, on the resident student piece. So we're excited to see that. Where we see the largest increases, uh, as a lot of you know, is, is some of the non-resident enrollment. We're seeing some uh, pretty substantial gains in the WUI uh, overall at 33% increase uh, fiscal year to fiscal year. Uh, overall, a non-resident piece. We know that there's a lot of folks that are coming to Montana. They're bringing their families. They're, they're thankfully joining our institutions as well. On um, the WUI piece of the 17 institutions, 16 less Montana, to see that uh, as a competitive alternative for students in other states through the WUI program is another opportunity for us as a system, frankly, to, to continue to uh, showcase, I think, the, uh, the great education that we have here in the Montana University system overall. Two year, uh, again, on, on a little bit of a decline, as we're seeing here, relatively flat, but as a percentage from year to year, we're seeing that start to bottom out and, and come back in the right direction uh, as a percentage of the decrease. And some great gains, I, I know we're in a, a little bit of a crunch for time, I won't go campus by campus, uh, but to show, I think, overall, where we're seeing some, some great uh, uh, encouraging trends there from the two year piece uh, overall is, is incredibly encouraging. Good to paint a national picture, so we see some of these larger drops from the clearinghouse data here from different uh, sectors overall, where I think the Montana University system is making some great strides and the hard work from all of our campuses uh, in, in communicating that value proposition to our students and, and our residents, uh, as well as those coming from out of state to show uh, just, just how great I think we are doing when you look at the national picture. Uh, keep in mind, we've got two full classes of students uh, impacted by COVID. So that our students that have actually deferred their enrollments overall have abandoned their plans for post-secondary education as, as a byproduct of being a part of COVID. And, and all of you know those that have elected to stop out. So who's actually on our campuses left and has not returned. So nationally, uh, there's, a, there's a pretty large uh, population of students that we can continue to uh, support our campuses and communicate with as we try to encourage them uh, to continue to look at, uh, at a great education here in the MUS. What's most exciting here, uh, the first time freshman. And so again, back to Chancellor Keeley, kind of, I think we met beforehand. He had some great comments there about the recruitment uh, on the front of the students. We know graduation, the outcomes, all these great things that a lot of my colleagues in our campuses are engaged in uh, are incredibly important. One of the most encouraging uh, points of data that we have are, are the growth of the MUS first time freshman. And it does really start with that. If we're gonna turn the tide on these four to six year run rates of students that are coming through all of our great campuses, it really does start with the first time freshman piece to see this amount of gain uh, here from 20 to 21 uh, uh, in, in, the, in the first time freshman is, is a tremendous win for the system to see uh, overall. And you're looking back here, uh, going years back to see this, this level of gain. It shows the confidence in the system. It shows the confidence uh, that, that our campus leadership have uh, provided in, in making sure that there's a safe place to learn here uh, in the MUS and that students and parents are comfortable uh, coming back. It also highlights, again, as we talk about the value proposition here, uh, in the MUS with post-secondary education uh, in partnership with the OPI and a lot of the great work that uh, Superintendent Arnson is engaged in, uh, all the way to the governor's office and all the great work that is occurring you know, across the state to see this uh, jump in the first time freshman is really where it begins to turn the tide. We can highlight individual successes at our campuses, but to look collectively and say, gosh, we're seeing some great gains in the first time freshman makes uh, 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 me incredibly excited at, at what's to come overall. What are we doing about it? And so we're seeing these great points of pride uh, in the system to be up overall is a, is a tremendous win for, for us to say as the, as the university system, it doesn't stop. And so we've got to continue to uh, uh, highlight a lot of the great um, advantages that we continue to communicate uh, here. And it's, Apply Montana is a big one of them. I know you've all probably never heard of Apply Montana, the resident student college and career readiness portal or the central application in the state of Montana. Uh, but these are the, the building blocks of what I think we're going to start to see with turning the tide here uh, on, these, on these increases in enrollment here for the MUS. It's exciting because it seems like yesterday we just launched our first year for the central application, for example. We saw some tremendous gains uh, in that first year from application data. 
Um, and it does start with the apps and it does start with supporting our campuses in any way that we possibly can. Coming into our third cycle here, July 1st, we'll launch our third cycle for the Central App uh, to see uh, an additional roughly 8% increase in applications this year as we continue to move forward and providing that free application to college uh, for all residents here in the state. Overall, we'll continue to uh, share that information and update the board uh, overall. Apply Montana, March 1st, we launched the Resident Student College and Career Readiness Portal. Uh, it's, a, it's a great success. We're happy to have this up and functional. Um, a lot of our efforts in the outreach space now are impactful. Uh, my colleague, Director Angela McLean, there in the back, and a lot of my folks I work with in Ochi, some great colleagues, uh, you know, we've been mindful to be in person in Montana as much as humanly possible. We'll hit all regional mass meetings in person for the superintendents here in the state of Montana, not just to promote different things happening with Apply Montana, but to talk about uh, the Montana University System, the commissioner's office, and the great work uh, that is occurring here. We're also going to provide these demos and get superintendents uh, and, and, and teachers and, and counselors as excited as possible about it. It's amazing for us to go out and actually do a lot of the work and think that uh, most everybody should know uh, by now, you know, that these great things are, are occurring, but there's still a lot of work to be done uh, in us getting out in person to do that, uh, and we'll continue to do that. Um, so we really want to be mindful of that and, and making sure that we're in person um, overall. We're also getting into high schools, so I use the term amplify quite a bit uh, in, in how do we support our campuses the most effective way humanly possible. And that's to really build off the great work that's occurring in great communities like Haver uh, and, and across the state to, to do that uh, and support and amplify these efforts uh, that are occurring on our campuses. We do that by being in person. We do that by, by being present and having an opportunity to support uh, everybody here in the state as, as much as possible. And we're also gonna engage uh, per the recommendation and guidance from the board and the commissioner to uh, continue these digital awareness campaigns uh, and provide opportunities to uh, get to every Montanan that we possibly can. Uh, to remind them or at least inform them that uh, there's this amazing application that we have online where you can complete one application across all 16 campuses for free. Uh, highlight college application weeks and the variety of amazing efforts that are occurring uh, through Dire Director McLean's uh, shop as well to, to show and highlight and amplify some of those great efforts as well. So we'll have a, a second awareness campaign that we'll be embarking on uh, to showcase the, the portal itself and continue to show the new features and, and opportunities for students to engage. Uh, in closing, again, we're incredibly encouraged uh, by, the, by the growth in the, in the overall enrollment here for the system. Uh, I thank the board and, and all of our community partners uh, for making this uh, possible. Uh, Mr. Chair, happy to stand for questions if the board might have them. Is there any questions for Director Lemon? Yeah, Thanks, Regent Chair Buchanan. Lillard. Excited about the portal, right? First year that we're assessing interactivity and whatnot. I'm just wondering what metrics we're going to be using to evaluate engagement, trend shifts. What, what are we setting up to try to capture as far as that interface between users? Mr. Chair, uh, Regent Buchanan, great question. We have uh, an analytics dashboard set up right now uh, from launch date to, to present to show data. I'm happy to come back and report that to the board. Uh, there's a variety of metrics. One, as I shared before in a previous meeting, will be the, the lane of engagement that a user might embark on uh, in the portal itself. And so if you remember, we've got these, uh, these different personas set up where, you know, what best describes you from a, a lane that you might drive in as a user from a student to a parent to a, to a school counselor. And every metric, every click is uh, from time to site, uh, average, average duration per page is, is being tracked as we speak. Obviously, we want to see traffic going directly to the application and what percentage of our users are doing that, as well as overall impressions. I think at last glance, we've got uh, over 250,000 impressions already on the portal. That is different snapshots of folks that are visiting our site overall. So we're going to look at location. We're going to look at where users are spending their most, uh, the most time on the portal itself. And uh, hopefully one day have, have the ability to track actually who's engaging in the application, submitting that, and then back to where they started that journey overall. So we've got a variety of metrics. I'd be happy to come back and share that with the board if that's of interest. Appreciate that. Thank you. And then just looking at the dashboards you just shared about first-time freshmen, um, the pretty dramatic increase in non-resident first-time freshmen. And then, uh, you know, as we look in the next couple of meetings, sure like to get some analysis as to what we think the impact is on states the state's role in trying to drive our resident students to, to higher ed. I don't, I don't know if it's good or bad, what we're reading, but it's certainly a trend that we're seeing and, and love some analysis as to what we think and if it's something we need to direct in a certain way or shift gears, certainly we look to you all for guidance on that. So subsequent meetings would love further, further digging into that. Thank you, Scott. Mr. Chair, yeah, we'll absolutely continue on this path. Um, I, I think it's good. Um, and having just come back uh, as a witchy conference over the weekend and had dinner with a few of my counterparts it it 
I'm very encouraged by the numbers, but I'm also very encouraged just to be back in Montana. The, the struggles uh, around are, are incredible right now. Um, the, the, frankly, the pandemic's just owned many institutions and they can't really get over the hump. They can't get back at it. They can't uh, sort of re-engage. And uh, you know, we've, we've fought that fight. I, I say we, uh, that certainly goes to the campuses. Um, Ochi's there to support when it can, but it's been the work at the campus levels that have really driven everything from uh, the, the enrollment offices really focused on what we need to do to uh, improve our survivability and, and um, uh, that, that experience for the students. And we'll continue uh, to push on this front. I, I truly appreciate the efforts from the campus. I, I think the portal is a tool that will absolutely uh, help and help drive that into uh, the, the K-12 arena at, a, at an easier level for guidance counselors all across the state to interact with the MUS, to find their path here to, to, to really attract that 40% to all of our institutions across the state. So I'm excited by the numbers, excited where it's going, especially in light of the challenges that we're seeing nationally with uh, year after year declines. Um, it, it, it's a positive statement for us, and, and I think ultimately that blend of students that we'll continue to focus on, but that blend is helping to fund all of education for Montana residents, and we'll continue to push uh, that venue as far as we possibly can. But Regent Sexton. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, not really a question, but I'd be curious to know, uh, as you look at the data, how some of this is tying in with the other regions' initiatives, like Montana 10, so it's particularly with first-time freshmen, how much of a draw are those other uh, initiatives to try to get students in and reaching out to the 40%? Where, yeah. are, where are those, um, what's drawing them in? I'd, I'd be curious to know that. Thank you, though, excellent presentation otherwise. Thank you, Regent Six. Yeah, we'll continue to work on that. Uh, the, Montana 10 is having an absolute impact, Hillman Scholars, absolute impact on those retention rates, which is part of our growth rate, right? I mean, a big part of it. And so those strategies have to work together. Sorry, Regent Dombrowski. Um, we hear that 40% number, and I wonder when we might be updated on sort of the um, finer details of that 40%. Are we making a difference Are right now at 39? I, I, that's a real key metric, I think, of success. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Director Lemon. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, we're going to turn to uh, Deputy Commissioner Thigpen, give us a little bit of uh, insight on what's happening across our, our world in terms of legislative and, and MUS updates. But I also just introduce the, the notion that as part of our planning process, we do consider what other things are on the horizon, things like Montana 10 and, and specifics that uh, Deputy Commissioner Thigpen will talk about. But uh, I, I want to say these, these are just ideas in the pipeline. And I'm always kind of cautious bringing ideas too far forward because I don't want to make expectations. But uh, we have to, as part of a planning process, think through some of these. We have to get a read from the regents as to what they think. We have to get a read from the governor's office. So we bring these forward for you today to kind of consider and start thinking about, and, and we'll sort of continue to work through these throughout the summer and then ultimately into the fall and the budget work with, with the governor's budget office and the governor. Um, re, uh, uh, Deputy Commissioner, thank you. I almost called you a regent there for some reason. I don't, I don't know. That's fine. I'm up yeah. for it. That's <laughs> Chair Lozar, members of the board, Commissioner Christian and, and guests, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. I was thinking about the dinner like Director Lemon last night and I was just thinking about how, um, you know, the community members, the folks that you had speak there from industry, each one of them without fail got up to the podium and said they didn't like public speaking and they weren't good public speakers. And so I too uh, don't like public speaking and I'm not a good uh, speaker, but then they hit it out of the park. So, you know, maybe that by saying that I'll uh, get some, give myself a better shot. Um, but I would also ask Commissioner Christian, if, if I do start to go on a little bit long, if you could give me a hand signal or something to shut it down, that would be, would be helpful because I could go on and on about some of these <laughs> initiatives. So anyway, thank you. Um, so as the commissioner mentioned at Ochi, planning for the next session is, is really well underway. 
Um, and we've identified a handful of system initiatives that we'll be seeking funding for through, through the governor's office uh, and through the budget office for next session. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to the screen here. Uh, we do have um, hard copies, I believe, of, of these in your, in your packets, but um, these are one-page handouts that we've put together sort of summarizing the high points of each key legislative initiative that we'll be moving forward with. Um, so I'll be scrolling through these as we, as we go uh, along. Um, and a couple of quick, quick caveats that I think are important to making. Commissioner touched on a few of them, but also I just want to highlight that these initiatives are designed to work in conjunction with our top three priorities, which have not changed, which are, you know, the present law adjustment, the long-range building program projects for capital developments and major repairs, as well as the state pay plan. And those, that has not changed. Those will continue to be our top three priorities, um, but we will also be pursuing uh, these as well. The other point I want to make is that these initiatives aren't necessarily exclusive. As you know, um, you know, as the commissioner said, the lead up to the session is incredibly dynamic. Things change quickly. We will remain um, incredibly flexible as we get more information from the governor's office, our legislative partners. Uh, this is sort of a snapshot of where we are today, but it doesn't mean uh, that it will be the exact same uh, going forward. So I just wanted to add that. Uh, caveat. And then third, you know, there are so many great initiatives and campus projects that we could move forward with in, in our system. Um, it's, it's very difficult to kind of uh, pull these together um, into a, a small, a manageable number. Um, but we have identified these as ones that I think align best with the board's strategic plan and then also the feedback that we've received from our legislative partners and in the governor's office um, about kind of where we need to be, especially with uh, respect to student retention and completion. You'll see that in Montana 10, workforce development, and a few other strategic uh, efforts that we have. Um, and then finally, uh, you'll see here on the sheets that we haven't included a number, right? I mean, that's going to be the, the first question is, what's the amount that we're going to be uh, seeking? And we intentionally have not, not included that. Our, our intent right now is to work through the governor's budget office on that uh, process to kind of see where we're at, see where we land, and then flesh that out in the coming months as they, they really start ramping up their executive planning process. So just in, in case anybody wanted to ask that question, I thought I'd preempt it uh, there. Um, so the first legislative initiative doesn't need too much discussion, I don't think, but um, this is Montana 10. Um, this is our system-led student retention and completion initiative that is designed to truly transform how we get students over the finish line uh, with a degree uh, in less time and with less debt in Montana. Um, since the first cohort was started in 2020, the project has seen measurable and really remarkable uh, success. And through Ochi, through Director Miller, uh, is building on that success right now, um, as you know, and, but we believe Montana 10 is especially well suited for further state investment. Um, and I, I really want to emphasize one, one point here, and that is that Montana 10 is as much a workforce initiative as it is a, as a student retention and completion effort. And by saying that, I, I certainly don't want to get away from the direct benefits to the students that, that they would receive through this, through this initiative, but I think there's no doubt that workforce development is an incredibly important component of Montana 10. And as noted at the top of this one pager here, uh, we have Montana 10 enhances the state's skilled workforce by dramatically increasing the number of Montanans who have two-year and four-year degrees and does so at a lower cost per degree for Montana taxpayers. And so that'll be a theme that we'll be uh, uh, working with um, going into the session and as we communicate with, with our partners there. And I'll leave it to Commissioner Christian and, and Deputy Commissioner Tessman later to kind of maybe fill in some of the finer points of, of what's happening with Montana 10 um, if necessary, but certainly we're incredibly excited about that effort. Um, I'll just move along here. Um, the second initiative that we have is uh, focused on cybersecurity. Um, this initiative has two separate but interrelated components that I just wanted to touch on briefly. Um, the first piece of the initiative is focused on developing a comprehensive system level cybersecurity infrastructure in the MUS. Um, as the board is no doubt aware, we received a few recommendations from a recent legislative uh, audit that has really brought this into greater focus, I think, in our office. Um, 
You may also know that uh, IT governance infrastructure has been very decentralized uh, traditionally in our office, and that's uh, not to say that um, the campuses haven't been doing an incredible job because they are, and, and, and those were not the gaps that were identified. What, what we're talking about is bringing that to the system level and really um, framing that up in, in our office. And you're gonna hear more about that um, from Margaret Miller, our Director of Enterprise Risk and Assurance, I think, close? that close? Yep. Um, but Margaret has all the details on um, the, the audit and, can, and, and is going to work through some of the plans that we currently have in place to work through that. Um, but one of the recommendations that we did receive was that OG needed to play a more active role in improving the more overall security posture uh, for, of cybersecurity in the system. Um, so we'll get some more information from her, but that's the first piece of that cybersecurity effort. Um, the second piece is, is really exciting, and it is um, uh, to develop um, uh, a, a true center for cybersecurity education at uh, University of Montana through Missoula College. Um, and it really gets to that, again, that theme of workforce uh, development, but also ensures that we are focusing on in-demand programs and trainings that can provide truly statewide uh, benefits. Um, so under Pro President Bodner, and he's more than welcome to jump in if he, if he would so choose, um, but UM has positioned itself to really lead, I think, a collection of MUS campuses to meet the high demand for skilled cybersecurity professionals in the state of Montana. Uh, and we think with further support, UM can really become the leading cybersecurity training and education center in the state and um, we're really excited about that because part of part of that strategy is not only educating the next generation of cybersecurity professionals but it's equally important for businesses uh, who often don't have the resources and training that they need to protect their electronic data so through this initiative we think that uh, we can both leverage what's available at um for the overall benefit of cybersecurity at ochi and across the campus and then also expand upon some of the great work that's being done at UM and uh, through um, Missoula College uh, there. So I will leave it to President Bodner if he'd like to add anything else there, but um, that should be, um, we'll go just go ahead then. <laughs> the third uh, system priority that we have is uh, what we're calling the Seamless System Initiative. And again, designed around two major components. Uh, the first is a single online course catalog, and the second is a single online learning management system. Um, just a really quick refresher, the single online course catalog right now allows students to go to one spot and explore the and register for classes offered online at other MUS institutions. And one of the barriers that we've heard in the system is that students haven't always been able to um, access specialized programs that may be offered at uh, one particular campus, or they might not have access to a particular course that they need, maybe just to finish up a certificate or uh, a degree. So providing a single online course catalog has truly transformed, I think, what we're able to do across the system, and it builds off of uh, the common course numbering effort that Director Teal has spent an incredible amount of time on and provides students with really expanded opportunities where they can take a course now uh, hundreds of miles away from their home institution uh, and really um, dive in that way. So that's, that's an incredibly exciting, exciting effort that is underway right now, but of course there are ways that that could be expanded and as you can imagine it could be a place for uh, dual enrollment courses to be featured and so that's, that's one area that we think has a lot of, of promise um, and highlight there. The single LMS is the second piece of this initiative um, and it's, it's really, uh, again, sort of getting at that theme of shared services and just doing a better job across the system of kind of bringing these systems together. Um, and so right now, if I think, I believe the board received an update on this, but right now, uh, both U of M and MSU, both sides of the system are operating on two different uh, learning management systems. And so the single LMS would really um, bring that together under a unified system and would allow for a more consistent uh, online learning environment for students. It would be easier for staff on, on the back end, which is incredibly important, and also provide uh, better transfer opportunities and pathways for students regardless of their home campus. So there will be a lot of work in the, in the next couple of months that are going into that um, in terms of identifying 
uh, a vendor and working through that process. And of course, the campuses will be playing a huge role in that. Their feedback will be essential to the success of this particular project. So there, that will be a heavy lift, but um, that is uh, underway right now. And the fourth uh, legislative initiative is the RIDE program. And President Cruzado can certainly speak to this um, more uh, if she would like to, but this uh, is initiative is the Regional Initiatives in Dental Education. Um, and I think it's probably the easiest way to think about RIDE is to probably think about it in the same vein as WAMI um, for, for training dentists. Um, students spend their first year studying in Bozeman and then go on to Washington State University and the University of Washington for their second and third years. And then the final year is spent doing essentially a residency in a rural Montana community. And under this per particular proposal, eight students would start in fall of 2024 uh, with the goal of having up to 32 students in the fall of 2027. And, and the aim, I think it's really important to uh, state here, is to develop dentists who will make a personal commitment to serving the needs of rural and underserved communities. Um, the, the board, um, some of you may recall, approved the RIDE program in 2019, but it's been operating um, it's been funded with grant dollars since that time, so we'll be looking for some legislative uh, support, some state support for this effort. Um, and, you know, we could pull up all the statistics, and I think I've got a, a few of them on here about the true need for dentists uh, and dental professionals in rural Montana communities. And there's some, the state had recently put out a study that, um, you know, there are some counties, up to 11 counties in Montana, that don't have any residing dentist at all. Um, and that, so they're, is uh, certainly a need for dentists uh, throughout rural Montana. And then the final uh, initiative that, that we're, we have, uh, but again, in no particular order here, uh, I don't, um, is our innovation initiative. Um, and it's truly, this is, this is a really exciting one to talk about, um, and you're gonna hear a little bit more about this tomorrow in the education um, interim committee meeting. Um, but it really is incredible that UM and MSU together now bring in over 300 million each year in new funds that drive innovation, develop new technologies, uh, as well as businesses, and also, of course, high-paying uh, jobs. Um, and now, uh, Montana is the only state in the region to have two R1 universities with UM's recent uh, designation as an R1 campus, which is the highest designation that those can, that research campuses can can receive. So that is just absolutely remarkable. A couple hundred miles down the road from each other to have two R1 uh, campuses in the state of Montana. And so uh, part of this initiative will be um, leveraging that, um, and we'll be making the case that we can expand Montana's high tech enterprise, including efforts around precision agriculture, which. Um, you may have heard a little bit about uh, last night, but truly by leveraging university networks, talent, facilities to support and encourage the commercialization of university research. Um, as Director Teal had pointed out to me when we were prepping for this meeting, the high tech industry is growing seven times faster than any other sector right now, and, and we want to uh, you know, position what we think um, are great, great efforts in the university system uh, for that. Um, but while there's success in that area, uh, we also talked about that there are uh, additional barriers that exist uh, to further expansion that we really think the MUS can, can help address. And primarily the ability for startups and new ventures to access cutting edge space and equipment and to hire well-trained and specialized workforce. Um, so through this initiative, we believe we can deepen the ties between the university system and the high tech industry. And you can certainly take a look at the one pager for more information on sort of the specific strategies for how we think uh, we can do that. Um, and if there's, if I have a quick minute, I could give a real brief update on um, the federal status of some legislation that might be of interest, or we can jump to the next topic. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe we should pause for a minute and. Um uh, first off, it was a great presentation. And uh, process-wise, this is probably the most comprehensive set of priorities and options for the board to consider. You know, in May, leading up to a session. So, appreciate all the the work that's gone into this and the ability to bring to us some ideas that um, I think will 
we, we can pick and choose from and to, to figure out sort of what a compre comprehensive package might look like for the university system and, and bring into the governor's office and bring into the legislature. So wonderful pr uh, presentation on, a, on some very important items. Um, I would turn it to any members of the board that have any questions. Yeah, Regent Bao. Um, thank you, Chair Lozar. Deputy Commissioner Thickman. What do we think the timing is for the LMS and for having a recommendation and, and a, do we have a time for where we want to end up um, with that result? Because it seems like an important efficiency move, you know, especially in this environment when it's hard to, to, to keep staffing in some of those departments. Thank you. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, Regent Bao. Yes, so the LMS process is is underway. Um, where Director Teal has a lot more information on the, the details of the project, but I believe this summer there's already a working group that's uh, working through some of the the process for identifying the needs and kind of what what it would need to look like to be as effective as possible. And then they'll go out for an RFP, uh, the request for proposal process, uh, put that out to vendors and see what kind of responses that they get. And I believe um, it would be, the goal is to have that selected and have the vendors selected in the fall, from what I understand, yeah. And uh, just to follow up, Chair Lozer, uh, so Deputy Commissioner Thigman, do, do, will we have at that time then an assessment about what the financial implications might be, you know, whether there's upfront costs and long-term savings? And yes, yes, um, Mr. Chair, Regent Bao, yes, we'll have, a, we'll have a much more comprehensive idea of the cost and kind of what that will all look like then. Um, yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Mr. Chair, I guess just one other comment on this. I, I, I do want to make sure that this is in content of uh, these are other initiatives, and I, I don't want to lose sight of the fact that I, I sometimes forget we've got at least four board members that will be going through a first legislative sort of cycle. Um, this does not supplant conversations that we absolutely need to have around present law adjustments, but maybe more importantly, uh, given the environment and, and our discussion this morning also around a pay plan. And generally speaking, Present law adjustments and pay plan are, are, are 1A and 1B, and we're not really sure who the A and the B is in terms of our priorities that we move into the legislative session with, and that will clearly be the case. It, it is a little bit of a shell game. If, if we end up with no present law adjustments and a pay plan, it doesn't really solve our problem. If we end up with the opposite, it doesn't solve our problem. So we really need to work uh, in concert to make sure that we uh, work with the budget office over the summer to get a sufficient uh, number into the the budget and then ultimately work with the legislative or through the legislative process to to move those two priorities forward long-range building also sits kind of on that list of things we do and then we have this list of other things that we can consider and, and I think it's a great list it's got Montana 10 LMS um, both of those have a positive return on investment for the state of Montana um, we need to make that case but I think there's some reasons to fund these along with some of our other requests, but that'll that'll be the process as we move forward, Mr. Chair. I, th I think if we could, um, Deputy Commissioner, maybe go uh, gain about another 30,000 feet, just hit those federal things at a very, very high yeah. level because yeah. we're kind of getting low on time. Mr. Commissioner, before we transition to the, the, the federal side, I did have just a couple comments on the, the set of priorities. Um, and I think I repeat this in most of our meetings, but Montana 10 is something that we've talked a lot about as a board. I think we really support this. The, the results are there. Um, I, I see the legislature as a great partner to us on this particular project, and I'm highly encouraging the university system and those campuses that have Montana 10 programs to tell the story to your local legislators. I, I, mean, I think about what you did, Seth, at uh, University of Montana at our meeting back in November with legislators there, and it was, it was pretty powerful to see the students and then see the data and see the outcomes. And if the legislature doesn't know and feel what Montana 10 is doing and looks like, um, it could be just another sort of item that they they have to consider during the legislative session. So we need to do a much better job of telling the Montana 10 story. Um, and then just the, the second item on uh, the, the initiative around cybersecurity, you know, our good friend Bob Nystoon would be really excited that this is <laughs> on the uh, agenda. Um, I just wanted to make publicly a, a comment that, um, you know, we did have a, the legislative audit and there were some recommendations and 
I, I told somebody in, in my community in, in Helena how important the role is of legislative audit on an, on an item like cybersecurity. And so I just want to extend our gratitude to that office and to Angus and to others who worked on those uh, on that particular audit. This is particularly important for the system and obviously it's, it's risen to a point where it's one of our top priorities. So please extend, Mr. Commissioner, uh, our gratitude for all the work that, that the audit team did uh, this go around. That being said, uh, I think we can transition to the, the federal side. Um, Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner Christian, I'll be super quick with this. I just wanted to give a real quick uh, update on kind of where things are at um, federally. And really, uh, as you can imagine, um, things are pretty pretty deadlocked right now, so I don't have too much to report on except for one really bright area that I think we, we are um, likely to see something um, soon is related to those, those two pieces of federal le legislation that I've updated this board uh, before on, which are the competitiveness bills, the USICA bill and the uh, USA Competes bill. And those bills are really sort of the, they started as endless frontiers and it, it's uh, really about uh, increasing the United States uh, position in research and development on security uh, related to uh, China and other foreign, foreign countries. And it really has a lot of support. It's in conference committee right now. Uh, I believe Senator Tester uh, and maybe even Senator Danes are, are conferees on that um, on that uh, piece of legislation. So we've been engaged in that process. We are advocates for uh, a piece in the USICA legislation that would really um, create these regional hubs in low population uh, states, regional research hubs, um, and we think that's an incredibly important piece for for us and. Uh, our campuses are sort of leading leading a consortium of, of states in that area. So that is probably the last chance for true bipartisan uh, legislation um, this this uh, before the midterm midterms elections and all of that in the fall. So that is that is rather exciting for our, our campuses. Um, and then quickly, I just like to say, you know, build back better. You heard about that. You heard about that during the budget reconciliation process. That included, you know, billions of dollars for. Um, it, higher education funding in general, but that that is, I think all everyone agrees is, is dead, uh, not really going anywhere. Some of that was moved into the budget that was ultimately passed, but Build Back Better is is uh, for the time being um, gone. Um, and then I would just draw the t attention that we are expecting new Title IX uh, rules to come out, revisions to the Title IX rules. They were supposed to be released in April, but it's been pushed back to May, uh, and so it could be any day now we'll see a revised package of rules implementing Title IX. A lot of activity on the student loan loan front. Um, student loans have been, uh, payments have been paused through August, I believe, um, but then of course that's part of the larger uh, conversation. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's really shifted to sort of the agency focused policy regulations that are coming out, uh, not so much on, at, a, at a Congress at, at this time. But Mr. Chair, that's what I have on that front. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Thigpen. We appreciate the updates. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> and your public speaking skills were just fine. <laughs> 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 She likes the just fine. So we're going to invite um, Director Christine Miller up to the podium. Uh, just want to talk a little bit about mental health. Uh, I don't want to shortcut this one. I will tell you that in, in my walks around campus, and I have been getting back to campuses a lot more, uh, I certainly hear about mental health. And all of you hear about mental health every day. Uh, when we have lunch with students, when we have lunch with uh, faculty, when, I mean, every group is talking about mental health. and yet. Um, I, I think we need to figure out a little bit how the rubber meets the road. Obviously, we're doing a ton on the campuses, and I want to commend the campuses for the work that they're doing, the space that they're filling, the challenges that they're meeting, given uh, what the pandemic has done and, and other nuances. Um, but the, the Witchy has a behavioral health uh, committee that I'm on, and Yet the numbers have never been lower. I mean, in terms of just challenges out there, students right now, uh, they're, they're sitting about where uh, veterans returning from war are at and, and other comparator groups that are, you know, often seen as a pretty challenging group. And uh, so we've got to do a lot. And I, I think the question is, what does that mean? And when we talk to campuses about, you know, obviously resources, but 
beyond that? How, how are we in the right place at the right time? How are we meeting those needs and beyond? And so it's really a focus of our office, uh, really a focus around the, the task force that I seated a few years back with uh, suicide prevention and that and how we're going to pull those together. We're going to talk more about this in the meetings to come, but I uh, wanted to get uh, Director Miller to at least give us sort of an update of where we're at now and sort of where we see this thing as we continue to move forward on this path and, and really just absolutely have to meet those challenges and, and how we're going to do that, uh, I, th I think, is, is front and center for us. Thanks, Commissioner Christian. Chair Lozar, nice to see everybody this morning. Chancellor Kegel, thanks for having us. I have to say, um, MSU Northern was the very first college campus I ever was on as a, as a little, little kid. So every time I come here, I just have like those kind of excitement feelings and it feels really good to be back here. So thanks for hosting us. Um, as Commissioner Christian said, this student mental health, as we all know, is one of the most important issues that our system and our institutions and all of us are facing right now. Um, it's a cross-cutting issue. It touches every single part of student life, uh, academic life, all of the units that we are collectively responsible for. And it's something that we, um, as Commissioner Christian has suggested, we've been working on for a very long time and there's been a lot of good work happening. Um, and we also need to continue to do more. It's a challenge that will never be solved. We are not gonna check the box on this one and move on and say we solved it and revisit it in 10 years or 15 years. It's a continuous ongoing effort that is um, both a big challenge and changing over time constantly. And we need to, as we develop our strategies um, and our approaches, we need to keep that in mind. Um, I'll also say, I'm glad to be able to talk about this in, in this particular setting. It's a cross-cutting issue that affects everything from enrollment to uh, some of the workforce development, the graduation, uh, having, having students with degrees. We, we talk about, um, Director Lemon shared a really good news story about um, numbers being up for our system. Um, and that's great. We, we need to focus on increasing access. We're not increasing access so, so students can enter and then leave. We're increasing access so students can get through and earn a degree. And student mental health is right at the center of that student success conversation. And in a lot of cases, it's, it's the make or break it ticket. So I'm gonna share with you today a little bit about some of the efforts that have been ongoing, both on the campus level um, and through the task force. And then I'm just gonna spend most time kind of talking through um, some of uh, what I think we need to do as a system and how we can move forward in collectively developing some effective strategies. So uh, just to, to start out, um, there's a lot going on on campuses, a lot going on across individual institutions uh, that aren't necessarily part of the task force or part of our system work. And those uh, things probably don't get highlighted enough. This is just a couple of them. Um, uh, three campuses across the system have developed a project called Montana Hopes. It's a, a NSF grant, a graduate student NFS grant that uh, uh, works to help uh, develop uh, mentoring skills in faculty advisors and, and better support our graduate students. Uh, many of our campuses participate in something called Healthy Colleges Montana, which is a partnership with NASPA, National Student Affairs Organization, and that, that group is all about uh, doing some kind of grassroots development in education and peer, mental, uh, uh, peer educator uh, mental health support. There's also a really exciting uh, partnership between MSU, University of Montana, and OPI uh, called the Rural Mental Health Preparation Practice Pathway, very similar to the Rural Educator Pathway uh, program that cultivates and provides education for uh, uh, clinicians wanting to practice in rural places and, and building some uh, structures to support that so that we get more clinicians in our rural places in Montana. 
Um, all of our campuses participated in a, a survey around student mental health and behaviors called the American College Health Assessment. That's a tool that really helps campuses understand where their students are, what challenges they're experiencing on a whole range of, of uh, health and behaviors, including mental health. There's a lot of other things going on across our, ca our campuses. I wanted to highlight a few here at MSU Northern. There's been a lot of work over the past couple of years on developing their care team. Each campus has a care team and, and in some cases a BIT team, a behavioral intervention team. Those teams are really about developing networks across campuses and developing um, some some education and, and mental health literacy and ability to recognize students in distress so that the whole campus is engaged in identifying students and building supports around those students. So lots of work happening on the campus level. There, of course, is also the work of the Suicide Prevention and Mental Health Task Force. You all have seen this before. I'm not gonna go through this too much, but uh, I did wanna quickly highlight this. Um, this is the set of recommendations that the task force originally came up with. This matches um, some of the national best practices around, around student mental health and what college campuses can do. This is in place on our campuses, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's not a one and done type of thing. This all, maintaining these recommendations is an ongoing effort and an ongoing lift uh, for all of our campuses and for our system. And so that work is always happening, um, even if it's not new, it's, it's always ongoing. In the past year, uh, the Suicide Prevention and Mental Health Task Force has launched You Matter MUS, our three uh, virtual services are available to every single student and every single staff and faculty member across the MUS. One is a suicide prevention training. There's two modules for that, one specifically for students and one for faculty and staff. We have an online virtual referral platform so that uh, campus uh, staff and clinicians can connect students to community providers when needed. And we also have, a, a, it's like an app, it's a web-based platform called You at College that is a tool that uh, helps connect students to personalized information, education, resources, strategies, all around mental health and wellness. And all of those are available um, and used by students and faculty and staff across the system. We've also worked to implement a system-wide suicide surveillance data tracking. Um, this is an important uh, piece of data in understanding um, suicide across our system. It's not about, um, you know, a, a punitive measure or saying like uh, suicides happen and, and that's bad and we need to, to do more. We do need to do more. It's more about understanding um, access to lethal means and figuring out where we can make interventions, where uh, we can do more to kind of spread out the time between when a, a student's having suicidal ideation and, um, and those actions. And so um, it's really about a, a good piece of information for us in our prevention efforts. We've partnered with NASPA to administer the NCHA. That's been very valuable for our campuses. And we are also um, at work planning the fall 2020 MUS Mental Health and Wellness Summit. I'll return to that at the end here. So even with all of that work, even with those years and years of ongoing work, we're still, as Commissioner Christian said, seeing some pretty challenging signs among our student population. I'll always say, and, and this still holds true, that our students um, fare better than their peers of same age, same demographics who are not in college. So our colleges and our campuses are protective environments for our students. They do fare better, and yet we know that they are really experiencing some challenges that are not only impacting them as people, but that are impacting their academic performance and their ability to, to earn their college degree and go out into the Montana workforce and do all of the kinds of things that Chancellor Kegel was talking about. So I'm not gonna go through all of these, but, but these are a couple of points I think we ought to be paying pretty close attention to. I will draw out a couple of things. One is just, the impact of stress and mental health on students' academic performance. And the second um, thing is that uh, is around food insecurity. And I think 
uh, basic needs insecurities like housing insecurity, food insecurity, safety insecurity don't often get um, the kind of attention that they might need in discussions of student mental health and wellness. So we, we can return to these points if, if you're interested. There's also, of course, um, some good news to share. Um, and these are the points where I think as much as we focus on where students are being challenged, we also need to focus on the areas where we can actually make a difference for students and, and the ways that we can build environments, support clinical services, support clinicians, understand this as a public health issue. There are a lot of things that we can do and where our students are thriving are the areas that we ought to be paying attention to as we develop strategies to as we go forward. So, as we're here, kind of coming off of a really intensive couple of years with COVID, as we're sort of seeing a national increase in mental health and wellness needs and uh, student demand and all of our attention to mental health and wellness, I really think it's worth our system stepping back and reassessing how we are doing this. What are our strategies at the system level for supporting student mental health and wellness? If we go back to these original recommendations from the task force, you'll see that a lot of these recommendations really live in one place on campus, and that's with our campus counseling centers or our suicide prevention coordinators or units. We all understand a lot better what public health means now after the past couple of years. And I really think that our first step in, in doing this work and taking a more comprehensive approach is to really reframe student mental health, not as a clinical issue specifically or exclusively, but as a public health issue. And what that means is we need to understand in a more comprehensive way what all of our roles are from our different units, the different tools that we have in being able to address that. Now, we could do that by kind of staying the course. We could keep doing what we're doing, fostering some of those individual campus efforts, um, participating on a system level, taking little things here and there and kind of seeing some of the collective impact. That's, that's what we're doing right now and I think you know, you heard a uh, uh, last Board of Regents meeting from Dennis Moff Moffitt from uh, Witchy about, like, that's, that's more than a lot of other systems are doing. We could keep doing that. We could also, uh, on the other end, just totally transform everything we're doing. We could put every resource we have. We could all dedicate all of our time and all of our energy to mental health. I think we have a lot of other concerns that we need to attend to, and that's, that's the trick, is figuring out what our concerns are, how we can make the most strategic impact, and what those strategies are such that we can uh, do better by our students in this area, and so that we can continue to fulfill our mission and our other um, needs right now. I think that to help us find what that sweet spot is, to help us find the areas of highest need, to help us identify the most effective cross-cutting strategies, uh, I think that we need to do a, a system-wide mental health needs assessment. What that could look like, what our scope is, I think that we will all uh, participate in that. As, as I've said, I think that the mental health task force is, is a key player in this, but we are all also stakeholders and to be able to make the kind of transformative change and move out of a, a more emphasis on um, clinical services and our task force being the sole group that, that does that work, we need to take a broader approach and engage more people and, and broaden out our scope a little bit. So I think that that is where we'll head. That's what our task force will be doing uh, with all of you. Um, again, what that looks like, I think we need to develop that together. Um, and that will require resources. And I also think at the, at the back end of that, we need to be um, committed to the action and the recommendations and the strategies that come along with that. 
So I'll, I'll wrap up there. Um, I'll stand for questions, but I do want to note, everybody mark your calendars. Our uh, Mental Health and Wellness Summit will be held uh, at MSU Billings on September 20th through 22nd in conjunction with our next Board of Regents meeting. Um, you'll all be invited, and we will be doing some of this work around uh, our our um, mental health needs assessment and developing this scope and, and our community and campus stakeholders that we think ought to be part of that. So mark your calendars and I'm happy to stand for questions. Any questions? Thank you, uh, Commissioner Christian. Just one quick comment, Director Miller. I know um, we, we don't stand alone in this project, you know, colleagues outside of higher ed or prioritizing this. And just want to thank you and your colleagues. We, I know I've tried to make some connections and have made some connections and trying to correlate and collaborate has been a top priority. We can't do all of them, but um, I know how much, uh, how passionate you are. And I, I think we're identified as a leader in this conversation due to your work. And please just pass on to your team how grateful we are for your focus on everything. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Superintendent. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Chair. I'm heartfelt about this. How many times have I come and I've spoken about mental health? And we are coming out of a pandemic, but mental health has always been there. But to have a teacher recognize that is a challenge, to have the experts understand that is even more so. But we have a supply issue within our great state, in rural Montana, as well as in some of our very urban areas. So I'm very pleased that this is happening. I've talked to the governor's office about what funding there might be for some sort of a resource or a tool to aid our teachers and our community members and focus on families because that is the root of it as well. It's not just what happens within our system of education, it's within our system of our communities and our families. So I was gonna hit on that. You've just taken a couple moments off to be able to discuss this. We're looking at accreditation right now and what does that mean to be a quality school impacting our counseling as well? So this is a very large issue that we're peeling back and we want to honor all of those that serve in this capacity and I'm all in. We'll do whatever we can with our agency and bringing all of our schools together because this is about us. This is about our future and it's not about a campus, it's about our communities. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Superintendent. That's that's exactly where we want to be. Um, thank you, Director Miller. I, I guess I would leave it where I started, which is I, I am incredibly appreciative to all of our campuses that have stepped up during this incredibly challenging time and are meeting the needs. But yes, we need more resources. Um, we need a lot more things at the table, and we'll work toward uh, that together. Thank you. So just uh, a couple more things, Mr. Chair. I realize we're running a little long here. Um, we have a, a, an introduction and then uh, uh, an announcement. I, President Bonner, if you're ready, we'll go to the introduction, please. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Commissioner Christian and uh, Mr. Chair, Regents. Uh, I have an exciting announcement today and an exciting introduction. And uh, I want to introduce to the Montana community the uh, next provost and executive vice president for the University of Montana and that is a Dr. Pardis Madavi. Pardis is here. And uh, so, you know, we, we talk a lot at the University of Montana about our, uh, our mission, and, and, and vision really boils down to, to two words, inclusive prosperity. Uh, we come back to those two words again and again, inclusive prosperity, and you'll, you'll hear us uh, come back to those. And, and I'm so excited because those two words that really embody uh, Pardis' entire career, her demonstrated uh, record of achievement in scholarship and uh, in leadership. She's joining us from Arizona State University, uh, where currently she has been serving as the Dean of Social Sciences. So in that role, she oversaw 11 schools and 25 centers, uh, more than 800 faculty members, and 30,000 students. So. Uh, comes with a great deal of leadership experience. Prior to ASU, she was the dean of the Joseph Corbell School of International Studies at the University of Denver, was also the, the dean of women at Pomona College, uh, and understands really that, that student life aspect as well, and, uh, and has also uh, been the president and director of the Pacific Basin Institute. So um, 
you know, she is a, a, a true, you know, national talent, and, and we're so grateful to have her at the University of Montana, uh, but, but also here in Montana uh, to, to be a partner across the system to, to better serve every single student, uh, whether, they're, uh, whether they're in Missoula or, or here in Haver or, or wherever, uh, the, the, the partnership and expertise she will bring will, will benefit Montana for, for generations to come. And uh, welcome, parties to, uh, to Montana. We're so happy to have you. Before, uh, if I could, before I cede the, the, the floor back to the commissioner, I, I do want to take just a moment to express my deep gratitude to uh, Dr. Reed Humphrey. Uh, uh, Dr. Humphrey has served as the acting provost at the University of Montana for, for nearly uh, two years, stepping into a role uh, during the pandemic when we felt it wasn't uh, appropriate to, to launch a search in 2020, uh, Provost Humphrey uh, willingly stepped into that role. He, uh, his, uh, under his leadership over the past two years, more than 5,000 students have received their UM degree uh, during a global pandemic. And uh, that is a, a, a tremendous achievement. So Reed, is Reed in? There he is. Reed, stand up too. Um, Reed has been a partner and friend uh, to so many, and uh, he will be going back to uh, to the College of Health, and uh, and and so he won't necessarily be coming to all these meetings, um, but uh, he he will be here and and will still be part of the University of Montana family. So Reed, thank you for your service and leadership. Welcome, Pradees, and uh, thank you, Reed. Um, so last thing on my list, but the most important thing possibly on my list. Uh, very important announcement. Uh, a few years ago, we started a tradition of recognizing a staff member uh, in the MUS for excellence in service. MUS, we employ about 3,000 uh, classified staff members across the system. Um, and as everyone knows, everyone would attest, these are highly dedicated individuals that serve every day uh, on campus, making campus uh, a place that students wanna be, a place where students can function, and we appreciate all the work. These nominees uh, are submitted by uh, Musa, the staff senate organization that we had breakfast with this morning. And from those, uh, we, we pick a, 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 a recipient to be uh, recognized as this year's uh, Regents Award for Excellence. And that individual is Debbie Winnegar. And I think is Debbie here? Debbie's in the house. Come on up here and say hello. <laughs> we will just while she's coming up, Debbie, Debbie serves as the Administrative Associate for the College of Health and Sciences here at MSU Northern and is truly the glue that keeps the college going. She is a major asset during the recent accreditation for the nursing program here at Northern, uh, which is both an ASN and a BSN, and they receive full accreditation. She's dedicated to each and every student that comes in contact on the campus, no matter what program they're enrolled in. Debbie is a Northern graduate from the class of 2014 with an AS of business, and she is a firm Northern supporter, attending as many games as she can on campus. Uh, the students enrolled here at the college and beyond, uh, Debbie serves them and serves them well as student center advisor to both the integrated health sciences programs and the nursing program. Debbie goes above and beyond her daily duties by helping in any way possible to ensure that the department within the college are running smoothly she does her job with grace and never fails to help in any way that she can. Debbie, congratulations. Thank you. Um, this is a great honor for this award and I appreciate it. I work with a great team here at MSU Northern and I just love the students. And any way I can help the whole system as well as Northern is on my to-do list every day. Thank you. Congratulations. Mr. Chair, with apologies, I return to you. We are concluded. <laughs> no, thank you, uh, Mr. Commissioner, for a great, uh, great report, comprehensive, certainly. Um, and again, congratulations to Debbie for uh, this year's uh, Excellence Award. Um, if it's okay uh, with you, Dylan, and Elsie, and we might take a break. Um, 
we'll take about a 10 minute break and then come back and then we'll uh, give you the floor for your remarks. We'll be back at about 10.40. All right, uh, we're gonna bring the meeting back into order. And um, again, thank you, I'm, I'm glad, we're running a little late, but I'm glad we spent quite a bit of time on uh, the very important items that the commissioner brought to our attention this morning. Um, right now, we're gonna turn it over to Dylan Klapmeyer, uh, representing uh, Governor Gianforte. Dylan. Thank you, Chair Lozar. Um, and thanks to Chancellor Kegel, I appreciate you and your team hosting us here at Northern. It's, it's always a beautiful campus to come to, and that event last night was, was awesome. The food, the presentations, um, so thanks to Senator Temple for, for that as well. Um, I believe this is Regent Sexton's last meeting, or close to one of her last meetings. Um, just on behalf of the governor, I want to thank you for, for serving in that position as a student regent for two years. We've really appreciated the voice that you've brought for students um, to this board. And I know that we just recently got a packet of nominations from the Montana Associated Students for the next representative. So we'll look forward to looking through those resumes and, and picking another student and picking your brain probably as well for, for what we should be looking for in a student regent. Um, just wanna comment on a, on a couple of the presentations this morning. Um, I thought Directors Thigpen and, and Miller did a great job talking about um, priorities for the system, um, as well as some of the mental health approaches. Um, specifically with cybersecurity, I appreciate um, Dean Gallagher and everything going on at the Missoula College. I know he's been in touch with the superintendent's office and Board of Public Education about opportunities to get that into um, teacher training programs and trying to get cybersecurity careers more into the, the secondary sphere as well. Um, definitely an area of interest to the governor and I think that that's a, a huge opportunity for the Missoula College. Um, and then uh, the superintendent alluded to this a little bit, but yeah, with the governor's emergency education relief funding, he did dedicate a portion of that to DPHHS for K-12 student mental health, specifically for optional universal, um, uh, universal screening tools that might be available. So they're out in the RFI process right now. And um, it is just for K-12, but if that's successful um, and enough districts take advantage of it, there might be some applications there um, on the post-secondary campuses as well for, for screening tools. Um, so I'll be sure to keep you in the loop with that, and I'm happy to connect any of Ochi's staff with what's going on at DPHHS. Um, just jumping into some of the uh, governor's campus visits, um, one of his favorite parts of getting out across the state um, in, in between these meetings is getting to the K-12 campuses and, and our college campuses as well. Um, he's had the opportunity to visit the Helena College's Painter Apprenticeship Program, um, and he's been at several events at, at MSU and, and U of M. Um, he was at MSU for the state FFA convention, uh, the State Workforce Innovation Board meeting, um, and then the big announcement with Hyundai for their new research development. Um, and lab center within the innovation campus. So thank you, President Cruzado, for opening those opportunities for, for private sector partnerships with MSU. And then um, he had some fantastic events at the University of Montana, um, the Mansfield Center, the fireside chat with the Mansfield Center, um, excellent meetings with foreign dignitaries through the World Trade Center recently. Um, and then uh, thanks to UM for hosting DPHHS's Child Abuse and Neglect Prevention Conference for um, Child Abuse and Neglect Prevention Month. Um, and then the governor was excited to host the MSU women's rodeo team at the Capitol and recognize their national championship. And hopefully we'll see good things coming from Northern's team as well soon. <laughs> um, just jumping ahead to some, some work-based learning partnerships. You know, as I always say, it's a, it's a priority for the governor to really align the state's workforce development initiatives. We have some obvious state entities such as OCHI and OPI and the Department of Labor that are really involved in workforce development, but there's other key partners too within most state agencies. Um, 
you know, commerce, Indian affairs, corrections, DPHHS. There's a lot of opportunities to align our workforce initiatives um, from K-12 through post-secondary into workforce, and then some of the, the auxiliary institutions that the state's involved with as well. So we, um, and the governor's office are just trying to get those points of contact in each agency really um, communicating, working together, and ensuring that there's, there's not duplication, but there is collaboration in our workforce development efforts. There's a lot of exciting things happening with data modernization um, through the state SITSD. I know that, that OCHI and OPI are going through their same um, data modernization efforts, and I appreciate you working with Kevin Gilbertson, the state CIO in that, that project. Um, just an update on the SWIB, the State Workforce Innovation Board. They had their, their first meeting last month. The governor was happy to kick that board meeting off. Um, OCHI is represented on that, as is DLI, Commerce, OPI, legislators, um, local government, and then um, private sector representatives. Um, they took some, some actions that I think will help the SWIB board become more of a leading entity in the state for workforce development and focus more on driving policy goals as opposed to just um, uh, federal compliance. And that is that they increase their terms from, from two years to three years so that half the board isn't turning over every other year. Um, and they're gonna be meeting quarterly now instead of just, um, just twice a year. So we're excited about the opportunities uh, for collaboration there with the SWIB board. It really is one of the few state entities that brings together all of these, these players in workforce development into one uh, one meeting and one board. Um, Want to just give you a quick update. The Board of Public Education met last week and took action on Superintendent Arnson's recommendations for uh, teacher licensure. Um, so um, what they did was they, they finalized a package of reforms to administrative rules for educator licensure, and it's really going to make Montana more regionally competitive for attracting teachers and reducing red tape. Um, they also received a presentation um, from OPI on educator prep program administrative rules, and I think that that's going to complement the work that they've done um, on licensure. I know that um, Dr. McLean, uh, as well as your, your deans of colleges of education, have been very involved with that, but I would just encourage um, the regents as, as well to keep an eye on, on all that's happening with the Board of Public Education rulemaking right now, because it really does... Um, you know, impact the work that, that we all do to try and produce um, more educators in the state. Um, just jumping ahead, I, this is an exciting meeting. I'm glad that our legislative partners are here. I'm looking forward to tomorrow, the joint meeting. Um, I always think it's good whenever we can really um, bring all the partners that are involved with, with education together and that that is the legislature, that's the superintendent, the governor's office. I think the Board of Public Ed was even represented here earlier. Um, so I think it's great when we can get together and talk about you know, joint policy goals and, and areas that we can work together on. Um, I know that the legislature is, is working to put together an education summit next month that will really bring all of the players together. So that, that's exciting um, whenever we can get K-12 post-secondary and, uh, and the legislature um, working together on common policy goals for education. Uh, the commissioner talked about Second Chance Pell. I just wanted to shout that out as well. I think that's a huge opportunity for our state, and I really appreciate uh, Dawson, the Great Falls College, Helena College, and MSUB, um, as well as the commissioner's office for working with the Department of Corrections on that. Um, I'm really excited to see the programming that comes out of it, and um, it's going to be a huge opportunity for uh, reducing recidivism and providing people a, a good off-ramp as they come out of out of corrections. So thanks to those campuses for working with corrections on that. Um, wanted to provide a brief update on Accelerate Montana. That's the public-private partnership focused on rapid retraining um, that started at the Missoula College. Uh, the Department of Labor um, issued six and a half million dollars in ARPA funding um, to Accelerate Montana to to focus on these rapid retraining efforts. And the, the Department of Labor is working um, with campuses to expand this, this beyond the Missoula College. They've already got a partnership now with Gallatin College. Um, and they're looking to hire a program director, outreach coordinators, including an indigenous outreach coordinator. 
um, and then looking at unique pilots for rapid retraining on, on each campus. And so right now they're working with all of the campuses to see what, what unique opportunities does each campus have that we can capitalize on for those short-term rapid retrainings. So that's pretty exciting. Um, the last thing I wanna touch on um, is uh, Director Lemon did a, an excellent job on this central application portal presentation. I feel like I've seen that presentation a lot lately and that's a good thing. Um, he presented to the Board of Public Ed last week. He's been going out to the uh, Association of Superintendent Regions, uh, the, the uh, School Counselors Association, and um, I just really appreciate their grassroots efforts to get out to all the communities and make sure that uh, students and families and counselors and school administrators and teachers know how to access that central portal and that they can get to, you know, access opportunities at any campus um, in the state through that um, one-stop shop. Um, and the last thing I would just say is, uh, you know, I, I appreciate um, Deputy Commissioner Tessman uh, and the SHIO group um, working together on higher education attainment. Really, all of the updates that, that I've given and the, the governor talks about with uh, regards to education and workforce development um, are, are part of these discussions that we're having with higher education attainment. Um, how do you make the college experience relevant to that, that 40%? And I just appreciate everything, and the governor appreciates everything that the university system is doing to to make post-secondary education accessible and relevant to, to all students in the state. So, happy to take any questions. Thanks, Chair Lozar. Excellent, thank you, Dale. And is there any questions or comments from uh, members of the board? Uh, uh, before we transition to Superintendent Artson, um, I certainly last night reflecting on uh, the event that, that Chancellor Kegel put on, I mean, I thought a lot of about the priorities of the governor and the conversations we've all each had with the governor in terms of connection with industry. And it was just so obvious based on listening to the, the speakers who are representing industry, the, just the power of that collaboration and the power of that connection to, to meet the, the demands that we have here in the state of Montana. So if, if the governor hasn't been up uh, to Northern in a while, certainly um, want to invite him up to this campus and to be able to see sort of the, the fruit of all that labor and, and uh, his priorities in practice. So if you could extend that to the governor, that would be wonderful. Of course. Excellent. Uh, with that, we'll transition to uh, remarks from Superintendent Artson. Uh, thank you, Chair Lozar, uh, Commissioner and Regents and all that are in attending. Pretty much all that I really wanted to speak about has already been done. So all the homework, I guess, is in. But I do want to just, and I know time is very precious. I'm very grateful for being able to be part of this esteemed meeting, as well as with uh, the legislators that are here. Chancellor, thank you. You know, it's always welcoming to come here. And uh, I appreciate there's no wind today. Yeah, you may have had something to do with that <laughs> along the High Line here. Tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, but I do want to I do want to reiterate again about the mental health opportunities that we had. We can talk about the challenges, but let's talk about the resiliency of Montana, and let's talk about making sure that we have opportunities for solutions. I believe that our partnership has been strong, and let's make it even stronger. As I had said, it's about our communities. Um, thank you very much, Dylan, and the governor's office for recognizing that innovation must happen in education. We opened up a lot of the rules within uh, the Board of Public Education, and via statute, it is my responsibility to do that. We did that back in September of 20, and we're just now crossing the finish line. A lot of good work, a lot of research, a lot of energy and effort has gone into making sure that our students receive the best quality of teachers, receive the best programming throughout their entire career, and I'm looking at that as a P20. So chapter 57 was licensing for K-12. That has crossed the finish line. A great thank you to the Board of Public Education, to all uh, that participated in that. Now what's on their desk at the Board of Public Ed is chapter 58, which is the process of teacher prep programs. What is it to grow a Montana teacher within the university system? It has just come to the Board of Public Education, will go through some processes and may not cross the finish line 
until January or February of 23. So there's ample time to talk about it. There's ample time for public comment. There's really quite an understanding to make sure what does that mean for the next generation, not just now, but for that next generation. These rules normally last for about a decade, so we have a lot of work to do within that. The other rule that we opened up in 2020 was on accreditation. That's school quality. What is a school in Montana? How does it look like with input as well as the output? What I'm focusing on is output. In other words, what makes a quality school when a student has that experience, because I've heard that a lot here, about that, that school experience, not just in well-being, but also in the academic proficiency that is there. And that's a big discussion and a, and a big um, undertaking. Our office is looking at a lot of different ways. One of the things that I want to remark about with school counseling, we have had 400 students per one counselor for many decades. 33 years these ratios have been in play. And our mental health is where it is right now, not just because of a pandemic, but we have to dig ourselves up. We cannot stay where we're at. So I would love to have more comment, more understanding. My cell phone's available. Please call our great staff at the OPI. We do have a portal and we have a task force. And then we're going through law with a negotiating rulemaking committee and a facilitator. Then it'll go through the Board of Public Ed where there has been more robust public conversation about what is a K-12 system look like. We're related. Board of Regents, we're related. It's incumbent upon us to make sure that there is a seamless pathway for education and lifelong learning. So that's why I bring this to you. The other thing I want to share is in another partnership, teacher residency. And I want to give a great shout out to your staff, Commissioner, for really recognizing that we can have a residency program that mirrors medical. So let's take our student teachers, let's put them in a classroom setting that is embraced with other teachers within that building for an entire year and pay them. Pay them for that experience. Also with credit, giving them that opportunity to have that fourth year and then embed them in that community so that, that we will retain them within there. I want to give a, a great shout out to the University of Western. Thank you very much. Uh, we have two residents at Stone Child at this time. We are looking at MSUB as well. And we have a resident with Western Governors Conference at UM. I'm excited. This is something different. We are creating something that is a pathway to not only retain teachers, but to bring them in. And I think that's really extremely important. We are using and dedicating some of the COVID relief dollars that the federal government gave our agency to um, impact teachers and not only expand teachers and the quality, but to invest in teachers. And then moving forward into the legislature for sustainability. If there's one thing that we know in education, great ideas have a lifespan. Let's make sure that it's more enduring and that's the relationship with you as well as with the governor's office and our policymakers to make sure that we can embed this further along. Another great opportunity that we have, and uh, President Crisado, we're going to be invading your campus. We've got the uh, Summer Institute where we used to have about 1,300 teachers, faculty members come for an entire week and learn about systems of support for our students and our families and our communities. We have about 800 signed up right now. So we're getting there. And we've got some great keynotes that are going to be part of that. And that is going to be happening the third week of June. So we're hoping maybe you can make an appearance or somebody else might uh, be able to make an appearance. If we can get teachers on campus, then their renewal units can also be recognized through the university system to build a better teacher but also we are supporting our tribal elders as well as we're having a youth voice of students that are going to be there. If we get students on your campus, they'll come back. So that's another opportunity of what we are doing with that. 
piece of legislation that I offered, and I was very grateful to the legislature that um, put a perfect seal of approval onto this, was a state diploma. In other words, as I know you are gleaning from that 40% and wanting to understand how you can get them into the university system, I am gleaning completion. So we are working quite regularly with the Montana Youth Challenge. We've been working with corrections as well. Anyone, any student who hasn't completed their high school diploma through the 20 graduation credits, we have a great opportunity for them to be able to be mentored, to be able to have a plan of a career, to be able to have that completion recognized. And that equivalency, I'm hoping, will also be offered to you. So not only do, does it say to me that, yes, you've created high school and everything that's there in that K-12 world, but then be able to say to you at the university system or to an employer that the Montana seal of completion is there. We are one of the first states to have recognized this, and I'm so pleased. So we have multiple pathways to be able to shout out education success. We have a lot of work that we're doing, and I want to also share in a real positive that in the graduation requirements, which is under um, the accreditation model, it's 20 graduation requirements. And I know a lot of schools, we have 173 high schools across our state in public education. A lot of them go above and beyond. They put more than 20. But we are asking in the accreditation rules to put financial literacy into play in a half a unit. Now, this is going to be a requirement at this point. What I'm asking then is that local control choice occur with when whatever that level might be. It could be in social studies. It could be in math. It could be in career technical education. But I believe education means that financial literacy, not just how you manage a checkbook, but how you manage those great opportunities economically that might be there, if we can embed that in high school, then you are going to have a better pathway when it comes to retaining students in the university system because of understanding what the investment of education means. And I'm firmly committed to financial literacy throughout this process. More will come throughout this graduation uh, discussion and the accreditation. You've received a full packet from me. Um, there's a lot of things that we're working um, at the agency with. I can't do it alone. I'm but one person. I need every single one of you as well as your campus and your faculty to support our students in K-12 because they know that you are waiting for them as well as their families. So one young man mentioned to me today, and Lucas, thank you for saying that, education is multidimensional, and it is. There are many different opportunities, and if we don't open those doors to opportunities, we're going to leave our children behind. Let's make sure that our children have a very bright, healthy future. And I come back to that mental health part. Let's make sure that our families and our communities also recognize that, yes, our systems of education, and yes, we're government, we support Montana and Montana families. Thank you, Chair, for giving me this precious time. Excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Superintendent. Is there any questions or comments from the board? Uh, yeah, thanks again for uh, always being willing to collaborate with us and to uh, your focus, particularly on teacher prep, teacher recruitment, uh, teacher retention. I know that we've made some headway in that space, but we have a long ways to go in, in partnership. So thanks for your leadership on that. Um, with that, I think uh, we've got about an hour and 20 minutes or so. Uh, between now and lunch, and we're going to transition to the two-year and community college committee. Um, uh, we'll do our best to fit everything in be in the next hour and 20 minutes. Um, but if we need some additional time and we need a presentation to happen after the uh, the lunch break, I'm okay with that as well. So, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Chair Sexton. Thank you, Chair Lozar, and uh, Deputy Commissioner Tessman, if you want to kind of navigate the time since you're more familiar with how long those be. 
Um, so before we dive into the agenda, I, since this is my final meeting, I wanted to take the opportunity to, uh, to thank Brock and his team. When I was asked to be chair of this committee, I was, it was it's a great honor, and I was really excited for the opportunity, and I was also right in the middle of my final semester and all of the other things going on here. So um, I was concerned that I would have the appropriate amount of time to devote to chairing this committee as it so deserves, and uh, Brock, you and your team made it so easy. You're such an excellent and, and fabulous asset to the system, and it's been a real pleasure to work with you and your team. So thank you so much for that. Um, I will turn it over to you to start our agenda. Well, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I mean, I'm not sure I deserve that praise, but that means a lot uh, coming from you, and, and certainly the feeling's mutual. It's, I, I guess, a bit rare that we get a chance to work with student regents for a couple of years and just uh, consider us to be lucky to have had the second year uh, with your leadership and so many exciting things uh, to come for you uh, down the road. Uh, I also want to join others in thanking Chancellor Kegel for the event last night. I mean, great food, uh, uh, great conversation. Got to see Scott try to steal some farm equipment. Uh, it was terrific, uh, but it, it was also, um, it was really instructive in, in Chair Lozar, um, Earlier, you referenced the comments from our industry partners, and you know we think a lot about how to uh, talk about the value of higher education or two-year education. And no matter how hard we try, um, you know many of us are not coming from that industry perspective. And so I was kind of taking careful notes and really took to heart some of the ways in which your partners in this part of the state um, value MSU Northern, and, and I think we can look to that as we message out across other parts of the state. Uh, today's agenda, I think, is quite manageable between now and, uh, and our lunch, uh, which is a good thing. But it is, um, it's full of good information, a good action item, all connected to the, the comprehensive mission of our two-year colleges. And, and gosh, when I started in this role, we actually had a lot of the, the campus leaders come up and talk to the regents about what that comprehensive mission is, because it's not extremely well understood. But I think the agenda items today hit on a bunch of different parts of that mission. We'll uh, have kind of a feature report on uh, transfer, and of course our two-year institutions uh, play an essential role in that process. Uh, we'll hear a little bit about our CTE and workforce training programs with the Perkins 5 update uh, you'll get from uh, Director Treister. Uh, we'll talk uh, a little bit about workforce development in one of our most crucial areas of need, which is in the health professions. And I think clearly community and, and industry partnerships are part of that to your mission as well. And so we're really trying to highlight that for you all as we go through the, the committee. I'd also note, as we heard from Director Lemon and uh, Director Miller, uh, Deputy Commissioner Thigpen, it, in many ways, our leadership, our two-year leadership that's, that's in the room, uh, grapples with the, the major challenges we face in the system at, at a heightened level. I mean, if we think about um, enrollment and access, for example, if we get to that 40% Regent Dombrowski and we want to make inroads, it will be impossible for us to do that uh, without seeing success on the two-year side and having our two-year entities grow their enrollment, reach new populations of students, incarcerated individuals, adult learners, rapid training and workforce programming, they're at, at the center of that entire effort. Uh, if, if we think about uh, even challenges like mental health, certainly th those challenges permeate every single one of our campuses, every part of the state. But consider our two-year campuses. Some of them don't have the same points of contact with their student populations. Some of those campuses have students that may not have the same supports off campus that some of our four-year students do. Yet, our, our two-year campuses are still focused on meeting the mental health uh, needs of, of those individuals, no matter where they're coming from. Staff uh, retention and recruitment. All of our staff and faculty are, are doing multiple jobs and working so hard. Oftentimes on these small campuses, one staff member really truly does wear many different hats, and I think that that puts another tax on them in terms of uh, uh, finding ways to make their work manageable. So uh, the, the information you'll hear about this morning really embodies some of those primary challenges and opportunities we have as uh, a system. I'll, I'll get rolling with uh, Director Jackie Treister. She is going to uh, present an action item to you. You've seen this item before. I'm prior learning assessment, and uh, Jackie, I think, has a fairly brief update, and will stand for questions if, if needed. Thanks, Jackie. 
Thank you. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, and you have seen this, uh, this policy revision that we have in front of you today. It is related to prior learning assessment. And um, you know, a couple of the major changes that we're making that we've talked about previously is that we're, we're removing the 25% PLA cap that has existed and we're aligning ourselves with NWCCU um, accreditation policy. And while I don't think that this policy change will have um, a huge direct impact on what is happening at the campuses, it really has brought PLA back to the forefront of my work and some of the work that's happening on the campuses. It also does, um, it opens the door for some changes that some of our campuses may want to make. I know in some cases uh, here at Northern, as a great example, we have some folks that do come to the college with a journeyman license, for example, and can um, receive quite a few credits toward a bachelor's degree. Um, and, and so I think it does open some opportunities up. Um, just a little note on some progress that we've made. Um, I have been able to work with some uh, veteran services folks, and thank you to President Bodner for putting me in touch um, with some folks on your campus. It, it, there's a lot of excitement there, and I think that there's a lot of potential for us to get something rolling pretty quickly. Um, and I. I have also been chatting with some folks as far as how we can get clinical experience um, into a four credit space for some of our healthcare programs as well. So I think there's a lot of exciting potential. I think there's some potential for um, some exciting professional development opportunities for staff on our campuses, hopefully by the fall. And, um, and so this policy change just aligns with a lot of that great work that uh, our campuses are doing. Happy to stand for any questions. Thank you, Director Treister. Um, I appreciate I appreciated the conversation we had about this on our committee call, and I, I like that we're uh, giving a lot of the, the decision-making processes to the campuses to make sure that we're still ensuring quality in this process. So thank you for going into that detail. And um, are there any questions from the other regents on this topic? Okay. Well, thank you very thank much. You. I appreciate that. So, uh, Chair Sexton and members uh, of the board, uh, the next item is an information item. Um, I guess uh, to be candid, it would be helpful to get your thoughts and, and maybe a head nod or, or uh, uh, affirmation that we're headed in the right direction. But it's related to healthcare workforce development. And I don't think that this topic needs to be underscored. I, I don't need to spend time highlighting why this is an important area of need uh, with respect to um, workforce development. We did hear the superintendent, Director Miller, talk about mental health and uh, the need to uh, bolster our workforce in, in that area. That, that's just one um, sliver of our health uh, healthcare needs, but it's an important one. About a year ago or so, uh, started a few conversations uh, around a specific effort on, on healthcare workforce. And um, uh, the starting point for that conversation was that our campuses are doing tremendous work right now in this area. Uh, I, would, I would venture to say every single campus is uh, plowing new ground, making great progress uh, in this area. Uh, new investments uh, from donors, program growth, uh, uh, enhanced quality standards, better industry partnerships, you name it. So what can we do to layer on top or supplement those efforts at the system level. And so that was the starting point of this effort, is to focus on things that would really leverage the systemness uh, in Montana uh, and complement the work that's happening on our campuses. The second purpose here was to really focus on a cross-sector approach. And, and actually, the number of folks in this room who have been part of the working group, uh, from uh, 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 industry partners, association heads, uh, faculty, administrative leads, uh, 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 legislators, the governor's office, it's been a cross-sector uh, approach that extends beyond the Montana University system. I guess the, the third item is to focus on things that are actionable in the near and medium term. What can we do to make a difference uh, in the next 12 months, not the next 12 years? And you have uh, four opportunities that we identified over the course of the last six months or so. Uh, all of these uh, are things that we can make progress on. I'll note the first three are probably more actionable in the short term. And uh, you can read along uh, with me, but I'll give you just the, the three sentence summary of, of each one. Uh, the first one is to look at our curriculum. and. Uh, gosh, quite recently, Regent Sexton, Regent Southworth, and I were uh, visiting City College in Billings, had a great tour of um, 
uh, some of their facilities and really heard a lot from program directors about the way in which students often move from one area of health profession study to another. So they may start on the pre-med track or the nursing track and make a switch maybe between those two or to an allied health profession, uh, become a rad tech, for example. And the way that our curriculum, uh, our curricula are set up oftentimes requires students to cover some new ground once they make that switch. In other, in other words, the pivot comes along with some cost in terms of time to degree, courses needed. And Almost always that's required. It's because of the specialized skills needed to pursue that particular uh, direction uh, in, in the health field. But there are a lot of foundational courses, general education, lower division courses, that those subfields share in common. And what we can do through this trunk analysis is make sure that we're aligning our curriculum across the system, across subfields, so that if a student does change directions or have a new affinity, they can pivot without losing much time or really any at all. And we think that that's a great completion strategy. We think it's a great workforce development strategy. And it's something that we're well positioned to do here at the system office. The second item you see there um, is to expand a model that's already working. Now, my most popular example is actually from President Slinger uh, and his approach to developing a meat processing uh, program at Miles Community College where the kind of didactic uh, book learning, as, as Chancellor Kegel put it, is delivered through Miles Community College, but the hands-on learning takes place in communities around the state. So you can have students stay in place with their families, with their jobs, in their community, take the course through MCC, and then do the hands-on learning through a facility that's close by. Um, there are a ton of other examples already in place there as well, perhaps more related to this topic. Uh, Great Falls College in the last couple of years uh, uh, did a wonderful job in expanding the reach of their respiratory therapy program by including uh, uh, MSU Billings and, uh, and MSU Bozeman, allowing students to take a lot of that didactic uh, coursework through Great Falls College, but to do the on-site work in their home communities. Let's expand that. Uh, this is good, of course, in terms of reaching new students and building the workforce. I'll tell you practically from your perspective, Regents, it's also great in terms of the sustainability of the programs. Lots of these programs are terrific. They develop good outcomes, but there may not be enough student demand right in that community to sustain them uh, with the excellent faculty and other program costs. So let's bring new students in, keep those good programs alive. The third one, and I'll, I'll keep moving fairly quickly here, is to expand uh, preceptor training and development. So another way to think about this is to address clinical capacity. Uh, we hear over and over again that if there is one bottleneck that prevents us from building out our healthcare workforce, it's clinical capacity, the hands-on learning that's required uh, as part of many of these fields, almost all of, of these fields of study. And so what can we do uh, to build out the capacity uh, on, on the facility side, the provider side. And we have a tremendous set of uh, preceptors, of, of mentors in the facilities already in place. But perhaps we can attract new preceptors, uh, find ways to incentivize them or their facilities, find ways to give them training through programs like the inter interprofessional education program that's shared between MSU and the University of Montana. And I think most interestingly, find ways to work with faculty so that we can start during the educational process, during the graduate medical education, undergraduate uh, healthcare education process, give them an appreciation of how being a health teacher as a practitioner is an important part of your career arc. And that's a way for us to build out our clinical capacity as well. AHEC uh, at MSU is doing really good work in this area and I think they'll be a good partner for us as, as we seek to uh, assist them in building out uh, new, new preceptor training. The last item is really around understanding our clinical placement uh, even better than we do now. We have kind of uh, bits and pieces of data. Different organizations collect different pieces of data with respect to which entities are placing which students in which facilities uh, uh, across the state for their clinical uh, training. I don't think that the MUS or OCHI is well positioned to uh, understand this picture in its entirety overnight, but as clinical capacity 
uh, experiences more and more pressure. I mean, with, with two new medical schools coming to the state, uh, for example, it'll be really important for us to have a good grasp on the landscape that exists now so that we can maximize the efficiency, even with respect to the number of out-of-state students that are being placed in Montana and kind of occupying one of those clinical spots. I'll wrap up. I went on longer than I wanted, but this is a really important area of action for us, and I'd be happy to answer any questions or receive any comments, uh, Chair Sexton, from you, the committee, or the board. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner Tessman. Um, I know for my part, I would want to hear more about this. I want to encourage you to to pursue it, but uh, since this is my final meeting, I think it's more important that we hear from the rest of the regions on what they think. First, a comment. I would just like to um, say thank you, uh, Brock, and your team. Uh, you took the charge uh, to take a look at this, and I really appreciate that from my healthcare lens. Um, I think it does several things. One is it shows the flexibility and the willingness to look differently at this uh, under Ochi's leadership. It also allows us to think about workforce uh, maybe by September instead of in three or four or five years, which mm -hmm. you know is really not, not going to be helpful. I mean, that's that economic driver. And, and what you did do is reach out to what I think, my, I don't know if you call it public-private, but there were so many people who sat around the table with a shared interest. And I, and I think you've, I mean, I've sat on a bunch of other committees that have referenced this work with a degree of excitement and where can we fit in and plug in and be in, in support. Namely, my, my organization, but I would say AHEC, for example, it, you know, is, a per, again, another perfect example. So, um, really, you just have my thanks and uh, r my support to move this along. Thank you, Regent Dombrowski, and thank you for your service on the committee as well. Are there any other regents that want to share some feedback? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Sexton, uh, and thank you, Regent Dombrowski, for the, the um, jolt as well. I think that that was uh, really well-timed, and I feel good about where we're at. Uh, our next item, uh, I'll invite again uh, Director Jackie Treister, our Director of Dual Enrollment in Career and Technical Education, to talk about our Perkins 5 grant. And she'll do this because I just always, I push her to, to emphasize how important this grant is to the state of Montana. Uh, this is the grant that systematically and consistently supports career and technical education across the system. And, and it, it dwarfs other structured, consistent forms of external funding. Uh, our K through 12 partners get some dollars uh, from the state. We will share some really exciting news at a future meeting about a seven-figure uh, uh, grant coming from inside the state to support uh, uh, CTE awareness and marketing. But Perkins 5 is where it's at. I mean, it's $65 million each decade to support career and technical education across the state of Montana. So Jackie's going to talk a little bit about where we're at with that and some initiatives within the grant program. Thanks, Jackie. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, so really excited to give you a Perkins performance update um, this morning and just a little refresher for you of what Perkins is. It is a federal to state formula grant, so we don't have to apply for it. Uh, every year, but we do have to report our performance um, on our CTE students every year to the U.S. Department of Education. Um, and so this presentation is based on the most recent performance uh, report that we, we gave to the Department of Ed, and um, I, I think gives a really nice picture of some of the exciting things that our campuses are doing and our schools are doing, and um, some of the populations that we're able to serve with this grant. Um, and so we did, as Brock indicated, we got a little bit of a bump this uh, week. We just got notice of it last month for this upcoming grant cycle. So from $6.3 million to $6.5 million. So that's always a really exciting trend to see that we are trending up a little bit with this grant. And um, all of our two-year campuses and community colleges receive Perkins, um, including three of our tribal colleges also receive Perkins, and 133 of our school districts receive Perkins to serve their high school uh, CTE students as well. So this really does, it has a major impact on career and technical education in Montana. And um, and just really excited to showcase for you some of the exciting work that we're able to accomplish. So um, traditionally, uh, the Perkins Grant has provided CTE program support. So this is typically, we see equipment, curriculum development, 
professional development, K-12 partnerships, and career exploration. So this is where we see a lot of our CTE dual enrollment work. Um, we have curriculum development all the way from how to embed industry-recognized credentials in existing programs um, to, you know, pivoting the way that some of our programs are delivered. So we see curriculum development to try to get nursing uh, curriculum online, for example. That's something that Perkins has uh, supported. Um, career exploration, that's a really exciting one. We have some fantastic events all around the state. I really encourage you to look into anything that you could attend. Um, Techno Expo here at Northern has been a hugely popular event. It's so exciting if you ever have the chance to attend. I think 300 students have attended the last couple of years um, for each uh, event. And so um, the students can take 10 different tracks of CTE. They can get their hands on equipment. They can interact with faculty. Industry is a huge partner. Um, and it's just something super exciting that our students can engage in and Perkins supports those events as well. Um, another area that we really focus on with Perkins is access to quality CTE for everybody in Montana. So we have a list of special populations that we uh, focus on with the Perkins grant. This includes gender non-traditional students. And so just to let you all know what that means, um, some of our programs, the occupations that they result in, um, they can be represented by less than 25% uh, of a certain gender. So a lot of times we see this with females in STEM, um, females in auto tech, uh, males in nursing, males in education. And so we try to focus on recruiting some of those students. And we've seen some really exciting um, movement there. We have uh, at FECC, we have a female uh, welding instructor, and there has been some really exciting things happening there as far as getting female uh, students engaged in those types of programs. Um, adult education we also serve, and um, our American Indian students, of course, uh, we, we serve with our CTE dollars as well. So um, the next few slides are just uh, some of the summary uh, information that I have from the data that we collect. And the, the nice thing about collecting the data for the Perkins grant is that we have some, some really nice opportunities to take a look at who exactly we're serving with career and technical education, um, where we might have some challenges, where we can do better and, and maybe funnel some uh, funding in, in a direction to, to address some of the challenges, and then some areas that we're doing really well. So um, a couple, I'll just point out a, a few exciting things for you that I find exciting. Um, and as always, I have all of this data. I'm happy to dive into anything if you find anything particularly interesting. But one thing I thought that was really um, uh, just interesting to note is that our concentrators, and these are students that are taking at least 12 credits in a CTE program of study, or if a program is less than 12 credits, then they have graduated from that program. So these are our concentrators in CTE. Almost a quarter of our CTE concentrators are American Indian students. And so this is something that we can break down and disaggregate further. We can look at what specific programs those students are engaging in. We want to make sure that all of our students are engaging in in those high skill, high wage, high demand areas. And so we can dig in a little bit deeper um, through each of these uh, different race categories that we report on. Some of our special populations are listed here, and you can see what the participants and concentrators um, look like. And another area that I think is really interesting, um, more than half of our concentrators in CTE um, in the Montana University system, again, this does include our three tribal colleges that participate, are in one or more of these special population categories. So I think that we're doing a really good job engaging um, with these students, and I think particularly with our students from economically disadvantaged uh, backgrounds. These include students that are Perkins, or I'm sorry, Pell receiving, um, or if they are Bureau of Indian Affairs funds receiving students. And so, um, that does depend on kids that, uh, or students that complete the FAFSA. That's the only way that we're able to get that information. So I think that number could be higher, but I, I, I think it's still pretty good. Oh, I lost my screen. Oh, thank you. Um, another, th this is a, a little hard to see all the different colors, but this is the percentage of CTE concentrators by career cluster. Um, and so our largest career cluster um, is uh, health sciences. It's a, a little over a third, um, but we're also seeing some, some pretty significant interest in manufacturing and some, some other areas as well. It just gives us a nice picture of what exactly our students are concentrating in. Um, and then this is that breakdown of uh, male and female students. This is where we get a lot of our information on where um, certain genders are, are, 
are participating more um, in certain programs than others. Um, you can see manufacturing, um, transportation, STEM, IT are largely male. And then we're looking, we see um, business management, education, finance, um, health sciences are pretty heavily female. So these are some areas where we'd like to get a little bit closer to everything being fairly even. It does give us a nice snapshot of what's happening at a system level. Um, just so you all know, we, we break this down by each campus and each campus receives a report card just with their student population in addition to what the state looks like as a whole. And um, and so then they when they fill out their applications each grant cycle, um, they are asked certain questions on how they're gonna address any of these uh, disparities or the, these gaps that they might see in their data, and we ask them to funnel some of their funding and resources in areas where they can um, make some progress where we might be seeing some gaps. But um, Regent Rogers asked a great question on the call, you know, how did we perform overall? And uh, Montana met every one of our performance indicators on the post-secondary side, so um, we are performing really well, and hopefully we'll be able to continue doing so. So with that, happy to stand for any questions. And um, if there are any questions that uh, related to the data that we didn't touch on, happy to follow up with those because we do have a lot of great data. Thank you, Director Treister. Uh, do any of the regions have any questions about the presentation? Thank you, Chair Sexton. Great presentation again, even better the second time. <laughs> um, <clears throat> just out of curiosity, can you remind us where else CTE, CTE happens in the state of Montana outside of the Perkins Grant and the the exciting thing that we're not hearing about yet. <laughs> go for it. Uh, so Chair Sexton, Regent Rogers, and Jackie, I mean, you say go for it, you jump in where I get it wrong. Uh, I mean, so CTE happens on all our campuses, and a lot of, a lot of it is, is sort of internally funded based on how campuses support specific faculty, um, you know, uh, training programs and whatnot. I think the role that Perkins plays is uh, a, a role where there's consistent external funding, so new funding funding to the state that can be used uh, to drive forward new ideas, purchase new equipment, try new things that are really hard in a resource scarce environment. If you're a campus that's just really struggling in order to support faculty lines and make sure a program works, Perkins allows you to innovate and you know address. Um, you know, some of the gender discrepancies really make progress that's necessary. So it, it, I don't want to call it a layer on top because it's much more than that, but it, it is kind of an innovation engine for CTE. Thank you. Any other questions from the regions? Um, so funding is always near and dear to my heart. And uh, I just think this is, we couldn't be in a better campus to discuss this topic. And so given the efforts both from within our board, with the governor's office, and from everyone we heard last night that we want to promote and encourage students to participate in these areas. Um, I think it would really behoove the board to consider some different areas where I think we might, there might just not be an awareness. Um, one of those is, you know, business and nursing faculty receive bonus compensation because of the opportunity cost that those faculty have outside of academia. And we may want to consider implementing something like that for the trades. I mean, plumbers, electricians make fabulous livings. I mean, our speakers last night were informing us of the incredible salaries that are available for graduates of certain programs. So I think that would be something worthwhile looking into. Um, and uh, because I can't resist an opportunity to harass uh, Tyler about performance-based funding, um, retention's a real problem. Uh, if you look at you know, Region Southworth and I went to City College and we were told a lot of these students are so fabulous that employers are anxious to get them out into their workforce and out of their programs as quickly as possible, oftentimes before these students have graduated. And so we may want to look at our metrics and are we supporting and you know supporting our campuses in situations where they're doing too good of a job. Because um, I think this impacts their ability to improve those metrics and, and to support these programs in the long term. And um, I'd also like to look at possibly what, what does a rehabilitation process look like for campuses? And, and I did a little bit of research back, thankfully, performance-based on funding started in 2015, so I didn't have to dig back too far. Um, but a, a lot of the campuses that have struggled to maintain their funding are, are two-year campuses. And so is there a connection there? And, and in order to really fully support these areas that we are, are verbally supporting, um, 
I'd like to, to dig into what does that look like it, to make sure a campus can be as successful and uh, as possible and also really show that we're supporting these trades. So I know that's a lot, <laughs> Jackie, so if you <laughs> want to uh, turn that over to anyone else to answer, that would be just fine. <laughs> Chair Sexton, Jackie, thanks again for that. Uh, no, I um, I mean, some of those questions, I, I guess, in, in my opinion, and, and first and foremost, defer to the commissioner, but they seem like they're board questions to, to answer. Uh, I, I, I do think some of the observations you had um, around the visit to, to MSUB and certainly in your experience at MSUB are, are, are spot on. Um, it is hard to retain uh, talented instructors, tenure track or not, when um, the material incentive may be to, to move elsewhere. Uh, I think on the note of retention, uh, it's important for us all to remember that retention rates and graduation rates are actually higher among CTE concentrators than they are among the general student population. And so it's actually another reason for us to support uh, success in, in this area. So I, I don't mean to do a full punt on some of that. I think that those are, are things I've heard as well, um, and certainly some good ideas uh, that, that I'm hearing from you. Um, probably conversations the board will continue to have maybe at this meeting, but 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 well beyond as well. Thanks. Absolutely, and yes, more just kind of food for thought for the future, so. Um, fantastic, with that, we can move on to the next presentation if I think we have time. Chair Sexton, I think we're in really good shape in terms of time, uh, and we do have a, a kind of feature presentation here uh, to wrap up the two-year committee. We'll have uh, Joe Teal, our Director of uh, Academic Policy and Research, and then uh, Ange DeWolf-King, who's uh, a, a Operations Coordinator uh, for our team, talk a bit about transfer in the Montana University system. And I mean, this is a tough one because we all hear the anecdotes, uh, and I'll call them kind of horror stories uh, of individuals who've been trapped in a, a seemingly bizarre transfer process, and it's hard to understand how something like that can happen. Uh, we do sort of uh, uh, sort of um, uh, diagnostic tests in those cases, and sometimes you know there are challenges that emerge, and we do our best to fix them. Oftentimes, they're pretty easily explainable. Someone has uh, switched majors from history to chemical engineering, and lo and behold, some of their credits don't count towards that chemical engineering uh, degree. The bottom line, and I think this is what uh, Joe and Ange will uh, communicate, is that. The system, uh, I mean, our campuses are actually uh, kind of nationally recognized as leaders uh, in the transfer project. And some of that is rooted in the, the heroic effort uh, around common course numbering. Uh, but a lot of it is also based on the development kind of currently underway of, of transfer pathways and our popular transfer majors. I think you'll hear a little bit about the role that advisors and people play in managing an effective transfer process. Um, the one takeaway before I hand it to you, Joe, the scale and scope of transfer. I, we're thinking between one in five and one in six students in the system will have transferred at some point in time. So this is not a peripheral issue. This is actually essential to student access, to student success, workforce development. It's, it's a sometimes hidden but central part to everything we do. Really happy, Joe and Ange, to have you here. Joe, it looks like you're going to start. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Tessman. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Excited to talk about transfer. As Brock mentioned, it's an area where we have some incredibly exciting work going on, some nation-leading work going on. But that said, a lot of work to do because it does touch a lot of our students. And it is an area where it's not always easy or smooth. There are big hurdles to overcome to make transfer work. Wanted to start with, as Brock mentioned, kind of why we think this is an important area and why, as a system, we put so much focus on it. First, new students into the MUS, one in five in a given year will typically have prior college work from outside of the Montana University System. Of those students who come to the University System, one in six are going to transfer between our institutions at some point. And while we typically think of transfer as a two-year to four-year pathway and structure, that's not actually typically the case around the country and within the Montana University System. One in three transfers in Montana are between our four-year campuses. So we think about enrollment. A lot of our enrolling students have transfer concerns. If we think about success and workforce, 
a lot of our students moving through our system are going to experience transfer. And it's not just going to touch our two-year institutions, it's going to touch every campus within the university system. Recognizing that two-year to four-year is often a focus area of ours, and you should know that within the system and nationally, that's a pathway that hasn't worked for a lot of students. You know, nationally, of students who set out on that started a two-year transfer to a four-year pathway, only 14% complete a bachelor's degree within six years. And that's because for those students who typically have all of the common challenges that students face, they're faced with a whole other set of questions that transfer puts on their plate and that their institutions working together have to try and answer. And, and these are kind of the questions that we're gonna try and walk through with you today. There's sometimes the questions that we think about when we think about transfer. You know, will my credits transfer? What courses are gonna count? What courses should I take? There are also some questions that maybe we don't think about enough or as often. So can I actually get the courses that I need at my campus? Uh, who do I seek out for help f with all of this? What support is available at an institution where maybe transfer students aren't their typical entering student? And one thing I want to emphasize from the start is we have some good answers for some of these, and I think we have ideas for others that we want to work with you on. The first one, will my credits transfer? This is an area where we all should be really proud as a system of the work that we've accomplished. Uh, I'm in course numbering. Some of you may have heard way too much from me on this topic. Uh, it's a process by which faculty from all around our system visit together to compare course learning outcomes. And if those outcomes overlap enough, that course has the same title, number, and rubric so that it's counted as the same exact course across all of our institutions. Key thing for you to know, that facilitates the transfer of more than 50,000 credits every year. It makes it so that it's predictable upfront for students. It makes it so that when advisors and admissions receive those transcripts from a sending institution, they don't have to go step by step, course by course through that transcript, so it's an efficiency mechanism. And then most importantly, and the thing that we're gonna touch on a lot, is that's a building block for all sorts of other ways that our institutions can work together. And it's a particularly unique building block. We had a very helpful legislative audit in 2019 that talked about this. You know, Montana's a leader in common course numbering. We're one of four states that have comprehensive common numbering of undergraduate courses across both two and four year institutions. And recently, there's been a renewed effort that's unique in the nation to invite our private and our tribal colleges on to common course numbering. And we're really pleased through a lot of work with our tribal college partners with great help from Angela McLean and Ange King that we have four tribal college partners that are either on or in the process of joining common course numbering. And I particularly wanna uh, recognize President Chandler, his registrar, Krim Barrows from Ani Nakoda College who took the plunge last year and been working with us on this process through the last six months. So that is how will my credits transfer? We provide a lot of predictability for students on how their credits are going to transfer throughout the university system. The next question is, how are those credits gonna count? Um, am I taking the right classes for my pathway? One aspect of that is general education courses. A lot of transfer students are trying to finish off this core of general education, which does differ somewhat between our institutions. And so we have a couple of tools that we've been working to improve over the past several years. The first is, throughout the university system and between our tribal colleges, if a student completes a block of general education, every other campus will recognize that as a block of general education coursework. You don't have to complete that new campus's general education core. We've been working a lot on making sure that that's recognized in a student's transcript so that when a student transfers to a four-year university, that admissions office is gonna pick it up and give the student that credit. We're also recognizing working with partners in our region that there's a lot of movement of students between our states. And so we're really pleased this year that we have the first three Montana institutions to join the Wichi Interstate Passport. This is a cross-state effort to make it so that institutions can transfer as a block general education coursework between institutions all around the country. Uh, Miles Community College has joined Interstate Passport. 
MSU Billings is in the process this summer. And with help from the commissioner's office and from Wichie, Salish Kootenai College received a grant to join and became the first tribal college in the country to join on to interstate passport. The next question is, what courses are gonna help in my major? Uh, we have something on the order of three or 400 bachelor's degree options in the Montana University system that change their curriculum occasionally, that have similar degrees at different institutions. And so for a student, for their advisor, that's a dizzyingly complex uh, set of items to sort through. And what we've been doing is in the most popular transfer disciplines, we pulled together faculty from all around the state to develop a, a clear listing of the lower division curriculum that students need to take to be on track, recognizing some areas where campuses are different on that curriculum. The goal here is that over time we'll be able to build up in most disciplines, say elementary education where we have five different campuses that offer the bachelor's degree program, a clear advising sheet that advisors can work with the students to use to make certain that they're taking courses that are going to be count, going to count and be productive in the major that that student wants to pursue. And this process of getting together faculty, identifying and mapping our curriculum, first, that's not a process that a lot of states have undertaken. It's a level of coordination and collaboration on curriculum that is pretty unique across the country. And it's helping us understand some of the blocks and barriers that weren't as visible before. And one of those is that in a lot of these pathways, our two-year campuses don't offer some of the key courses that students might need in person. And in fact, for many of these campuses, because the student numbers aren't there or because the faculty aren't there in their community, they might not be able to source and stand up those key courses in popular pathways. And that's led to some new initiatives and ideas. One of those is around course sharing. You know, if we just look at the online coursework that's offered across our institutions, if we were able to share that more commonly between institutions, in many cases at the lower division, it would double or triple the course offerings, the unique course offerings that our students would be able to get access to. And because of that, we've, uh, learning from some great work with the Seamless One MSU initiative, been working on a pilot to think about how can we take advantage of those course offerings across institutions when a student gets out of sequence with what's offered on that campus, when a course that they need is not offered on their home campus, how do we make it easier for them to register for a course at another institution, have a business model behind that, have all of the financial aid and billing structures that need to exist happen more fluidly and more seamlessly? And, and that's been this pilot of a course sharing platform that now six campuses across our institutions are using, working through a lot of the kinks and complexities, and there are a good number of doing that work, with the intention that we can scale that around the system. And you've heard some discussion of, I think, the long-term vision of what that might be able to accomplish for our system. You know, Jackie Treister and her team last year ran a workforce training and remote delivery initiative, provided some state ARPA funding to stand up collaborations between campuses. Uh, meat processing is, a, is an example. The uh, accelerated apprenticeship program that you heard about last night at MSU Northern is an example. This is another. In January 2020, uh, just prior, Great Falls College, because of a lack of student enrollment, had put a respiratory therapy program into moratorium. And that meant that we had one in-person training opportunity for a really key allied health specialized field in the state, a field where a lot of the students that go into the program are pretty placebound. They tend to go to their local college and stay in their local community. And through this support, Great Falls College was able to come up with a slightly new and more collaborative and more distributive model where they're leveraging some of the resources at City College and Billings, at Gallatin College and Bozeman to take their unique faculty expertise and accreditation in Great Falls and offer in-person and hybrid training opportunities in these three communities so that it's more sustainable and more available statewide. And uh, I think that this is 
one of the big opportunities that we have on the horizon. Leveraging some of the unique collaboration we have on curriculum through common course numbering, through these pathways efforts. Leveraging some of the work that we have on the behind the scenes mechanics and business model and registration models. Leveraging some of these test cases that we've been able to fund in terms of different models of doing this distributed programming. Uh, to make it so that we can leverage the unique faculty expertise that our institutions have to give students access to the courses they need when they need them and the programs, particularly workforce programs, uh, that they want in the communities that they live. And before I turn it over, I just want to connect two other topics that we've been talking about to this effort. And the first is our learning management system initiative. Uh, if we are going to make this flexibility happen, happen, having the technological tools be smooth between institutions so that there aren't these barriers for both students and faculty in carrying off these type of collaborations. The second is something that you'll hear from uh, De Deputy Commissioner Trevor in the business uh, committee meeting, and that's about online fees. Uh, making it so that our fee and payment structure between institutions doesn't create unnecessary financial hurdles or unexpected, in particular, financial hurdles for students when they're seeking out this coursework in a more collaborative fashion. With that, I'll turn it over to Ange to talk a little bit more about some of the culture, people, communications that also need to be stood up to make this all function. Thanks, Joe. Sorry, everyone, let me just get set up really quickly here. It's weird to be on this side, <laughs> but here we go. So really quick, as Joe mentioned, before we go into our final questions from our student, I think it's really important just to sort of revisit this foundation that Joe has been working um, uh, tirelessly on and to just really reflect on how we are aligning nationally. And the reason for this is twofold. One, because as we keep saying, those CCN pieces, pathway pieces, really are, if you imagine a pyramid, the foundational pieces of how we are going to continue to move forward on this transfer project. The other part is, transfer is really complex, and I think without sometimes remembering where we've come, it can feel really overwhelming really quickly. So I know we've been talking a lot about CCN, so I'll sort of skip that top one. But the second one I think is really important. It's incredible that we are one of four states with a common numbering system, but it's even more incredible that we might be the only one that actively works to align other institutions in our state that are outside of our system. We know that not all Montana students are gonna start at the MUS, not all Montana students are gonna finish at the MUS, and the more that we can collaborate across the state with other post-secondary institutions, the more successful our students are going to be. The last two on here, free application and transmittal processes, as well as mandatory advising, might feel a little misplaced in regards to after we've talked about CCN's sort of incredible nature. But what I want to highlight here is these two bars are still incredibly unique to Montana. The concept of a free application or free transcript sending between a campus, the concept of having a dedicated individual that can speak to a student each semester about their pathway is still very unique to Montana and is not something that we see in the transfer landscape across the US. And if you think about those dots on the early slide that Joe showed, the more that we, the more barriers, frankly, that we can remove, the hope is that we will continue to, to move those dots in a positive way. So sort of continuing on our, on our final questions here, we have a lot of great information, but where do I find it? Where can I find out about this? Research shows that transfer students really need a single point of entry for clear and consistent messaging. We owe this for our students so that they have some agency in their educational pathway. We also owe it to our advisors. Having information centralized pro provides an immeasurable amount of support for them. So to be fair, the MUS website right now has some great transfer information on it. It may not be the most beautiful website on the internet, but there is some good things there. 
However, it's our job in the next coming months to really migrate that information in an intentional way over to the portal. This does a couple of things. One, it really, again, provides that centralized place. It shows our commitment to those students that they have this special, welcoming, and open place on our portal. It places all the information there, things like CCN, pathway information, degree plans. It also can start to house transfer-specific information. These students have different requirements. They have different onboarding needs. They have different timelines. So presenting that all in a centralized place. Also, with having it on a much uh, more user-friendly, maybe prettier site, also allows students to access some of the portal resources. So if they have questions about mental health resources on campus, they're already on the portal. If they have questions about what the degree outcomes are, and the, the kind of job prospects for the degree they're thinking about going into, they can find it there as well. So if we have a foundation and we have some communication tools, if students are, are anything like myself, I still need somebody to talk to about it. And that's where we kind of come into this advisor sphere. We know that the relationship between students and advisors is a critical one. What I put on the screen is sort of what nationally people think advisors do. I won't read it to you, but essentially they talk about different things, they provide some information, they provide some career support, institutional knowledge. What we also know is that advisors, as Joe mentioned, are navigating lots of different degree paths for students. We also know that not all of our students know they want to transfer at the exact start of their semester. We know that some of our students want to do a vertical transfer, some want to do a horizontal transfer, some want to do a reverse transfer. You can imagine really quickly the amount of knowledge that is required of our advisors while also taking on caseloads of hundreds of students. We also know that this is by, for most students, the single greatest student support service that we can offer them. So, my question and part of this transfer project then is how can we better support this critical work that our advisors are doing? What tools besides foundations and putting information in a centralized way can we enable them with to make what feels like almost an unreasonable expectation of a position more reasonable? We know that our advisors love working with our students. We know our students rely on them. What are some of the tools and best practices across the nation to help facilitate that pathway forward um, in a, and continue in a positive direction. And last, this is kind of more of a reflective question rather than a, a transactional one. But if you look at transfer research, there's really three groups of questions that need to be answered. Our questions are no different. Students need to understand how their credit is applicable to a future degree. They want to know that the classes that they took will prepare them for the future classes that they're preparing to take. And they need to feel a connection from their current campus to their future campus. And it's our hope through this transfer project, kind of the next flow of this work, is that by working on those three areas, when a student gets to the point where they're asking themselves, am I ready to transfer? They can with confidence say yes, knowing that they have a commitment from a home campus to a future campus. So, Here's kind of a, a colorful highlighter workflow of our next steps. Expanding foundational transfer processes. We are so fortunate that CCN is in its current state. However, we would be remiss not to mention the work that goes into maintaining CCN on a daily basis. Each campus throughout the system has a CCN liaison. That liaison then works with multiple faculty members on their campus every day to maintain that system to the degree of, I'm not kidding you, probably 20 items a day come through on CCN. We want to continue to develop transfer pathways, specifically in areas where we have the highest transfer enrollment. This seems like a great foundational place to start talking about how we can have those earlier conversations with students and let them know what their options are. And beginning to onboard more institutions. As Joe mentioned, and I will too, Director McLean has been instrumental in facilitating conversations with the tribal campuses. We want to continue to do that and onboard any institution in the state that wants to be part of that process. 
Continuing on our communication processes, we talked about the portal. The other place where communication comes into highlight here is doing a language audit. So often higher education really speaks to the first time freshman or what we sometimes consider a traditional student. We want to make sure that the language, especially in places where transfer students are visiting, feels welcoming to them and really speaks to, the, to their needs. And last, developing best practices for transfer culture. I mentioned the, import, the extreme importance of our advisors. What are some professional development and additional tools we can provide them? What are some pre-advising or new onboarding practices we might be able to support? that allows for the communication flow from a home campus, future campus, gives students their options at a much earlier time to help alleviate some concerns and answer those questions earlier. And last assessment. It is certainly not lost on myself or Director Teal that we don't have a direct connection with transfer students on a daily basis. We can read a lot of transfer research, and we do, but we really need that partnership with our campuses and using things like survey tools with students to really understand how we can best serve them in an intentional way. We have had the transfer council in the past with some great participation from campuses and that um, would be a starting point for something that we would like to continue going forward. And with that, thank you. We will stand for questions. Well, thank you, John, and for that truly excellent presentation. Um, it's personally gratifying to be able to watch your work, given that one of the first student lunch was a virtual one, given the, the times, um, but it had to do with the transfer credit situation. So it's been really nice to see the work you guys have been putting into this. And I know it's been something you've worked on for a really long time. So thank you. Um, are there any questions from the other regions? Mozart? Thank you, Chair Sexton. Uh, yep, very good, very good presentation. Thank you for all your work in this space. One of the things that probably regents here the most about um, when we're engaging with families and parents and, and students. Um, I'm curious about, do we have data or sufficient data on the students that have transferred over the past, limbs, past 10 years or so to help predict the characteristics of students that are more than likely you know, going to transfer or might have an interest in transferring, you know, looking at demographics, looking at their geographies, looking at transfer data to and from different institutions so that we can, in real time, communicate with sort of pushes to go onto the portal or uh, take a look at uh, these additional transfer resources so that it's not just dependent on a student going to the portal on their own or having to be one student out of hundreds that are connected to an advisor that they can learn about the transfer resources. How can we communicate with them outside of those two, the, those two uh, communication patterns? Thank you, Regent Lozar. Good question. Um, what I'll say is we, we do have a lot of good data that we use to prioritize what areas we're focusing on in terms of where do we see a lot of transfer movement between campuses? What are students majoring in pre and post? Uh, to get some sense of what are the common pathways that we need to have discussions around. There are a couple of other efforts that I think are in that vein, even if they're not quite to that advanced stage yet. The first is putting a question on the uh, single application, asking if transfer is a goal that a student has, so that from the outset, no matter their major that they're assigned at their campus, we have some sense of this is a student who might need some transfer information and advising. And over time, as we develop our communications capabilities, uh, those might be students that we can intentionally push out some materials and resources to. The second, I think, is really to Angie's point. There's a lot of structures within campuses where they're setting up internal pathways to support students to connect them to their future campuses. And I think that as our transfer pathways project develops, that's going to inform how our two-year campuses particularly give advice to their Associate of Arts and Associate of Science students. You know, give them some sense of you're on this pathway and also provide some regular conversation points for the four-year campuses that offer degrees in that pathway of 
we know the students that might be coming your direction. They might be good candidates for proactive outreach from you to make sure they're getting advising ideas of what financial support is available, an early connection to their potential transfer campus so that they have that sense that it's going to be a welcoming space for them later on. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Yes, Regent Bell. Stepping back a little bit, what does, uh, directors, what does, what does success look like in, in the space of transfers? Like, what's our real goal? I mean, Chancellor Hagel doesn't want to give up any students to MSU. You know, and he doesn't want to let it go back. But if we look at it as a system, how do we, how do we really say what a successful outcome is two or three, four years down the road? Thank you, Regent Bow. I, you know, I think that there's a couple of success points that I see. One is realizing how many of our students are undecided when they first enter. It's a pretty hefty proportion at all stages, and that's captured by, you know, campuses who have undecided pathways, pathways to help students uh, discover the right path for them. And for a lot of those students, that path isn't at the campus that they started at. And so recognizing from a student success, students trying to find their purpose, their career path, that if these um, relationships have a lot of frictions, that's closing off real opportunities for those students. In terms of other success metrics, the first that I'd really cite is, again, focusing on that two-year to four-year pathway, making it so that more students who start at a local two-year institution because they're uncertain or because they're place-bound or because they're financially bound and want to pursue a bachelor's degree, we want that success rate to improve substantially. And the third is in this arena of collaborations. I think that a lot of the transfer tools that we have stood up are making it so that rather than each institution needing to stand up a workforce program that might not pencil out given the number of students and the demand in their community, that we can collaborate on those programs because of this foundation that we've built. And so I think counting the enrollments and the number of collaborative programs that we've been able to stand up, uh, mapping out the then in-person opportunities around the state that students have to access those programs pre and post, those are the success items that I'm looking towards. And if I can just tag on to that, thank you, Regent Bob, for that question, because I think that is a concern that comes up everywhere, right? A campus doesn't want to lose a student to a different campus. But in reality, the research will show that students that complete an associate's degree, especially when we're talking about two-year to four-year, are vastly more likely to complete their four-year degree. We want them. This is not certainly a process where we would encourage a student to leave a campus simply to go somewhere else. It's just simply so that we're finding the pathways to allow them to complete that educational goal that they have for themselves. And certainly meeting those marks along the way, whether that's certificate completion or associate's completion, really just helps further their personal confidence to complete that final educational goal. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, uh, Bridget Buchanan. Thank you. Um, boy, lots to unpack in here, right? Um, thinking about slide 11, I've been <clears throat> stuck on it since we looked at it, the, the potential for core sharing, if we're able to, to do some of those things. I, I think about uh, Chair Lozar's comment that what I hear most about from parents is frustration in transferability, in course availability. You just mentioned that those that complete two years have a higher likelihood of success going to four years. If we can double the offerings to that maybe a college student available at that four-year institution where they want to go. So I think what I'm summarizing from a lot of this that the, the of our priorities we reviewed earlier today, this learning management system is a tool that can help us advance that. And so as we progress this conversation, I sure would like to um, understand exactly does that make those bars even? Does that, you know, how important is that piece? And I guess I would encourage us um, to align that strategy, that priority with what I see as some really low hanging fruit from a systems perspective to provide more pathways for students. So fantastic presentation, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Sexton. Um, 
the first slide we have one in six M MUS students will transfer within the system. So I'm thinking of your comment, Chair Sexton, about uh, on an earlier topic about performance-based funding. And I'm just curious how we account, if we're gonna be really good at transfer, how do we account for those students who transfer away from their home campus to another campus? Is that home campus, you know, is their, their rating get dinged on that? Or like, how do, how do we manage that? Because I don't want this to have sort of unintended consequences, or it might be something we need to, to be thinking about as it relates to updates to performance-based funding. Can, can, I just, can I just add to that question? Because yeah. I have a follow-up question, same thing. Every campus must have a, a net transfer score you know, positive or negative, that I don't think we've seen as a board, you know, in terms of how many are coming and how many are going out, right, over time, which which I think gets to your point about how do we make those campuses, everyone feel like they they can win through yeah, the system. Yeah, absolutely. Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, in relation to first performance funding, we measure transferability two ways. One is uh, when we calculate retention rates, it's the calculation of first-time, full-time, and part-time students, as well as new transfer students. So you get to add that to the cohort. Uh, when, we, when we take a look at um, our graduation rates, we include those in uh, a system level rate. So we're not just looking at an individual campus, but you're getting, you're getting the uh, movement of students to other campuses, as well as you do uh, when we calculate retention rates. So it doesn't penalize you when a transfer student leaves your campus. And then as far as Regent Bao's question about our ability to uh, give a rating or a, uh, some kind of measure, we absolutely can. It's just a, depending upon the definition of how, how we go about doing that. Could be straight numbers, could be some kind of ratio. Yeah, and I don't even think of it as a rating, just as a, as a, as a, as a migration yeah. pattern, right? We, we certainly can, and, and we have in the past. I'm sure Joe has a wealth of data on that topic. Uh, we, we do have a dashboard that has some of that information, probably not uh, broken out in as fine a detail as you might be looking for, but we have access to produce a lot of those reports. Thank you, because I, I, you know, I guess my point is, and then it goes back to the idea about outcomes, if we're making it easier, we should expect more of it, so we should measure it. If I'm understanding this correctly, if a student was to transfer mid-program, the campus wouldn't be penalized based on retention or graduation, but solely on the full-time FTE, basically. Largely correct, yeah. Regent Dombrowski. About, I'm gonna take 10 steps back. What I'm hearing is, it's okay to transfer. Absolutely. Which I think it could potentially be a new message. And, and I think that's okay, but I'm just kind of putting that out there. It's okay, and therefore, how we measure, how we make it, okay. Mr. Madam Chair, I, I mean, just a comment. We've, we've debated this a long time, both in the context of common course numbering and the context of performance funding. I, I, I do think, back to one of the earlier questions and comments, we, we should define success as ultimately a student that completes, whether that's at Carroll College, Tribal College, one of our institutions, um, or somewhere in the country. And I think we have, we've approached this, both at the CCM but also performance funding, is at least in Montana, let's try to do that. That's not easy to do nationally. It's not always easy for us to track a student that went out of state and ultimately completed. But that, that's been even a national conversation. iPads, other places, it's not easy to get to that. But ultimately, I don't think our campuses nor the students should be penalized for transfer. Um, it, it was sort of touched upon, but ultimately that student that wants to transfer, uh, there, there's probably some reason, whether it's, you know, place bound or family or dissatisfaction or all those things that we're sort of alluding to, but I'm not sure it matters. The truth is, is if they don't transfer somewhere else, they probably drop out. Um, and so if we can make that process easier and if we can absolutely not penalize our institutions, but in fact, um, help them receive some credit for that process in, in all of our formulas. I think that's been the end goal for 10 years. I'm not sure we've always accomplished that, but I think that continues to be the goal, that that, that migration in or out um, 
And and I, I would be a little hesitant to get to a score because I, I don't I don't I don't think it matters if you've got more coming in or more going out. I think what matters is if we're serving students and if we're doing it well and ultimately if those students are completing and we're helping them find a path to that completion at whatever institution that, that they best can do that. That to me that's the end goal. I think knowing the numbers is important. Um, but I, but I think that's where we we've landed throughout the decade on what it means and, and I, I I really appreciate the conversation because it's good to hear from all of you but I think that's what we're trying to do as a, as a as a system and we'll continue to try to do until we hear otherwise thank you thank you that was a great conversation are there any other comments or questions Jim Rogers I just wanted to affirm a couple things I heard. Um, Regent Buchanan, I agree with you that this slide 11 about the course sharing is really interesting. It would be so interesting to see too, the evolution over time, especially given the disruption of the pandemic and how we've sort of made more with that. Um, I'd just be curious to see what it looks farther down the line. Um, Commissioner Christian, your point about, you know, rewarding completion to some extent, I think is a really interesting idea that I'd love to keep exploring. Um, and then finally, with the exciting new technological um, investments with Quotely and with your you know, one-stop shop platform where you can sort of, from a counselor perspective or a student perspective, walk through what the transfer process looks like and, and give yourself a little bit more tools in the tool bo toolbox, just um, I'll reiterate, I think, what I said in the committee meeting, which is just making sure that that's seamless with the plat uh, with the portal and making sure all those systems are connecting and talking to each other um, as you continue this work. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? Okay. Well, that concludes the business of the two-year committee, unless, Brock, did you have anything else left to share? Uh, no, Chair Sexton. Thanks a lot for your leadership of this, co this committee and appreciate, uh, Joe, and your, pre your presentation as well. Thanks. Thank you for the opportunity to serve, and Chair Lozar. Wonderful, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, uh, for chairing our two-year committee these last uh, uh, last couple of meetings. Um, certainly did a wonderful job of coordinating that, but building a really strong agenda for on important topics that we've been trying to move forward. Uh, at this point in time, we're gonna take uh, a lunch break. Um, we're gonna reconvene at 1.45 here. Uh, the, uh, the regents will be having lunch with the students in the sub ballroom, and then uh, the remaining guests will have lunch at the sub food court. And I think Chancellor Kegel said, um, go out this, uh, the west side of the building and circle around the south side to get down to the sub. Um, and then members of the board, um, before we walk down there, we're gonna take a quick picture. So um, stay here for a minute. Okay. All right, we'll see everyone at uh, 145. All right, uh, welcome back to the meeting. I hope everyone enjoyed their lunch and their conversations. Um, I'm gonna just get us started right away and we'll dive right into uh, our last committee meeting of the day, uh, Budget Admin and Audit Committee. Turn it over to Chair Dombrowski. Thank you, Chair Lozar. I, I just always have to start by acknowledging the work of the OCHI staff uh, relative to this committee and really everything else. It, um, the items here are always well developed and well thought through and I think our committee does a great job of reviewing them and appreciate the work of the committee as well. So with that, I'm just, gonna t I'm just going to, I will turn it over to uh, Deputy Commissioner Tyler Trevor, please. Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, we have a consent agenda here and um, uh, as always, we would take any item off of this list that uh, any member would like to hear uh, detail on. We review these uh, prior to the meeting and ensure that um, they are really just operational items and uh, help us get to our action item, action items. So with that, I just pause for a second to see if there are any uh, suggestions. I don't think we need to take it off, but I did uh, hear a question about AV, which is the MSU pedestrian access improvements. Um, just clarifying that it's a design only and not 
a finalized plan, is that correct? Madam Chair, uh, Regent Rogers, that's correct. Uh, just the planning and design, any construction that'd be done to this would be brought back to the board if it was over $500,000. Seeing none, please carry forward to action item A. All right, action item A is our present law budget for the 2025 biennium. That 2025 sounds quite a ways away, but it's not. That's um, how we, the nomenclature for talking about bienniums. And uh, before I turn this over to, to Director Lyons to walk us through this, the May board meeting prior to the legislative session really can be, is characterized um, by budget development. And present law is the, kind of nuts and bolts of that budget de development, along with, um, you'll, we'll talk later about uh, long range building and planning, and we also, you've heard discussion today about the pay plan. So um, I just wanted to point that out, that these are really the building blocks that we're putting together here, and so this would be uh, a request for action on a key present law building block. With that, I'll turn it over to Director Lyons. Oh, there we go. Madam Chair, members of the board, I thought you were trying to mess with me on the mic again this time, so not to talk about present law. Happy to present to you again the 2025 biennial budget that we are asking for your approval on um, to move into the executive budget. Uh, as Tyler mentioned, it's hard to believe that we're talking about the 2025 biennium. I unfortunately have been talking about it for a while now, so it's kind of old hat at the moment. But in front of you, you have what we are requesting, um, or requesting your approval for the present law adjustment for the Montana educational units. I'm gonna focus primarily on our eight educational units. There are some additional attachments that do include the present law numbers for our agencies, the five agencies that we have as well. I'm not gonna go into those details unless requested at this point. So focusing primarily on the present law for our ed units, and we do this because as the commissioner mentioned earlier today, present law coupled with pay plan and our long range building plan, those are typically our top priorities when we're talking about legislative endeavors. Not that the other pieces aren't important, but this is one of the biggest components that goes into building our budget and keeping our base numbers moving forward for a university system. Present law also is that piece that keeps our ed units operational at the current level into the next biennium. So it's really important to take a look at those numbers, make sure that we're keeping our services the same. This is not increases to services, but keeping our educational units moving forward as they are at this moment. I do wanna mention um, all of the campus budget officers that help with this process. There is an incredible amount of detail that goes into this slide right here that looks very simplified. We go by each single campus and their operating budget, strip it down and build those into these categories. And it takes those campus budget officers to help me get to this level so we can present you with fair and reasonable numbers moving forward. So this slide, we're, we're gonna stay primarily on this one. It's gonna walk you through those categories that we talk about um, with present law. And then how this all rolls into the big budget that we'll get to see in November at some point. So our first category is the annualization of pay plan. There's been a lot of discussion about pay plan during this whole entire meeting. And it's a really important part of our present law adjustment. Because when we provide, or you provide actually, a raise that goes in during the current biennium, the next biennium, we have to annualize that amount of that raise so that moving forward, those funds are within our budget. Even though pay plan is slightly external to this process, there still is that component where we need to keep them moving together and moving forward. I believe the commissioner mentioned, if we get a pay plan but we don't get funded on our present law, there is an impact moving forward. And as you can see, annualization of pay plan for the pay plan that was provided this, com this current biennium, it's $3.7 million to keep that moving forward each year of the next biennium. The next category is our other personnel costs. So this will be like our health insurance if there were any creases to that, not expecting those this time. Um, employee leave payouts, faculty promotion, market merit pieces. So unlike other state agencies, we have to come up with funds in order to pay out any accrued vacation or sick leave that our employees may have. So we have to calculate that here for that reason. The other part of it is we have a unique structure. We have faculty within our realms at the ed units. State agencies don't have that. So we have another component with the faculty market and merit pieces. So if um, a professor was to move from an associate or an assistant, excuse me, to an associate to a full professor, there's some merit pay that goes into that as well that we need to capture moving forward. 
The next item category within here is called statewide present law adjustments. These will be un not unique to other state agencies. They all have them. Ours are a little bit slimmed down because we don't have as many with them. We don't interact with SITSD as much as other state agencies. But this does include our insurance, so the risk management and tort defense, also the audit costs that we have to um, plan for every session or every biennium as well. And then one of the big areas, this is always kind of that, what is this really about? The higher ed specific increases. So in here, we've got things that are unique to higher education. They're unique to our system, but they're not unique to other educational systems. So you could go anywhere around the United States and all other educational units would have these same types of cost associated with them. But these are different than what the state agencies would have. So again, we get to build this in here so that we make sure we capture the cost. Um, utilities, the libraries and journals, these are the professional journals and that that we have subscriptions for to keep on our campuses. A lot of IT maintenance costs, we know that we've talked a lot about IT just today, the LMS, all of those, those costs are built into this portion of it. There's some compliance and safety issues and then rent within those. Finally, rounding out our categories is our new space O&M. We won't see this every single session, potentially, but this would be the new space O&M that the state has agreed to pay for any new buildings that are planned to come online in this next biennium. So it kind of backs up a little bit in there. So we need to include those dollars as well. So all of those categories total up to numbers that range between 33 million and 36 million. So from there though, we need to look at how much of that is tuition, how much of that is state appropriation. And then that comes up with our state percent share, which we're calculating at 43.4%. So if we apply the math to that, in FY24, we're looking at asking for $14.1 million. In FY25, $15.4 million. Those two bottom numbers would be the numbers that we would built into decision packages that would go into the state budgeting system. We'd move forward with our discussions with the governor's office and eventually it would come out in the governor's budget in November. <coughs> Madam Chair, I did mention that we have some other attachments that include the agency present law numbers out there, they're out there. I'm not gonna go into those unless you specifically have questions about those. Thank you. Well done. Questions? Chair Lozar. Uh, Director Lyons, can you talk a little bit about sort of how the campuses were coming up with these estimates in the middle of it, you know, a period of high inflation and changing inflation. So how did we, what was our sort of comprehensive approach to take inflation into, into account with these numbers? Well, I, with Mr. Chair, uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair, I'd like to say that um, one of the things about that is we've taken a different approach where we've brought this to the system office, so we're doing this consistently for the whole entire U system. We look at all the categories and then we rely on higher education price indexing for our inflation factors because we've got the uniqueness with the higher ed specific costs. Um, some of that data is a little bit rolling right now, but we use those as our factors for what we are anticipating the inflation to be on each one of these categories. So other personnel cost is gonna have a lower inflation rate than say our IT maintenance piece of it. So we look at all of those individually to try to come up with our best estimate for you. Other questions? So I asked at the budget committee, um, the, what, what's the opportunity to explain the 6.5% and 7.1% other than just inflation? And um, Deputy Commissioner Tyler uh, <laughs> Trevor did a great job and I wonder if you could sort of answer that question for us today. Uh, Madam Chair, if I just rephrase what you asked is, uh, right now inflation is at 8.3% and we're looking at inflationary cost adjustments here. If present law was just that, only inflationary cost adjustments of something less than 8.3%. Um, so, uh, the, the, you know, some of this goes into a reasonability test. Um, we're looking at present law numbers here that are um, of a magnitude that are larger than we've requested for by a long ways in the past. Mm -hmm. And so you have to balance that with the opportunity that we have to make a convincing argument to the legislature. Uh, do we know what uh, inflationary cost will be by the time we roll around to the next legislative session? No, we don't. 
Um, we wanted something that was pushing the boundaries uh, as, as hard as we could, um, but not pushing further past than, than would be sustainable or reasonable. Helpful, thank you. Questions, comments on this? All right, uh, Director Lyons, stay up there because I believe the next two items are yours. Uh, and I skipped one. Okay, items B, uh, we'll take these together, they're both for the community colleges. Uh, Miles, I mean, Dawson Community College and Flathead Community College um, uh, annually have the opportunity to adjust tuition and fees for their local board. Miles Community College just chooses to stay with the biennial, so that's why we see these two colleges coming to us with requests. To take it away, Director Lyons. Madam Chair, members of the board, um, Tyler mentioned that these are annual requests from Dawson and Flathead Valley Community College. Uh, one thing also that I want to point out, in addition to the fact that they can bring these annually to us, is that their local board of trustees have already approved these numbers before being presented to the Board of Regents. So for our first campus, we have Dawson Community College. You'll see that they're requesting a five to 11% increase on tuition based on the category that they are seeking. Now off the gate, 11% might seem like a lot, but really if you look at it, it's $120 for their in-district students. This also still keeps Dawson Community College lower than any of the other community colleges tuition. So no concerns there. We can move to the Flathead Valley, Tyler. Again, Flathead Valley has an annual request. This time, there is no tuition increase request, just on their mandatory fees. $42 for every tuition category, about 6%. Both of these requests seem reasonable, nothing out of line, and we would recommend approval. Any questions for B or C? Okay. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is a request for Montana State University to name a new building in recognition of a recent philanthropic gift. Earlier this year, the campus received a $50 million gift from the Gianforte Family Foundation for a new building to house the Gianforte School of Computing and other computing-related programs at MSU. To recognize the gift, the campus is proposing to name the new building Gianforte Hall. As board members will recall from the discussion in Dillon, our naming policy, Board of Regents Policy 1004.1, provides an exception for naming buildings after statewide office holders when the gift warrants some form of recognition. Also in accordance with the naming policy, MSU held a listening session on April 27th. Board members have received the comments from the listening session as well as any comments that were provided to individual board members and to the commissioner's office. I will now turn it over to President Cruzado for some more information on the proposal. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, uh, Regent Dombrowski, and thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the board. As, uh, as you remember, we brought this item to the attention of the Board of Regents uh, at our last meeting. Since then, the campus has been soliciting and, and receiving uh, public comment. There was a specific um, meeting in which we accepted public comment. Uh, we have been receiving emails. Uh, we have been receiving phone calls, personal visits in the president's office. And all that information has been delivered um, to the Office of the Commissioner of Higher Education. Um, we want to, uh, one more time, thank the Gianforte Family Foundation for the generosity of this gift and what it represents for the future of not only Montana State University, but actually for the students of the state of Montana. This new uh, facility will allow us to deliver the quality programs in computer science that we have been offering for uh, years now, but also it would allow us to put under the same tent um, other fields that are related to computing but that certainly expand the appeal of that uh, market for our students, such as optics and photonics. And in optics and photonics, we offer everything from the two-year certificate all the way to bachelor's and master's and PhD programs. 
We also invited um, the other what we call creative industries programs, such as music technology, our very well-known uh, film and photography program, to coexist and create synergies under this new facility that we will have in our uh, Bozeman campus. So with that, uh, we, we want to thank everybody who came out and provided feedback, their opinion, um, and um, we just ask the, the regents now for their support in naming this building that has been uh, gifted to us as the GM Forte Hall. Thank you, President Cruzado. Questions? Yep, Chair Loza. Uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I think there's language in our, um, in our board policy around the exception for transformative gifts, and I'm wondering if you can speak to how this particular gift is transformative beyond sort of putting all of these different fields sort of in, w in one primary space. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. What we have, um, first of all, we were very, as I said, very uh, impressed by the sheer size of, of the gift uh, made by the Jim Forte Family Foundation. A $50 million gift is transformative um, for any university in the nation. Um, secondly, as mentioned, it affords us to start building on the strengths that we already have in our School of Computing and looking into the future uh, with a renewed sense of, of not only hope but uh, creativity in terms of the interdisciplinarity, which is the realm of, of the future. Um, gone are the days when students come to our colleges and universities just thinking about just that they like one thing, right? Uh, part of the reasons why when we take a look at um, our, our, the time that takes our students to complete their degrees, there is a good and valid reason. We have a great number of double majors, and that is students who are interested in more than one field. They like this, but they also like that. So this opportunity of having um, these great programs under one roof, we, it is our hope that that proximity, that in location, will allow them to be even more creative in, the, in, in, in more programs, in, in but we, the same topics that we were discussing this morning and fostering um, uh, additional retention by promoting engagement. Needless to say, a gift of this magnitude would have been a transformative opportunity for any discipline. But when you're talking about computer science, uh, that, is, that is the realm of the future. Right, um, and, and I need to say that there is a consistency in purpose coming from the GM Forte Foundation, Family Foundation. They have helped us um, motivate students and even high school students, right, with uh, getting them inspired into coding. Um, as I shared with you last time, one of the things that we really look forward to having in this building is an opportunity to attract more of our high school students so that they can find a home early on when you know the the bi the big names in computing the Steve Jobs of the world the big gates of the world they did not start when they were 22 years old they started much earlier so imagine a place where those very young individuals those very young men and women and we want to make sure that we attract even more women into computing fields they can come to Montana State University and get informed and get prepared in a very non-formal manner, not only as part of a curriculum, but part of the exploration that, that our students want to have. So it, allow, it will allow us also to start strengthening opportunities and collaborations with private industries and companies. Many of, of them are based in Bozeman, but thanks to technology, they don't have to be in Bozeman for us to make sure that we stretch those opportunities for collaborations and that results in a gain for those companies, but it results in incredible working experiences for all our students. So I, I am convinced that this is the type of gift that will allow us to take a leap 
the, the, the Jim Fortis School of Computing has been registering incredible growth and incredible gains, but this gift will place them in an incredible new height by facilitating all the wonderful collaborations that I have explained here. Um, also, with us today, we have the director of the School of Computing, as well as the uh, dean of the Asby Arson College of Engineering, and I'm sure that they will be delighted to provide more information if you're interested. Our provost, Makwa, has been doing a lot of uh, uh, wage analysis and, and opportunities analysis for the regions as well, and he's also available for, for your uh, questions as well. Thank you, President Cruzado. Are there regions that want to ask some additional questions of the leaders that Cruzado suggested? Okay. I'm so glad you mentioned the uh, industry opportunities. I think that that piece of it where not only are we working with our industry partners to feed them a workforce, but then also giving students a transformative experience where their education becomes something that means so much more because they can really see themselves in the workforce and understand what those jobs would be like. Um, is there any more additional detail that you could share about those sort of evolving conversations in relation to this? Sure, I would like to ask if John Paxton or Brett Gunning are available. They are the ones who are really at the forefront of having those conversations and uh, in terms of partnerships. Thank you, President Cruzado, uh, board members. And Brianna, uh, Regent Rogers, would you mind um, restating the question just so I've got it fully before I answer? Certainly, thank you so much for being with us. Um, just interested in, you know, I know that this is early in the process, but um, any evolving conversations with our industry partners about what those p partnerships could look like, the benefits to our students, um, how um, this proposal will improve student success and outcomes and support our economy by also supporting our industry partners. Yes, so, so the building, in addition to um, serving student, staff, and faculty from our School of Computing, as um, we already heard, will um, involve several other computing partners. So these will be um, entities, uh, faculty on campus where computing is uh, instrumental to, uh, to what they, uh, they do. So music technology we heard about, for example. So one of the things, one of the hopes for this building is if we can put the right people together, the building itself will serve as a kind of creative incubator for new curricular opportunities, new research opportunities. And I envision the building itself, if we can um, kind of uh, structure it properly, um, the building will, will tell a very kind of welcoming, inclusive story about computing and who's able to succeed in these computing careers. Um, so for example, when it comes to, um, to, to industry, and, and one of the things about, you know, like, like thinking about a building in the future is, I mean, it's just so exciting to um, even have this, this opportunity. And um, I'm also extremely grateful to the Agile Forte Family Foundation for making this um, even uh, like kind of a possibility. But I would, you know, kind of the way I envision it, and by the way, I'm not the only person that's gonna have says in what, how this building turns out, but um, as I, I've had a chance to think about it quite a bit. I would like it to be sort of have thematic spaces through the building that can help us tell stories and help students better understand how they can make contributions to kind of the world of computing. So for example, one of the things that we thought about is like sort of kind of a Montana industry, kind of software industry hallway, where we actually, you know, like have companies say like Zoot Enterprises or Workiva, and students can learn a little bit about those companies, they can see their logos and so on and so forth, and actually then kind of get a sense for the rich ecosystem and the opportunities um, that are offered. You know, one of the things that, that is exciting also um, in today's world where computing connects to, to really almost everything, we have all of these exciting opportunities and we've, in the past we've been trying to collaborate um, across campus to, uh, to roll out new degrees like the Bachelor of Arts where students who are inter interested in both computing but also non-STEM opportunities. So like maybe it's like I want to um, kind of like 
help with digital democracy, so I need to understand political science, but I also need to understand what's, what um, computing is and what can be done with it. Students can, can sort of pursue these. Coming up this year, we, we envision um, um, we should be launching um, an MS in cybersecurity, and we also have a data science bachelor's degree that's in conjunction with the Department of Mathematical Sciences. There will be some courses from business. There's gonna be a privacy and ethics course from the library that will also provide kind of new broader opportunities to students. And so I just, uh, I'm highly biased, but uh, you know, 100 years ago, reading, writing, and arithmetic were the uh, fundamentals of an education. I would put computing on top of that in, in the, the year 2022, and this building will give us that um, incubator in order to, uh, to, to, to create some of these new possibilities for, for all students to, to better succeed. The final thing I'll mention is that you know, nationwide, right now, about 80% um, of students who earn computing degrees um, are men. And we very much aspire to provide a rich enough um, set of computing opportunities that the underlying population demographics of Montana State, that's who we will maybe in 10 years, we aspire that that's the demographic we'll be serving instead. Thank you very much. Thank you, please. Thank you, Regent Rogers. Um, I'll provide a real-time example. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I think it was now, we had a uh, open house or a press conference announcing that Hyundai was going to open an R&D facility in Bozeman. Uh, one of the big drivers for that, their interest in opening said research and development facility was access to workforce. You know, and we were needing to answer the question, do they have the computer scientists that are graduating from Montana State engineers to uh, who can meet their workforce demands. Now, our engineers and computer scientists right now are in high demand, okay? But we send a lot of students out of state who would stay in state for a quality opportunity. And so examples like Hyundai R development, uh, research and development facility provide that and we're in conversations with many, many more uh, entities like that as well. Um, and then the other point I'd like to make, if I may, um, when I first met President Cruzado, is when she interviewed on campus in uh, the fall of 2009. And I knew at that point I wanted her to be my president. And then as soon as she was here and my president, I knew I wanted to be her dean. And, and that's the why for doing all of these things, right? And that answer to that, and if any of you heard her speak at all, she gets excited a bit about the land grant university and access. Okay? And so access has been at the core of what I've wanted to do in the leadership role of my college, which includes the School of Computing, since the day she chose to hire me in that role. And why is that important in a technological society? Uh, we've had growing demand for computer science and engineering education pretty much that entire time I have been dean. What many schools have done is said, hey, this is perfect opportunity to rise up the US, US News and World Report, become selective, and only take the best, stay the same size. But that doesn't get people like our Hyundai friends ha uh, excited about uh, hiring workforce, and it doesn't cr create the opportunities that I want to create for our students. So to me, that means we need to grow. We need to get bigger. We don't need less engineers that look like me. We need more engineers that look like you, ma'am, and more computer scientists that, that look like you. And so to do that and keep the op open access, we have to become bigger. So I've been focused on that the entire time I've been dean. We have a lot more way to go. Uh, uh, we've made a lot of grounds on improving the gender diversity of our faculty and our students, improving other diversity of our, our faculty and students, uh, and we need to keep growing in order to be able to keep doing that. And this is the sort of transformational gift that will allow us to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you.
please. One last thing that, that came to memory, um, Regent Rogers, and, and that it's a very good question. And as, as the Dean mentioned, um, he and his department heads have been working diligently, reaching out to companies and corporations to create the, the type of partnership that we can then offer to our students, right, and make the educational experience far more interesting than just sitting down in a, in a desk and learning from passively from a textbook. Uh, nothing like having the hands-on direct opportunity that these partnerships afford. Last um, summer, listening to, to, to John Paxton and to Brett uh, talk, last summer, um, Ambassador Bach has called me. And he said, um, there is a meeting um, in Bozeman, um, and we have a good number of people from technology, and they would like to learn more about Montana State. So I attended the reception, and in attendance, in attendance we had executives uh, from CrowdStrike and Uber and Google, and <laughs> some very big names. Before the night was over, CrowdStrike had approached me and said, I want 10 of your graduates, and I want to, to talk with you about internships for your upper division students. So there's, there's something in the air, right? And this building will allow us just to move from ideas to tangible opportunities, transformational opportunities for those students and for their families and their communities we serve. Thank you, President Cruzado. Any other questions or comments from the board? All right, seeing none, we'll go to action item E. Madam Chair, members of the committee, action item E is uh, related to the previous item, and this item would grant uh, uh, MSU, uh, Montana State University, a spending authority uh, up to $5 million to plan and design this new building. And as we heard, uh, obviously this is a complex building. It houses five different or uh, computer programs from five different uh, locations on campus. It's interdisciplinary and, uh, I, and, it's, and it's, it's something that uh, is going to warrant this level of, of effort. Before the, before the construction would begin. Um, just to remind the board that any construction uh, approval would come back to the board. Uh, this is just the planning and design. The, the funds for paying for this come from the donation. Thank you. Any questions, clarifications on that? Okay. Madam Chair, uh, the next item is a request to authorize to plan, design, repair, replace, and install utility systems along 7th Avenue on the Montana State University campus. Um, this project is uh, essentially an addition to the amazing tunnel system that they have um, on campus and uh, really as a result of the expansion of the campus uh, to handle the growth, to work its way up 7th Avenue, as so I understand it, toward uh, Museum of the Rockies from essentially uh, a location um, closer to the uh, Student Union Building. Um, it's going to ensure adequate utility and infrastructure uh, that would include um, water, electrical, steam, IT capacity. So it's, it's the full <laughs> upgrade here. Um, it's part of their operation and maintenance. Uh, it was budgeted in, it's part of their budget uh, and it works in conjunction with the board approved um, facilities maintenance account that, that you approved a couple of years ago. Um, they've saved money to do this project, put it in that account, and we'll draw it out of there. Madam Chair. Thank you. Questions? I, I did have one question to make sure that the city of Bozeman was um, uh, duly engaged and not sort of suggesting that MSU should pay for something that the municipality should. Right. But uh, go ahead. Madam Chair, uh, yes, and I forward that question to uh, the applicable people at Montana State, and the answer is this is part of campus, and so uh, the part that's on campus is Montana State's responsibility until it meets up with the city. 
Thank you. Any questions? All right. I think we can keep moving. I okay. see our colleague from UM is scooting up the board. Yeah, he here. must have something in mind here. Um, <laughs> item G is a request for authorization to issue bonds to finance auxiliary buildings um, on the campus of the University of Montana. And Madam Chair, with your permission, I'd have Vice President Lassiter come to the podium. Thank you, please. Okay, thank you, uh, Deputy Commissioner Trevor. Um, it's my pleasure to come before you today seeking your authorization for allowing the University of Montana to borrow up to $60 million par amount of fixed rate bonds uh, to be used for several projects. Um, approximately 15 million would be used to uh, complete existing projects that have already been approved by the board and are part of our student life master plan. Um, in the inflationary environment that we have, we have cost escalations that simply ran uh, in excess of our original estimates. So we'll uh, be needing some additional capital to complete those projects. Approximately $8 million to complete the deconstruction of certain uh, residence halls and other facilities on campus to make way for a new residence hall, uh, approximately 200 beds anticipated to be uh, put into service uh, around 2024. Um, the order of this request is a, a little uh, unusual in that we're seeking authorization to borrow this money now and we don't have the authority to go ahead and complete the, the new dorm facility yet. But given the inflation environment, that inflationary environment that we are in currently, given the pressures that we're seeing uh, in the city of Missoula and on campus for housing, both for our students and uh, employees, frankly, um, we think it's prudent to go ahead and get at least some of that capital in place now so that we will be ready to uh, address this project head on as soon as we're ready to move forward. Uh, latest cost estimates um, on May 9th uh, indicate that approximately 4.3% uh, on a tax exempt basis or 4.9% on a taxable basis. Um, over the last several days and weeks, we've seen a shift from uh, in the capital markets where tax taxable bonds have become less favorable. Tax exempt bonds are now more in favor. So we wanna leave both options open in this request that we're putting before you today. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, questions? All right, thank, thank you. you. Mm -hmm. All right, Madam Chair, finally, the last action item uh, for the University of Montana is a request for authority to increase spending um, on their new dining facility. And I guess just a little background on this. In March, a similar request came from the University of Montana to increase spending authority uh, for the renovation of Knowles Hall. And um, that was a, to move the rent, that renovation from 12 million to 18 million. Um, this is in the exact same vein uh, the project is actually currently out for bid, uh, but the, it's anticipated that um, it's going to be in the very close to $40 million range, which we've already given the university, you've already given the University of Montana authority to spend up to $27 million. That was last May. So this is a request to extend that by $13 million. Um, this is, uh, the regents have sole authority to approve uh, uh, the, the projects that are revenue generating, i.e. auxiliary building, so this falls completely within the purview of the Board of Regents, and funding from this will come from university bonds. Questions? Uh, no, just please. Uh, thank you, Regent Dombrowski. Uh, my company's been asked to propose on this, so I'm gonna recuse myself from any conversation debate, and I'll abstain from that. Well. Thank you, Regent Selden. Any other comments, questions? Okay, that's the action items and now we'll move to information. Okay, Madam Chair, the first information item is long range building program uh, for the 2025 biennium. These are the exact same documents we saw at the March board meeting, actually in the same location as information items. Typically, we would have had these ranked and we would ask for approval for the board, from the Board of Regents at this meeting of a single ranked list. Uh, we're pushing this off just a bit because um, the environment still isn't crystal clear on what we might be able to receive from ARPA funding. And, and uh, it is anticipated that that will um, 
come to fruition soon. We're hoping that either at uh, the July planning meeting and or the September meeting, we'd be able to come and bring you a ranked list. Um, in the meantime, we've uh, talked to uh, the architecture and engineering division to ensure that they understand that we won't be providing a single rank list, but rather dually rank list by each side of the affiliation and at a later date providing the singular, singular list. Madam Chair, that's it for that information item. I suspect there shouldn't be any questions, so <laughs> let's move on. All right, item B, um, Chancellor Reed. With your permission, Madam Chair, I'd ask Chancellor Reed to come to the podium and give us a background on a proposal, um, information that is, uh, to, um, well, I'll let Chancellor Reed explain the details. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner uh, Trevor, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, I'm actually really excited to present this item today uh, for an information item, largely because um, this has been almost four years in the making, and I've worked with four different student body presidents as we've tried to move this project forward. Uh, regrettably, every time we're about there and we think we're ready to go, given the things that have happened in the uh, environment, construction, inflation, we've had to go back to the drawing board. And what we're seeing now and what I'll show you is a project that's almost about half what we originally started with four years ago. Uh, but. I think the students and working with our uh, Vice Chancellor for Administration and Finance, they've come to a good, uh, a good project that I think meets the needs of the students. I think it's an, a tremendous um, use of space. Uh, there's uh, approximately 6,000 square feet of new space that would be used as a new wellness center, new wellness and recreation center. It also includes renovation of old racquetball courts that are currently being used for storage and also the uh, restoration of the auxiliary gym in the Bulldog Athletic Rec Center that's currently so warped the students really actually can't use it. It's, it's a safety hazard. So it's going to correct all of those and provide a wellness center for the students. Uh, the students put this to, the to a vote. 98%, uh, excuse me, 94% of the students voted in favor and that was of a response rate of more than 50% of our student body. So they put a vote out to the students more than 50% of the students voted, 94 of those were in favor of the Wellness Center, and 85% of them were in for support of a fee to cover the cost of this. The total cost of the project is $3.6 million. Approximately $2 million of that is new space. $1.6 million is the renovation of the existing space. Uh, a couple things I'd like to point out, uh, even with the fee, and I, I feel like I'm breaking up, so I'll try to talk a little closer a bit. Even with the fee, uh, and, and right now we estimate it at a maximum of $100 per semester. Uh, we've, we've been working, as I said, for the last several years, the student body president and the student government have been working on reducing fees, and they've been able to reduce the fees in anticipation of eventually being able to do this project. The net impact uh, will be approximately $72.50 as a maximum. Uh, we are continuing to work with donations. We've already secured a half a million dollar donation uh, for the project, and we're continuing to work on fees to see what we can do to reduce that. But even with that fee, the University of Montana Western would still be the lowest cost four-year degree in the state of Montana. And we're proud of that, and we're gonna continue to try to, to maintain that. Uh, the other thing I'd point out is our students currently uh, are paying $40 a month to be able to work out at the YMCA because we do not have a rec and workout facility for our students. So those that want to participate in the Wellness Center are currently paying $40 a month to go to the YMCA. So uh, even though it's a, a large fee, uh, we're not able, unfortunately, given our student body of a little over 1,200 students, we're not able to build a tremendous facility, but it's a tremendously needed facility and one that we think is going to be a tremendous uh, benefit for our students and one that they're very much in support of. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions or walk you through anything. We also have our student body president and our vice chancellor for administration of finance who would be happy to answer questions if you had more details. Thank you. Questions? Regent Rogers. Thank you so much for bringing this proposal forward. Um, it's exciting to think about the opportunities here. Um, the item mentions uh, a mental health component to the project. Can you speak more to that piece? 
So there, there's a couple opportunities with, with COVID, with the mental health demand and those type of areas. We actually have, there's some grant opportunities and funder, funding opportunities if we're able to provide some mental health space. Um, so the facility has enough flex space built into it that we'd be able to dedicate some space to those if those opportunities were available. We also have looked at the opportunities to coordinate some of our student counseling and some of our wellness also in the wellness center. A lot of that will be depend dependent on how they actually program the space when it's finalized, but there is space with the renovations of the racquetball courts and the new space, there should be enough room to accommodate that if we're able to make it work. Thank you, it's exciting to think. Um, I appreciate President Cruzado's leadership with the Wellness Center at MSU, um, really destigmatizing that environment, allowing physical and mental health to come together, you know, wellness activities to be all encompassing instead of focused only on the physical wellness. So I'm excited to hear about the flexibility of the space and the opportunities to engage in um, seeking grants and other ways to make sure that students have a lot of different op opportunities to engage in wellness. Thank you. Thank you. Regent Sexton. Uh, thank you, Chair Domorowski. Um, I'd like to hear more on just any feedback from the students and perhaps what your associated student body did to reach out to the students on feedback for this proposal and for the fee. Sure, thank you, Regent Sexton, Madam Chair. The, as I said, the student, uh, the student government have been working tirelessly on this for almost coming close to four years. Uh, it has been, um, without any hesitation, the number one priority of our student body over the last several years. Uh, I've been in countless conversations, both when I was serving as the Vice Chancellor and as a Chancellor with the students in trying to get this space put together. Uh, we've looked at, at many different options over the years. Uh, we've looked at trying to use empty space. How could we convert that and turn that into a, a rec center or facility? We just do not have the space available on campus to be able to do anything without adding new space. And so that's where we started looking at new space. Originally, the facility was almost three times this. And just given the costs and trying to be able to make it work, also trying to maintain uh, affordability and access for our students that we felt it was important that we didn't get ourselves to where we priced ourselves out of our students ability to pay and so they've been collectively as a student body again on numerous surveys um, and I uh, would encourage our, our president for student government to to address this also uh, maybe in public comment or he could certainly come up now as well but they've certainly had many conversations with the students to see what they can do what are the needs of the students what are they looking for they've been involved in many programming meetings with the architects as they've tried to design and uh, program the space for the facility so it's really has been a student driven project um, from the get-go uh, it was brought forward by the students and it's been planned by the students and they've, they've really been driving the whole show Thank you. Chair Dombrowski, would you have an issue with the... Uh, no issue at all. If yeah. this the student right. president would come up, Please. that'd be great. This is President Yeager. He is our brand new student <laughs> body president, but he's been involved <laughs> in student government, so he knows the project well. Thank you, Chancellor Reed. Uh, this is something that's been on our Senate for a long time. It's been through countless representatives through our college's administration and our leadership in student government. Our students have expressed, expressed a lot of concern about this. Uh, we have a very small weight room that is shared with athletics. And a lot of that time is blocked out for specific sports at specific times, which doesn't leave the general population of students any time to benefit their health and wellness through fitness. So. Uh, a lot of the numbers are even higher than what Chancellor Reed had expressed. We have students that are paying to anywhere from $140 a semester up to $500 a semester for <coughs> fitness when they're paying a fee on top of it to use a weight room that they aren't being accommodated with properly. So mm -hmm. I feel like this facility is just going to be a pretty well-rounded answer for all of these issues that we're facing with our student body and we also have a lot of opportunity like you would address with uh, mental health and wellness. We have a new director of counseling that I think is has a lot of plans for incorporating mental health into athletics and doing a lot of things with groups and having a facility where we can house all that is just gonna be extremely beneficial to our university. Excellent, thank you. Thank you very much, I'm excited for you guys. Any other questions? Thank you. Yep, thank you. Yeah, yeah, very good. All right, 
with that, Commissioner, please. With great apologies, but can can we go back one item? Of, of course. I just want to make sure we're all crystal clear on, on in the, the bond item. There might be two in items. In the bond item. It, yeah, it's a couple Yeah, right of there. Right. So in, in the explanation, it references some employee housing. I, I just want to be clear, we're not talking about building employee housing, and that's been asked and answered a number of times. Um, I know those discussions have come up. I, I don't want the justification to somehow uh, get misconstrued as what we're talking about. It's very clear that the bonds are, are student housing. The high costs of housing are having effects all across our communities, right? And that's not going away. I, I believe, I think the campuses uh, believe that if we do our part to make sure that we're taking care of student housing, by providing housing for students, it will take some pressure off the overall housing markets and hence the reason for the justification in there. But I, I just want to be crystal clear that we don't, because uh, it references employees in, in a few spots in the explanation, not in the item. But we're not talking about uh, employee housing, we're talking about student housing, and we're talking about all housing is being affected right now, but these bonds are, are, are designed for one thing, not the other. I, I greatly appreciate clear. that clarification. I think that's um, critical, thank you. So uh, with the conclusion of that information item, I think we'll take a break, Chair Loza. Um, sure, let's, uh, let's take a quick break. Um, let's come back at about three o'clock. Three o'clock, so about 15 minutes. Okay, uh, we'll reconvene the budget committee, please. The next uh, information item on the budget committee is entitled Employee Retention and Recruitment. It's really a request that the board has made of the OCHI staff to begin the conversation around those issues that we know are pervasive. And um, I'll just turn it over to Commissioner Christian to begin the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, absolutely. Um, We've had conversations even today, and, and we, we sort of introduced conversation around this at the March meeting. But we, we do believe, you know, the, the, the most significant challenge that we're facing right now is how we ultimately recruit and then retain high-quality employees all across the spectrum of our, our hiring. Um, we've certainly heard that. You all have heard that as board members. Um, you, you, from the grocery store to visits on campus and beyond. It, it has certainly captured the uh, attention of my office. Um, but as those conversations unfold, you know, you hear a lot of talk that ranges everywhere from anecdotal to who knows what. And I, I think the chair and vice chair on our leadership call appropriately asked that we sort of take a data look into what it is we're facing. I think we truly have to understand the complexity of the problem as best we can, knowing that it's a little different at each campus and it's quite multifaceted uh, from, from a host of things that have come up from true compensation to other issues to you know the, the nationwide labor shortage that exists. Um, it, it, it is a serious concern across Montana, it's a serious concern across the country, it's a serious concern uh, across the nation. I think what we really tried to do is dive down into the data a little bit and get a sense for where we sit at our various uh, campuses and, and how that does compare. Are, are we, in fact, worse off than the, the struggle that we're seeing uh, our counterparts all across the country? Um, or not, and, and how does that affect our strategies moving forward? I, I will, uh, and I guess this is the one thing I wanna say. Today, uh, we'll purposefully be light on strategies, on, on solutions, and you know, I, I think as a general rule, your team at Ochi likes to bring uh, problems, but at the same time, bring some solutions to those problems. I think it's important with this conversation that we really try as a board uh, and beyond it to, to get our arms around to understand the complexity of this, and that's what this presentation is about today, to really kind of look at the data and then 
we will, through various platforms, including uh, conversations with shared governance, as we mentioned this morning, with conversations with this board and beyond, start looking at some solutions, start looking at strategies that we can uh, deploy to, to help in areas where we need to help. Uh, it, is, it is light on strategy because truthfully, I, I don't want to throw out a lot of maybes that then become expectations or start to get interest and momentum behind things that we may or may not be able to do under Montana law, board policy, a whole host of other things. So, you know, I, I've asked uh, Tyler and team to really pull this together. They've actually invested a fair amount of time in this to try to get a sense of where we're at from a pure data perspective. Um, we'll digest that today and over the, the next coming while, and then uh, we'll work on this uh, throughout the, the summer. And, and that's an important time for us because ultimately I do think that this effort needs to culminate in a discussion with this board that ultimately turns into uh, a legislative request um, and, you know, with every, with, with every one of those decisions will come some impact as we move forward. What will the board do uh, in various scenarios and, and how will it uh, address this? So I, I think we set the stage and uh, we'll go from there. But with that, uh, Deputy Commissioner Trevor. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Uh, okay, so this is a big topic and I'm not gonna purport to, to to anyone that I'm gonna cover everything. The the, the breadth and depth of the, the various um, data sets, areas we can look into uh, is enormous, but it is important that we're able to speak on this topic as a system. And so that's the groundwork I'm trying to lay here. Uh, this is a work in progress. The corral that I built starts with a national landscape. Uh, let's take a look at, at what we know to be true uh, through data that, that we're seeing and hearing at the national level. And then, th and then apply the MUS data that we have that we can get um, to compare ourselves w when possible to those national trends and find out interesting facts about ourselves. And then thirdly, use examples that we've heard from campuses, uh, the kind of the qualitative portion of this and, and you know organize it in such that we can make some generalizations from that type of information. And then use what we know there to add to it the compounding factors of our current uh, economy and really our social situation. So um, it won't leave you with any answers as the commissioner indicated, probably with more questions, probably with more data requests, I'm sure. But uh, we have a host of folks over here th that are keeping track of those and we'll do our best to uh, tackle all of them. Slow me down when I get going too fast. So just to articulate the problem through the eyes of COOPA, COOPA being the, um, I'm not even gonna tell you what that acronym stands for, it's the National HR Group though, uh, that I borrowed, quote, borrowed a lot of data from, uh, from to, to kind of paint this national scene. And so the problem slash challenge, post COVID, many colleagues, uh, many colleges losing staff. We have shortages across the entirety of the, oper uh, of the operation. We've uh, all heard about the great resignation and sort of just the change of reference that people had following, uh, I, I say ch following COVID, I guess the first uh, chapter of COVID or one of the chapters. Um, and then a growing competition with the private sector. Employees inc uh, seeking uh, increased pay and flexibility coupled with an increase in the cost of living uh, housing prices, particularly in college towns, out of sight. Um, so to wrap it up, high attrition, tight budget, reduced staffing, increased burnout, all compound to make the retaining of talented staff difficult and the hiring of new staff as difficult. So let's just take a look at the percent change in faculty size over the past two years. From So we're gonna look at first from, how did it change from 19 to 20 and then from 20 to 21. So the first dot is the percent either increase or de decrease in 19 to 20. The second dot is the percent decrease or increase uh, from 20 to 21. And you can see for faculty across all types of institutions, doctoral through associates, we've seen a decline in faculty. 
And, and I guess before I'd go any further, the first thing that came to my mind here is, okay, yeah, fine, we know about declining faculty at certain campuses that have declining enrollment. And, and that could make sense. And we know that the national scene had, has experienced a 3% decline this year. And the trend across the nation has been a, a, a slight decrease in enrollment. So um, I, I'm not saying that enrollment is the key driving factor here. I just think we have to keep that in mind when we look at all of these slides. So um, a, a longer scope look at faculty, uh, tenure versus non-tenure and adjunct. Um, most of the decrease in faculty size comes from your non-tenure and adjunct faculty. If we took a look at staff over the last uh, same time period, 20 to 21, um, those uh, staff sizes declined across all different types of staff, office, service, maintenance, technical, and skilled craft. And then we look a little bit longer, um, we see that the part-time staff had experienced the largest declines. Full-time staff, however, down 3.3% in 2021. Big data collection effort here, 750,000 plus employees included in this. Coupa's data, even though I can't remember what it stands for, is the coin of the realm. So yearly raises, what I would call our pay plan, uh, that uh, the raises for 21 were the lowest in five years across all different types of faculty and staff in higher education. When we look at turnover, Turnover could range anywhere from 7% to 17%, depending on the type of staff nationwide. Uh, the highest turnover rates occurring in our full and part-time staff. And following uh, our kind of our COVID shutdown era, uh, a, a survey of higher ed IT and HR employees indicated that over half of them would prefer more remote work. So increased demand for flexibility. Add in increasing retirement rates for both faculty and staff. And no surprise here, baby boomers getting older. And finally, just an overall look at the inflow and outflow of employees over a long period of time in higher ed. Um, it, it sort of flipped the script from 1990 when there was more inflow than outflow, and now we have quite a bit more outflow than inflow. So you have a lot of movement out of higher ed and competition with the private sector. So I'll just kind of pause there for a second. We'll move on to the MUS data. Now, I wish I could just mirror everything, exactly what I said there. Sure. Madam Chair, a couple of these slides that seem remarkable to me, th this one in particular, that outflow. Higher ed's always been a great place to work for a lot of reasons. Um, that That's sort of a troubling chart in, in my mind. Um, We've, we've been thought of as a preferred employer for a very long time. Uh, we've been thought of as a, a place where you can build a career, good benefits, I mean, the sort of host of things. And that outflow is, is telling uh, from, from 2010 on. The other one that I think is remarkable in that sort of early slide deck is the, the turnover side of things. That's, um, you know, at, at, at every level, when, when we have high turnover rates, the loss of institutional memory is just in incredibly challenging, trying to build that back in to onboard people. Um, the cost of uh, the recruitments, uh, the cost of onboarding, all of those things is significant. And you start to spend a lot of time with existing staff trying to train new staff only for other staff to leave. And that cycle is just, it, it's very challenging. It's demoralizing, it's, it's, a, it, it, it's a struggle. So of, of all the things, those uh, really stand out to me as I look through this slide deck. Okay, I'll move on to MUS data. So just kind of to set the, the, the stage, we just took a look at a snapshot in time 
in, in February. February seemed like a good month to have uh, you know a, a full full boat of your employees on campus. Your nine and ten month contract faculty are all there, and uh, we just take a look at by FTE position in the current unrestricted. So that's the portion of the budget paid for with state appropriations and tuition. How many people do we have? And February over February over February, and so over the past three years. Reductions have occurred across all different areas of, em of employment uh, besides your contract professionals. And when I say contract professionals, it's sort of a, I, I guess maybe a higher ed term to say at, at, in an other um, uh, areas, director and above. Um, you got your contract administrators, which are a very small set of uh, your deans and your vice presidents and above. Um, your classified staff, and, and then your overall your faculty, all faculty, non-tenure and, and tenure track faculty. So uh, you can see the, the drop, the three-year decline um, across all areas except contract professionals. So going from there, now this is me trying to replicate uh, those slides, taking a look at the change between 19 and 20 and then the change between 20 and 21. And y you can see that everywhere we dropped, except the contract professionals, um, and then compare that to the national trend. And so tenure track faculty actually increased over that period of time in both of those years, um, where we dropped 4.9% in the first year, and then after that, another 37 So I guess in a, con in, in, in a sense there, that's compounding. Um, again, if you look at the classified FTE, you'd see the same thing, that we drop 1.6, the national is about one, and then 3.5 compared to something less than that. Um, again, at the top of this, I note that, okay, let's also consider enrollment here. Um, in this most recent year, we're up and the nation is down. Now, if we backed up a couple years, that might not hold, but I, I just wanna make that note that enrollment does influence some of these changes. Excuse me, Madam Chair. I think if you back up a few years, what you'll see is a decline both uh, nationally and, and across Montana. So some of the decline is, is natural, is justified, makes sense with the numbers. But it, it, as, the, as the trend moves, as the, as the charts show, that we're outpacing that. So then again, trying to make that comparison to those national slides on yearly raises. Um, I call it the MUS pay plan. Uh, two out of the last five years, I MUS employees did not see pay plan increases. So this past November 2021, there was no pay plan. And then if you backed up to 2017, we were funded a pay plan by the legislature, but we had a special session. Uh, we had the, the, the um, pullback of our pay plan uh, eventually and did not apply that in 2017. Okay, so now to take a look at vacant positions. Um, and I'm still in the current unrestricted. And it, that means something uh, in terms of numbers. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But in the current unrestricted, we have about 4,800 uh, FTE positions. Now, this is the data that we submit to the governor's office prior to a legislative session to calculate pay plan increases. It's called the snapshot. Campuses have done it forever. Um, we've gotten better at it and we're able to do most of it through uh, the system office. But what it includes is everybody who works there by their FTE position and vacant positions. So we have a straight up comparison of vacant positions. And what you'll find here is that we had about the same number of total FTE. We have a slight decline, 1%. Um, however, our filled positions were actually lower by 383 in 2022, and conversely, creating vacant FTE higher um, by 338 positions. So stated another way, our vacant positions more than doubled while our FTE positions declined. So no doubt about it, we have uh, an increase in vacancy rate. If you wanted to compute that and speak in, in legislative language, we would have had a vacancy rate of 5.1% that jumped to 12.3%. Okay, so vacancy uh, needs to be coupled with turnover. Um, 
because those vacant positions, yeah, that, that's that's bad news. But but constant turnover creates as much turmo turmoil. And so to get a hold of where are we at with turnover, we took a look at the number of new employees in two consecutive years, 20 to 22, 20, 21 to 22. And, and, and here you can see that we, so now, I, I, here, here's why I was talking about the current unrestricted employees. Now notice, we have 9,000 employees all of a sudden. Now we're talking about all funds. We're talking about those restricted grants that we get. We're talking about the designated funds that, that, that might uh, fund uh, positions in um, uh, various facets of the campus. And then also um, your, uh, your plant and facilities folks that are not funded underneath your dining hall, your auxiliary uh, employees, they're all in here now. And so we're looking just at head count, total head count of our employees, and ask ourselves the question, how many did we have? And then of those that we had, how many were new that year? So in, two, in 2021, we had 9,000 total employees, 9,100 total employees, with 1,300 of them being new that year for 14.7% of our total employees being new. Two years or a year later, we dropped the number of employees by 463, yet increased those number of new employees by 332. So our overall new slash turnover rate increased by 4.6 percentage points. Um, the, the number of new employees increased by 25% while the total number of employees declined by 5%. So no doubt about it, we have higher turnover. Um, is it unsustainable? Is it in, an, in a, a level that creates um, disruption? Probably. Um, some of the, the feedback that, that we've received is that those direct costs due to turnover uh, hit immediately on the cost of recruitment, the cost of training somebody again, the cost of actually hiring another employee that you often pay at a higher wage in order to get them to come. And then those indirect costs that are just in kind of absorbed by, by the organization, the onboarding costs, the time spent by the person who has to train them, the IT support that has to go into getting that person set up. So that, that turnover is, it, it ultimately produces inefficiency and can lead to burnout of, of existing employees and and really troublesome is compliance you know the the level of skill and, and kind of institutional knowledge that is necessary for areas like financial aid and those sponsored projects that 300 million dollars that we have in research yeah that takes some really specialized knowledge behind the scenes to to work those grants um, so I, I believe that's gonna kind of wrap up our our quantitative data, and it leads us into um, more of the qualitative information that we received. So as we sent out information about the snapshot to the, to the campus, we also asked them a series of questions. And so we get back the response from the questions and we try to decouple or, or unduplicate the responses and, and give us some, some chunks of information that we can digest. So we ask them first, give us examples of current types of positions or departments that are experiencing shortages. Uh, right off the bat, facility services. We've heard a lot of that. Dining as well, we've heard a lot of. So a lot we hear on the auxiliary side, um, kind of the all funds budget. But we hear a lot on in the current unrestricted as well with accountants and payroll techs and people in admissions, very specifically people in nursing department, mid-level uh, positions uh, across the board like technical director, ticket director, director of small business development hear a lot about financial aid and human resources and IT over and over again. That's that's a common one. That bullet could have been number one. Um, examples of critical positions that remained open, and, and I'm not gonna read those because it just gives you some color to that uh, list above. We also then ask them examples of reasons successful candidates have not been hired. And everything from low pay to small pools to um, not qualified, can't find qualified uh, candidates the housing effect, and then examples that illustrate the labor market shortage, employee retention problems. Um, I'll just allow you to look through that, but unemployment in the region, shortage of skilled laborers, the, the, you know, the worker shortage is definitely a big factor. Current employees leaving to join private sector. So now we kind of 
painted the picture with the, na the national data, the MUS data, it's very comparable. Um, some more kind of anecdotal, qualitative type responses. But it, it, it couldn't, it just seemed wrong to just leave it there because there's so many other compounding factors that are out there that are, that are affecting our ability to recruit and retain employees. Um, the first one is just an obvious one that Montana's unemployment rate is at a, what, five, six year low or lower than the nation, extremely low unemployment. Um, this chart everybody has seen, I'm sure, but uh, you know it hasn't changed much much in the last three months. That um, the the great resignation uh, is happening, and 11.3 million dollar, 11.3 million job openings, 4.4 million retirements um, in the previous month. 47 million people voluntarily quit their jobs last year. It's mind blowing. So the opportunity for, for people to, the, the mobility uh, and the options for those who want to seek higher paying, more flexible jobs certainly um, have the opportunity to do so. so you put 3% uh, national unemployment with 11 million vacancies and, and, and there's the crux right there and, and Montana's outpacing that. I actually think we're the lowest unemployment maybe we've ever had. In, uh, we, we've got our own share of that 11 million vacancies and it's just that that's a it, it's just un, un, unsurmountable at the moment so then I mean this are these are maps that anybody not, you know could, could find on a, a news outlet online uh, they're extremely interesting I think all of us have seen and, and felt some part of this that the that Montana is leading the nation in the increase in the median home price uh, from March 20 to March 22, so over a two-year span of time. Idaho and Montana, top of the list. Housing prices have skyrocketed. So let's take a step back, though. First, let's compare what we look like to some of the higher states in the West. I purposely picked the highest ones. Um, and and I, I will say this before I even say another thing. The median wage in those top highest ones right there of, of uh, Washington, California, and Colorado, they rank in the top 10 in the nation. So, so the, but, but still, I think it's important just to take a look at, okay, w yeah, we had the highest increase in median house, housing prices, but, you know, uh, w which still doesn't mean that we're the highest. So um, Idaho and Montana on the green lines, very close together down below there, and you can see that Colorado, everybody's got the same trend. Um, when we come back to look at it by county in Montana. Um, that, that, last chart there, that last chart is a scary chart for us because while uh, our housing prices have went through the roof, um, we're still not the highest in the region. There's articles in the Wall Street Journal two weeks ago that says Montana's market is red hot, but it's still a great buy. I mean, some people see that as yet a, a, a tremendous opportunity uh, to get into real estate at a, an affordable price. I, I think it would suggest we may not be at the end of that rope. So by county, um, we Gallatin there at the top uh, with a big push by Flathead County and then quickly followed by Missoula. And then I, at the end there, I have the average. I, I mean, anybody can find these things on Zillow. Child care, uh, I guess my biggest takeaway from this, the Montana Department of Labor did a study oh, a year ago, and they just basically labeled the entire state a child care desert. So that, that didn't sound good. Um, <laughs> I think they didn't find anywhere where there was adequate, adequate child care. <laughs> and in the places that were bad, they were terrible. Uh, I call this the Paul Lassiter slide. He sends this to me once a month every time it clicks up. <laughs> so, so it's at 8.3% now, Paul. All right, I'm just making sure you're aware of that. <laughs> so inflation, knocking it out of the park. And that's all I got. Um, I, 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 and again, just setting the table here, uh, the initial discussion, I'm more than open to people's ideas on better ways to explain and pull this together. If you have any additional slides to add to this, I kind of see it as a 
a dynamic type slide deck that we can pull from and use and, and hopefully use to uh, describe these problems to anybody we need to. Is that, can I add one thing? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I, Madam Chair and members of the board and, and Tyler, I just want to say thank you. And the one point that, uh, you know, I, I think I'd add here is this just brings great data and, uh, and numbers behind a story that we all have seen occurring. And I think it brings one other thing into, I think, sharp relief. We had a great presentation or, or discussion this morning with Musa, our staff association, and thank you to Brady for his comments. We've had similar conversations with our faculty leadership and our faculty associations over the past couple of years. Um, and, you know, the other thing that I think is worth emphasizing, and this just reiterates of how fortunate we are as well to have people who are so committed to the mission. Brady, Brady doesn't uh, alleviate these problems. I think it illustrates, though, the, the passion that people have. Because if, if you net all this, it's we have more work, <laughs> i.e. the challenges of COVID, enrollments up, compliance you know, requirements in higher education and research are, are increasing. We have fewer people, which when you have all these vacancies, it adds to the burdens of those people who are currently doing the job. Um, and then you have increasing uh, costs of living that, uh, that are really squeezing people. And so I think it, I just, I just want to make the point, because, and, and I know the whole board feels this way, uh, as well as all of our campus leadership, that uh, you know, the people that have stuck by our students and stuck by this system through these challenges, um, deserve just so much of our gratitude uh, because it is, uh, it is just so evident how deeply committed people are to the MUS, that, are, that they're sticking with us. And I just want to say thank you, Tyler. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Christian, for your advocacy on behalf of our employees because this is a, a great illustration of the challenges that they're facing and the burdens that they're carrying to serve our students so well. So I, I really appreciate your, your bringing this conversation. I know we're not gonna get to solutions today, um, but, but on behalf of, of all of our employees who, who've been you know, uh, soldiering through these challenges, um, I, I, I really appreciate your bringing this, this topic up and, uh, and, and, and having a, co a conversation with the board about it. Other comments? Chair Lozar. <clears throat> Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, thank you for um, following up on, you know, bringing data to this conversation, uh, to this meeting in particular. Um, I know we're not going to be talking about solutions. I think that's a, you know, it's a conversation for the near future. Um, I do think maybe that what would help drive those conversations and maybe give me a little bit more comfort in terms of what solutions are uh, would be to look at, you know, kind of a similar framework of this, this presentation, but by, by campus or by campus community. Um, you kind of sprinkled some at the very end um, around housing costs and childcare, et cetera, but it would be great to be able to see sort of the distinctions be of experience <coughs> across the 16 different campuses that we have. It's just more data for us. You know, if we want to look at sort of an approach to, to this issue by campus or by part of, the, part of the system or whatever, I think we just need to have that sort of localized data. Um, so if we, can, if we can take a look at that maybe in July or in September, I think that would help us in our deliberations. Thank you. Chair Sexton, or um, Regent Sexton, I was going to give you chair. There you go. No, oh, that's all right. Thank you, Chair Dombrowski. Um, yeah, uh, actually, uh, Chair Lozar requested most of what I was going to say, but I would think what would be additionally helpful, and perhaps you meant this in yeah. your your request, would be also data about like, is there, what does does, does a specific campus have a child care demand issue? Like, where are those at their most extremes? So when you're looking at potential solutions, you could maybe tailor them by campus, um, and then I feel that uh, President Bonner really articulated just the thanks for the, the promptness to the request in March and the comprehensiveness of the data that you have provided. And I appreciate the opportunity to look at this and acknowledge what we've been hearing and, and seeing for the last two years, really. So thank you. Other 
Chair Dombrowski, thank you. Um, pardon me for stepping out. I just got an office call and talking about the markets, and I don't know much where I'd, I'd look at Chair Lozar, Federal Reserve Board. I mean, the inflationary conversation that's on your desk, that's in all of our desks, that slide that we asked to look back at, that 30-year trend, that to me is a bit more concerning than even what feels like the pressure of the short-term trend. Um, you know, we, I, I do believe high prices cure high prices, and so we are in this extraordinary time where Montana's on the map, remote working is driving people to these places. I don't know how durable, at least the rate of growth that will continue to be, but I don't perceive that we're going to sustain this level of pressure. That long-term growth trend scares me a little bit. Um, I think that Commissioner Christian gave us a very good strategy at least foothold how we start this conversation we met with brady and his colleagues this morning incredibly well put presentation and thoughtful sharing of of how those challenges feel what it means on the front lines um, we've met with faculty since i've been on the board having this conversation at every meeting about these housing issues the students that we had lunch with today um, this is now their top issue the cost of housing and the cost of these issues and so to the point Commissioner Christian made, I mean, there's no question we do this without legislative partners, and I strongly encourage those at the table I had lunch with today, and I think it's right that the student representation, staff representation, and faculty representation, we need to work together on this, and creating that coalition starts now. As we share these challenges, those groups don't be doing it independently of one another. Work with the leadership of these other constituencies on your campus, because if our message is too broad mm -hmm. and too thin, I don't know how successful it will be versus a really solid data-backed case when we go make the case to our legislative partners. And um, I just can't think ever, I, I think your comments, uh, Chair Lozar, about sticking with us and the challenges, I, I'm confident they're not gonna feel quite like this pressure cooker in perpetuity that we're feeling at the moment. But the long-term trend is something we've gotta continue to be paying attention to. So thank you for letting me share those thoughts. Thank you, Regent Buchanan. Other thoughts? I would just add, I, I do think that there's an opportunity when you have this many vacancies to sort of challenge yourself on really what it is you were always doing, right? You can't, you can't do what you were doing. You have to look into the future and, and, and dissect. I mean, it takes a lot of time, but you have to dissect people's roles and, and give the individual right at the tip of the spear the opportunity to redesign their role and their work. And maybe that's a solution rather than always going back and refilling the position. But that takes time and sort of a commitment to, um, to, to rethinking the work. And that's not just frontline staff, that's all the way to faculty in terms of, and I, I have no, um, I, I could talk about healthcare a lot, but when it comes to academics, I'm not exactly sure what that looks like. But the churn is unsustainable. And if you don't challenge yourself to get out of the churn differently than just simply filling the position, we're gonna, we're gonna keep having churn. Again, I, I know we're not into solutions, but I do think there's a different way of thinking about the turnover rather than just one job for one job. Madam Chair, fantastic comment. I, I think that's exactly right. And that goes back to a, a lot of work we've done over the years on shared services. That needs to come back to the forefront. Uh, it's not that it's really went away, but it, it's an incredibly important part of this. Uh, the churn is is what's sort of come out as alarming to me within this. That that isn't sustainable. Um, I, I I would reiterate that, and I guess one other comment I heard, which is, and and we need to do this kind of now. I mean, I I do appreciate the stress that uh, staff and and faculty. Administrators, everybody's born for the last several years, and, and I do appreciate their patience, but we also, I, I want everybody to know this, this can't be a, a five-year conversation. Um, it's gotta be a conversation that gels pretty quickly and we get some solutions actually on the table that we can talk about, or that churn continues and, and the vacancies continue and uh, that, that challenge will continue. Um, so I, we, we need to work on a plan, and that's certainly a commitment from us, not only this board, but everyone in the MUS. Um, whether we can solve all these pieces overnight, I don't know, but we're willing to work on it and uh, we're willing to put together a good data-driven argument to take uh, to our friends in the governor's office, but also to the legislature and make a case why uh, 
continuing to invest in the Montana University system is important and who we can recruit and retain uh, the, the, the highest quality individuals to serve our students is important and I, I think we can do that. Thank you. Thanks, Tyler. That was uh, outstanding. Really appreciate that. I'm sure there'll be questions, additional data <laughs> questions that will come your way. Great. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, this next uh, uh, item is our online fee transition proposal. And uh, you'll remember back in September, we set a work plan for the uh, budget audit and admin committee. And part of that work plan is to do an analysis on fees. And part of that idea was to take a hard look at the online fee. I call this the Regent Sexton Memorial Online Fee Transition <laughs> Proposal. But the, the acronym I can't really get down right, so you can work on that while I'm talking. Um, so to evaluate these online fees uh, and restructure them if needed. Kind of simultaneously as we were, were planning that, we were started talking about a single LMS. We'd already been talking about sharing courses through Quotely. Um, this online catalog idea. And, and then, so when we start looking at the online fees, you quickly realize that they aren't as transparent as a mandatory fee. They're mandatory for any online student, but they're only mandatory for online students. So, so your mandatory fees that you publish um, don't necessarily highlight the fact that it might cost you anywhere between 40 to $60 more per credit when you take an online class. And so now uh, you, you, you want to uh, kind of open up the options and, uh, and, and kind of energize the course sharing um, concept. Well, course sharing is going to occur through online. And so now it's kind of cost prohibitive to, 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 to do that. Not to mention, I could have Amy explain some of the issues that she noticed quickly and, and, and our uh, COVID um, approach brought those to the surface at some campuses for sure. Um, that it seemed like, uh, why is this class of student paying for what m most campuses would recognize the online fee goes to pay for an expensive LMS when all students use the uh, LMS? Virtually, the LMS is, is integrated throughout all different types of courses, not just all online. So we started taking a look at this and um, w starting from the, the, the premise of we need to create something that does no harm. And in the process of doing that, doing no harm would mean that it needs to um, ensure that adjustments to any of the fees produce a revenue neutral outcome. So okay, um, here's the challenge. The variation between campuses in the amount of students, the proportion of students that they have online and the, proportion, and, and the amount of online revenue they were creating created um, a real imbalance throughout the system. And you can see this by just walking through this spreadsheet real quickly. So if we take a look at the percentage of credit hours offered that were online, we used FY20 because FY20 was basically unaffected by COVID. Fall 19, spring 20. Now spring 20 and towards the end of it, but let's, let's go with the data that we had here. Uh, if you look at the percent, Montana State University at Bozeman, for instance, is 5% of their credit hours. Quickly go down to Billings, that 49% of their student credit hours are due to online. So you're gonna see a, 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 a huge disproportionate impact between those two campuses if we just did, a, did away with the online fee. And so you get, the, you get the drift there. This is the column is just interesting data in and of itself. Uh, kind of shape a picture of, of, of the profile of our campuses. Great Falls, 49% online. And then, then the variation in the fees that we charged. And back in 2006, when we created this policy and we created a lot of these fees, online was just coming on. We got a legislative initiative for $1.5 million to ignite our, on, our distance learning effort. And, and we did. Uh, but a lot of this is tied to, to the past when online wasn't prevalent and this was all new and we needed to generate uh, enough revenue in order to offer this new technology. So um, th there you see the rates and then you go over to uh, the technology fee adjustment. So the proposal here, I guess that's what I need to get to, is that we would propose that in fall of 2023, so not this 
coming fall, but the, the following fall, that we would start to phase out our online fee and move it over to a mandatory fee that all students would pay at a much gr uh, a greatly reduced rate. So um, th that is exactly what this column is showing here, is that when this is all said and done, um, what you would do is you would eliminate the online fee, which would be $45 per student at uh, online student at Bozeman, and increase the technology fee, and that's a grouping of, of various fees under a technology category, um, to two point uh, to two dollars and fifty cents a student, and, and but see how much it varies. If you go down here to Billings, you, you take away a forty dollar online fee, but now you have to charge all students a fourteen dollar mandatory fee. That's in order to remain revenue neutral. That's what happens in order to balance the books. Um, so because of that difference, Bo Bozeman can do this in one year and uh, virtually have just almost no effect, but. Billings does that all in one year. That creates that, that creates a little bit of an impact. So we're proposing that campuses would phase this in um, over a three-year period of time, giving those campuses with the very small level of adjustments, like Bozeman, the ability to just flip the switch and get it done with, and and and, and not have to drag it on. But but campuses that, that are higher would phase this in. It would start in fall of 23, and um, and then virtually just work itself out to where then uh, after three years you didn't have an online fee anymore and now you've completely loaded your technology fee with the appropriate amount that would produce the same amount of revenue you were generating from online fees. That's it. <laughs> I would add one thing, Madam Chair, is I, well I guess to, to recap the first is at this point in time, all students are really using the technology. So it makes some sense that that fee is more widely distributed. But the second thing I think that continues to gnaw at me, and I think even in conversations with the governor and others, are we doing all that we can to promote online learning? Are we using that <coughs> modality as effectively as we can? And, and how, is, you know, how is having an additional fee that makes that course ultimately more expensive not contributing to uh, a, a negative impression on students to do that, to take more. We have 80 some percent of all students now are taking at least one course online, even if they're an on-campus student, they're paying more for those courses. It just, it, it's getting to where I think it's discouraging students to, to do exactly what we want them to do, which is complete their degree as quickly as they can from wherever they can. A lot of these conversations we're having about catalog sharing quotely beyond, that, that gets really challenging if now you're, you're faced with making a choice over do we have a fee, is there an additional cost. So I, I really think the time has come to uh, uh, eliminate that as a, a, a one very special odd set of circumstance in 2006 to the norm today and we need to adjust it to the norm. And I think ultimately it could drive more students to that time to degree conversation that we're having, allowing more opportunity to take classes everywhere and and to do so at, a, at an equal cost. Regent Sexton. Thank you, Chair Dombrowski. And yes, to Tyler's point, I, uh, I, I appreciate uh, your presentation. I appreciate the, the plan that you have in place. I think it's gonna work really well. Um, and I'm, I'm honored to, to have it be in memorial of, of my time on the board. So, <laughs> but I just wanted to mention too, one thing actually, um, and this is probably more, I think this is becoming more of a conversation on all campuses, but when you think about high flex classes, this becomes even more of an issue because high flex classes do um, include the online fee, but you have that option to go in person, you know, do a bit of both or be totally online. So you're, you're really penalizing your students who choose to go in person because they have to pay the fee. And a lot of classes now are only being offered high flex because it makes the most sense so you can accommodate the, the, the widest group of students. Um, and I will say I started getting a lot more feedback from students from flagship universities who have a lower percentage of online classes, but when they had to, you know, in the fall of 2020, when they decide, when they chose to go online, because you're right, there was no fee triggered by, by anyone going online mid-semester. Um, but when they chose to go online for reasons of health or whatever it was, um, and they suddenly found themselves paying these, you know, what they considered as exorbitant fees, it was, it was very, um, it was some very challenging conversations. So, I, uh, I think this is far more transparent. I think it's far more equitable. Um, I have a health condition where I did choose to take more online classes during COVID, and so I, 
I, I'm speaking to my own experience here when I say that, you know, I could afford to pay for it, but there are a lot of students with various disabilities who probably found that they were being penalized for, for choosing that route. So I think this is fantastic. We've covered every possible area that I brought to your attention and uh, we support it, so <laughs> thank you. Thank you, other comments? Madam Chair, one final. Um, I, I think the other thing that this group has really paid attention to is the do no harm principle. When you look at this chart at $2.50, you think, well, can't we just do away with that? Th there is millions of dollars in these fees. Um, I, I was actually quite shocked at the revenue generated from these fees, um, and, and particularly at various campuses. I, I do think um, it is an area that we, we sort of need to adopt that do no harm, and it reminds me of early conversations you and I had in the pandemic of, you know, can these go away? They, they can go away, but they can't go away uh, without doing harm at the campus level, without diminishing our, our ability to provide high quality education unless we take an approach like this. So I think the phased approach is particularly uh, pertinent in, in this area. And I, I do think it's revenue that the campuses need or we'll, we'll diminish our ability to provide the courses that we have. Thank you. I just want to remind uh, the board that the budget committee did ask for a fee review and uh, we got one done and the complexity of the one uh, is not lost on me or I think the other budget committee members. Uh, it's just not as easy as saying, you know, make it all transparent and equal and, <laughs> and right. So thank you for the work on this. You bet. Okay, we have another item here if we back up. Our information security audit. Uh, if I'd ask Director Margaret, Sometimes known as Miller, Miller. <laughs> most of the time known as Wallace. I was, I was hoping Margaret Miller could actually do this for me, so <laughs> alas, I'm here. So. Take her away. All right, Madam Chair, members of the board, um, thanks for having me speak today about the Legislative Information Systems Audit of the Montana University System. Um, quite loud there now. Uh, we heard a little bit about it earlier, and of course, Deputy Commissioner Thigpen mentioned the potential cybersecurity audit, so what I thought I would do is just do a brief overview of what the audit did, um, what it recommended, and then our next steps. So, so what did the audit do? Um, the auditors reviewed information security governance practices and staffing at both the system level as well as um, at the flagship universities to determine um, what the overall IT governance practices were. They also assessed uh, aspects of each university's security program uh, to determine its m maturity level, uh, and then also contracted with an outside consultant um, to identify security vulnerabilities and did some awareness, uh, security awareness testing as well. So there were four recommendations in total, uh, two to the system office, um, both of which had to do uh, with I improving IT governance practices. Um, so things like um, updating our system security policies to point to a framework, clarifying roles and responsibilities across the, the system, um, and <coughs> improving communication and coordination uh, as well. So the recommendations to UM and MSU uh, both, both had to do mainly with uh, the need for a comprehensive risk assessment. So in terms of our next steps and opportunities, um, we've already established a work group to identify uh, uh, potential IT governance structures to put in place and improve uh, board policy. Um, we already have plans to increase our communication to the board through our enterprise risk management program and the risk and compliance leadership council. Um, and of course, as you heard earlier, um, we hope to leverage ex existing resources like Cyber Montana, the Missoula College Cyber Center, um, and of course, also working with um, risk, and man risk management and tort defense, um, who administers our cybersecurity uh, insurance. So I think lastly, um, you know, we all agree this was a good audit, um, and it's an opportunity for us to work together across the system um, to identify, you know, what resources are needed, um, or what are our top risks, what, what resources are needed, and then any potential shared services um, that we can deploy across the system. So with that, I would say, you know, there's already a lot of good work going on at the campus level, um, and uh, Director Thunstrom and I met with the CIOs yesterday about um, a sort of path forward, and I think we all agree we've got a good path forward, so yeah. With that, I'll stand for any questions. I will submit. I am not a 
information security or technical experts, so for those questions, I will be deferring those. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions? Oh, Madam ahead. Chair, we don't bring a lot of audits to uh, this board. I, I think um, Director Miller slash Wallace was kind in saying that <laughs> the recommendations went to OCHI. The truth of the matter is they went to the Board of Regents also, and they really talk a high level about this body providing more guidance so it's more consistent across all campuses. That it's not that it's not happening at campuses, but that it's very hard for some outside entity to take a look at what we're doing and say, yeah, it lines up, it makes sense. It's, and, and so I really think that's an important area that we need to focus on. That's the purpose behind the, the work group that's being created. Um, ultimately though, this will end in, in probably policy revisions mm -hmm. that will come back to you uh, to adopt a, a broader framework, both at the, the IT governance, but also at cybersecurity to, to really take a, a close look at how we do it and then set those standards, set benchmarks, set guidelines for all campuses um, that are consistent, that can be monitored, and ultimately that audit will approve of uh, in, in a very positive way. We, we This is an audit we very much agree with. Um, but we also don't have that expertise at OCHI, and so I, you know, this has to come from the broader uh, IT community across the MUS, so we all find some common ground of, of what needs to come forward. But there'll be more to follow on this. We do appreciate the work of uh, the audit team. Uh, they, they really were great to work with on this audit, and they provided us, I think, with some really tangible things that we can implement moving forward, and appreciate all their efforts. and. That was the report we gave to the audit committee a couple weeks ago and uh, look forward to, to bringing some items in front of this board that we can ultimately go back to audit with and, and uh, show them the good work that we've accomplished moving forward. Keyword was good audit. <laughs> you start a good audit. Um, I, I do have a question. Will this result in need for investment, further capital investment? How, how, maybe too early to tell. Madam Chair, I, I mean, I suspect the answer is yes. I, I think what that is and how it's approached is still too early to determine. I, I think what we talked to the audit auditors about um, in our exit interview and the audit committee is we sort of look at this as different approaches. The board can simply create a better framework, better guidelines, better policy to help guide the campuses um, on one extreme. And, and the other would be that uh, we could at a centralized level do cybersecurity, that we could hire a CISO, that we, and, and many companies are moving to that model. Um, again, I don't think we have the expertise here, but it, it also comes down to this whole shared service conversation and the rest. What I think is likely though is that uh, we'll have some conversations about how can we better govern cybersecurity and our IT probably at the, the, the MSU and the U of M levels with some guidance from you know a, a centralized approach to it uh, whether that's an individual uh, at Ochi uh, or, or not I think is still yet to be determined but obviously those things all require some level of resources um, that is sort of how we approach a lot of other of our framework items whether it's a a, a financial person that provides guidance or, or who uh, risk management, that, that's how we've approached things. So I think it's probably too early to tell how much, um, like most things in life, it's probably not free, uh, but we certainly need to figure out how to do it, how to pay for it, and, and you know, I, I honestly hope in the end, if we become more uh, strategic of how we approach this and uh, a, a bit more standardized, that there probably is some long-term cost savings associated with it. Thank you, helpful. Thank you. Was that the last item? Wait. Madam Chair, it wasn't, oh, no. but it, it kind of was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the annual facilities project authority update sounds like something that'd be fascinating to open up and talk about. However, uh, this is just a requirement uh, policy. It's just a requirement. We're following policy here. We're providing you a list of our construction projects and the authority that's associated with them. I would leave it up to each board member, I guess, to. Uh, view these uh, on their own. If they have any questions at all, um, be be happy to talk about them. Thank you. 
going to presume or assume no questions, at least at this moment. So with that, that adjourns the Budget Committee. Excellent. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the next item on uh, this afternoon's agenda is, uh, is public comment. So um, for those of you interested in giving public comment, please come up to the podium and, and please state your name. Um, we ask that you, you provide public comment on any matter not on the agenda, but under the jurisdiction of the Board of Regents. And uh, a reminder that you can also submit written public comment to Jasmine at jcasanovas at montana.edu. So with that, I will entertain any public comment. Is there any public comment? <coughs> Welcome. Hello, Chair Lozar, Commissioner Christian, uh, Regents. As you may be aware, my name is O'Shea Burdenground. Ground. I'm currently a student and an ASUM Senator from the University of Montana. Uh, today in the Budget Administration and Audit Committee, we got to listen to um, Item D, action item D, naming of the proposed building at MSU. Uh, in my opinion, the naming of the building after the governor and his family would do more harm than good. Uh, there have been points that have been brought up that this naming would create a more diverse field of computer science majors at MSU. Uh, while this is a good perspective to consider, there have been words and actions the governor and his wife have taken and said uh, that have taken and said certain things uh, that segregate certain groups of people from other groups. Also, there is a board, spe board specific policy which prohibits the naming of a building after a state employee, which Gianforte is. Uh, now there can be arguments made that I'm assuming will be under section E, subsection 2, which is the philanthropic giving warrants some form of recognition uh, as an exemption to board policy, but no argument can take back the actions of the governor and his family. Uh, with all that being said, I would strongly suggest to the board to heed the word of students and not approve the name of the proposed building. Um, <clears throat> thank you again, Chair Lozar, Commissioner Christian, Regents for your continued work continued and consistent work for Montana higher education. Thank you, O'Shea. Is there any public, any additional public comment? Is there any additional public comment? Seeing no additional public comment for this afternoon, um, I think that concludes um, our meeting today. Uh, just a reminder that the, the board will meet tomorrow morning at 8.30 with the um, Education Interim Committee. Um, and I will turn it over to, to Chancellor Kegel to uh, remind us of the instructions of tonight's reception. The uh, reception's in the Donaldson Commons in Donaldson Hall, which is the building right through that window. So. The doors are open right now if you want to go over. Excellent. Thank you, Chancellor. We'll see you guys tomorrow morning. <laughs>